ഓക്കെ ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഇയർ ഫ്യൂച്ചർ ഡാറ്റ അക്കൗണ്ട് സോ ഫസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ഓൾ താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ ടേക്കിംഗ് ടൈം ബിക്കോസ് ദീസ് ഡേയ്സ് നോ ഫിസിക്കൽ ക്ലാസ്സസ് ആർ സോ റേർ ദാറ്റ് ഈവൻ ദ ഫാക്കൾട്ടീസ് ആർ നോ ഡേയ്സ് ആർ ലുക്കിംഗ് ഫോർവേഡ് ടു ഇറ്റ് സോ ദാറ്റ് സിറ്റുവേഷൻ but more importantly you have examination coming way and uh, you have given the time for it so for that i would like to thank you for that okay so coming to the discussion on what is this session going to be so briefly i will cover what we are going to be having the plan for next 5 days and accordingly we'll plan it and in between if you have any slightly different things to be covered you let me know and accordingly we will cover it so we are having a five days plan and uh, we are not going to discuss like a regular class where i tell okay let's do this topic the logic behind this topic uh, what are the overall view of the standard i am not going to do that aspect this is purely from exam point of view uh before that uh, in if you writing the exam for the first time i just want to get the clarity okay and are you attending the class for the first time or you have done some preparation earlier and this is you have uh, some sort of familiarity at least you have some idea at least okay and uh, people joining online can please confirm that my voice is audible because later you should not complain me that this is not audible so people joining online please let me know if my voice is clear yes okay great thank you okay so in our syllabus there are so many uh, new topics have been added uh, from this exam onwards they are also going to have mcq being introduced uh, so that also i'll share it but as far as our preparation is concerned it's not going to be changed the way we approach the standard the concept the problem will be same mcqs i will share it for practice and anyway it will be based on concepts so the, we are not going to have any different discussion for specific with respect to mcqs concern uh coming to the material i hope you have two materials with you one is on the charts and other is on problems so we are going to use this charts method to discuss the concepts briefly and then we will solve the relevant problems using the questions here uh the problems what i have included here are cherry pick problems in the sense what are the most relevant from exam point of view and i'm not assuring you at the beginning i'm telling you are not covering 100% syllabus just like a financial statement says that right it it cannot reflect 100% of the transactions it can only reflect the true and fair view or we say that the uh, faithful representation is what we are trying to do here so our approach is going to be like this our main area if i divide this into category a category b and category c kind of chapters category a will be any idea which type you think the most important from exam point of view it is definitely consolidation and uh, don't worry about my handwriting i'll not be writing much I'll, ppt is there so you don't have to worry about understanding my handwriting much then we will have uh, business com consolidation includes four standards in days 110 primarily in days 28 and 111 and also to an extent 27 and also it includes yeah, the associate joint venture everything put together that is everything i'm calling it as consolidation and business combination is also actually is now very difficult to separate business combination that is indas 103 also will come under the same category because the topics the areas are similar then what else would be the category a chapter financial instruments i would say that financial instruments are another important category that is mainly 32 and 109 107 i will not be covering it's purely disclosure standards it if it comes it comes for theory we are not going to focus on that and then it comes to revenue which is in days 115 
so these four i will call it as category a in my opinion this should count for 40 to 50 percent of the mark in my opinion sometimes it can change here and there but i think one full fledged problem on business combination or consolidation overall will cost about 20 marks financial instruments will be around again at least 15 marks and revenue also will be around 10 to 15 marks so i can expect from these areas around 40 to 50 percent and our sessions will be mainly focusing on these things so out of five days maybe two two and a half days i'll be focusing on these areas or maybe three days depending on the discussion Category B, where we come to the other standards like lease will come, which is in days 116, then in days 16, that is the property plant equipment, uh, in days 105, assets sell for sale, uh, even in days 2, for that matter, inventory also have been tested in the past quite a few times. Uh, uh, in days 36, impairment of the asset, and in days 19, employee benefits, in days 12, which is income tax, and 21, I would say category C. And uh, yeah, I think this would be coming under category B. DC, especially, I would say the lease, where many people have some sort of difficulties embedded there. Okay, and we will be focusing another maybe one, one and a half days on this. And remaining is our category C, which is about uh, India's 134 cash flow statement, uh, all remaining uh, topics. And recently, in the new syllabus, they have added two topics, which is on uh, technology and on ethics in financial reporting, which I will not be covering specifically now. Maybe towards the end, I will discuss maybe 10-15 minutes, just to give an idea about it. Because in my opinion, that is not a separate difficult chapter to be worried about. Anyway, I have uh, YouTube videos also on that. I will share it. You can watch it later. So those two topics, I will not be giving much of importance. I will be upfront. Uh, on these things and problems also how I selected is it should cover majority of the uh, area which has been asked so far for example financial instruments one typical problem what they are asking is staff loan at a concessional rate so that is the problem I've included and I have given more weightage to the last 3-4 attempts question papers so if you uh, I have given the source also in the question where it is taken from so when you cover these sessions it is Almost that you cover last three, four attempts question paper also. So that will be the uh, uh, focus from our side. Only my request to you is uh, as and when we discuss, if you get any doubts, get it clarified there only. Don't accumulate your doubts because it's going to be a marathon session and you will forget uh, what doubt to ask. Maybe later I have to guess what could be your question and then have to answer it. So as and when you get your doubts, pause it, ask your doubts and we will discuss then and there itself. And asking the doubts is not only helpful to you, it is helpful for the full class because they also might get the doubt later or sometimes they have the doubt, they don't ask. So when you ask, that will be good for uh, the entire class. And also it gives me an idea as in which direction I have to explain the concepts. Okay. So this would be the area from my side. If you have any other specific requirements or you have any specific issues, let me know. I'll keep that in mind while discussing the problems. Do you have any specific question or concept or confusion in your mind? Okay, if nothing is there, great. <coughs> Okay, so uh, briefly, the application, I will start from the beginning. Uh, accounting standards was there earlier, and now it is in the S. Accounting standards are applicable for uh, the companies, typically, who are unlisted companies, and who are having uh, net worth less than 250 crores. So this will give you the idea. Uh, if you come to this page, what are the page number? This chart will have that data. How the index has been made applicable? Sometimes those date mates are also be relevant. If they ask you a case study application problem, so it initially started from 
2016 where net worth was more than 500 crores and from 17 onwards they made applicable for all listed companies and net worth is more than 250 crores so that's it i will not discuss more than the applicability part of it as of now what you need to keep it in mind it is applicable for companies who are listed it's applicable for companies who have net worth more than uh, 250 crores and that would be the uh, application part over there uh, what is the main feature of India's is we have introduced in one concept called as OCI, other comprehensive income. So we are ha calling this PNL and OCI put together. It's called as statement of comprehensive income. So PNL is one component, OCI is another component. And the reason why OCI is introduced, there is no specific mention anywhere, but OCI comprises. Looking at the nature, we can say that it comprises of elements which are not regular in nature like revaluation reserve not in a regular course of business uh, what we used to call extraordinary items exceptional items which is still there in schedule 3 but in in days we don't use those words exceptional items extraordinary items like profit on sale of investments or uh, profit on sale of uh, machinery those kind of things we are not having uh, recurring in nature so the, those are grouped under a section called as oci that is what other comprehensive income like revaluation reserve, actual gain, like that. What is most important is uh, the two terms there, which we'll be using a lot. One is called as with recycling, other is called as uh, without recycling. You can see here, with recycling and without recycling. Uh, so those one, two concepts you have to keep it in mind because again, that will come in uh, consolidation, some problems and this, uh, institute like this cocktail kind of problem where they mix financial instrument and consolidation, they mix defer tax and business combination. So those kind of problems are more popular. So for that purpose, you should be aware of uh, these two terms. So with recycling means initially when you recognize it will come to OCI and subsequently when you sell the asset from the OCI, it will be reclassified into p and account. One example, if I have to give, is in financial instruments, when you have investment in debt instruments, like investment in bonds. When you are holding that bond, if asset value 100 rupees becomes 102 rupees, 2 rupee gain, we will classify to OCI as maybe uh, fair value gain or fair value change, fair value reserve account. When you sell those bonds, then the journal entry will be the fair value gain account debit to p and l account so with recycling means initially it will be recognized in oci and subsequently when the asset is sold it will be recognized in p and l account and ultimately p and l account will come in balance sheet under reserves and surplus without recycling means it will directly come typical example is revaluation reserve on sale of assets so when you create a revaluation reserve on machinery on building you just simply create revaluation reserve and you report it under OCI. When you sell those fixed assets, the revaluation reserve will be classified into, let's say, general reserve. It will be directly taken into the reserves and surplus. It will not hit PNL account. So, with recycling means from OCI to PNL and ultimately going to the reserves and surplus. Whereas without recycling means from the OCI directly it will hit the reserves and surplus, it will not come to p and account. So simple answer, with recycling means it will impact p and without recycling means it will not impact p and in the year of sale. So that's the point to be kept in mind. And wherever you want to make a note, there only you keep a note of it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, then this is new uh, framework have been introduced. New means it is a couple of months old or a couple of one, one or two years also old. But in examination, they have been asking this question on this chapter, purely theory questions. They are not asking any numerical on this simply because they cannot really ask. So I will focus on the important areas. So framework means overall guideline, what point to be kept in mind. Uh, objective of general purpose financial reporting. This one word also you can keep using it, general purpose 
when we prepare financial statements it is not for a particular purpose like it is not for mergers it is not for taking loan it is not for stock market evaluation analysis we prepare financial report in general it can be used by users for different purposes that's why I use the word general purpose the objective is to uh, report the economic resources again this one word you can keep it in mind economic resource our financial statements cannot reflect all resources for example a company will have human resource and typically you would have heard when you join a company you will also hear they will tell you uh, employees are our assets then you ask them show me in your balance sheet then employees will not be on the assets side they will be on the liability side because there is salary payable tds payable tds on salaries is not payable so a balance sheet or financial statements will not reflect all the resources it only reflect economic resource which basically means it can be measured in terms of money it helps in assessment various things that's okay uh, okay uh, in the qualitative characteristics these two words please be aware of it one word is relevance the other word is faithful representation we used to use the word in accounting standard as true and fair view that is now called as relevance and faithful presentation so relevance points are there so basically relevance means it should be relevant for the users to make decisions uh, relevant one of the example is we report contingent liability so user will understand what is not reported in the balance sheet the impact uh, if somebody is planning to invest in the company somebody is planning to lend to the company they can understand not only about the balance sheet but also about the contingent liability especially Uh, things like the banks uh, like that so relevance means it should be able to have a predictive value that is what the assessment of the future valuation and making the difference to the decision faithful representation means uh like fair view what we used to call it there should not be any unbiasedness when the accounting policies are chosen you have to be neutral you can't say that i like straight line method because it's easy or i like uh, revaluation method because uh, uh, i have access to the uh, market valuers more comfortably it has to be neutral and it should not having any biasness while selecting accounting policies for faithful representation you can focus on word uh, neutral and uh, free from errors uh objectives okay this i'm not going to focus much okay they'll talk about what is asset what is liability what is income definition of an asset this will come in all other standards okay if you have to cover quickly asset means it's economic resource controlled by entity this one word you should come across so often the word is control we will see this in uh, financial instruments in business combination in uh, consolidation like control is there control is lost even in uh, in days 115 revenue will be recognized when the control is transferred so this word control is the most important thing and we don't use the word own we use the word control so there are many times you don't own the asset but you control the asset then it should be part of your assets of the organization as long as other things like it has future economic benefits it should not be worried that whether it is owned by entity or not the word to be focused on is the control by entity okay and what is about the control and all they have given but focus on the main elements okay liability means it's an obligation anyway we have a separate standard we'll look at the definition again okay when do you recognize when do you derecognize uh, again those two points will come relevance and faithful representation when do you derecognize when you lose the control you don't have the control like even if it is with respect to consolidation you have an 80% holding you sell 40% so you no longer have the control you should be recognized so the word is if you want to recognize it as an asset you should have a control if you lose the control then you should be recognized presentation disclosure i'm not going to focus much uh, regarding the measurement again there are details point to that measurement i'll give a important view to it 
there are various methods of measurement so if you talk about in days to valuation of inventories we value at cost or nrv whichever is less so we value at nrv in some situations whereas if you talk about uh, uh, in days 16 property plan equipment we either value at cost or we value at revaluation model if we value revaluation model whereas if you come to financial instruments we value it on fair value basis for certain type of assets and if it is amortized cost method we value on cost basis so basically we are trying to tell there is no one universal measurement method the entity has to choose depending on the context which measurement is most appropriate so that's what this area talking about uh, it there are various methods of historical cost current value entry value exit value uh, don't worry about individual components the summary of this discussion is there are so many methods of measurements that can be adopted while preparing financial statement okay a uh, concept of capital and capital maintenance they was in the last uh, no 7 8 years only one time in the exam so i'll not be discussing any numericals but i'll just give a quick example to it and then i'll connect that example to an extent this example is also connected with your uh, uh, afm if i ask you one basic question who is rich i know you are thinking about the examination in 2 3 months you have to write the fr examination but if i ask you one general question who is rich what would your answer be and please don't answer from the point of your philosophical in nature and all let's be realistic practical who is rich so if you have a future cash flow today you are called as rich like you how when you call yourself okay i am rich now have money if you have money you are called as rich you have car you are called as rich you have salary you are called as rich how do you describe yourself so if you have assets like i have a building so i am called as rich but i have a building but building is not in my name or i have a building but i cannot sell it well you one small example uh, you always see in exchange rates as uh, One dollar equals to like eighty rupees. Uh, one pound equals like ninety rupees. You have seen. Have you come across any one Indian rupee equals to some other foreign currency rupees? So many countries are there. One ex one of the example is uh, Indonesia. Uh, approximately one Indian rupee is two uh, hundred Indonesian rupees. So I have travelled to Indonesia one time and I had one lakh rupee with me. So one lakh into two hundred. i had two crore so in a matter of few hours of journey i became crore pati so i decided i leave india i'm going to settle there because it's, it's so easy to become crore pati only after going there i realized even after if you have to go to a bathroom you have to spend 10000 rupees over there in india 10000 divided by 200 we don't nobody pays so much here uh, here so it's not about having the money it is about the purchasing power if just think about for a moment if money was the only reason to be rich why not government print money and give it to everybody stand in a queue how much you want 1 crore print take it how much you want 2 crore print take it everybody will be rich no in that case everybody will have the money but richness is not about having the money richness about ability to by the goods and services and we can go to this philosophical side that is a secondary matter so coming back to this concept of capital and capital maintenance if the company has 10000 as capital at the beginning of the year or you can say net worth 10000 and net worth became 10500 that means there is a increase of 500 rupees that we call it as financial capital there is a increase in financial capital but with that can company purchase more has real purchasing power of the company increased or not that we don't know and that is measured through the physical capital maintenance method so the objective of financial statement is to reflect the economic resource of the company and whether economic resource have become better or not we would like to give with the help of capital and capital maintenance uh, financial capital is not correct we know because i told you if 10000 becomes 10500 it does not mean that 
your uh, purchasing power increased by 500 but we don't have any better alternative so for all our accounting standard we still follow financial capital method so our objective is to reflect the true purchasing power which is what physical capital which we are yet to reach that so in that course some other indas can come in the future uh, before those things comes you pass the exam that is the only way i can tell uh, you trust me you believe me or not till today i am very happy i became a ca not because i am a ca just because i don't have to write the exam again looking at the exam day by day the way i feel more happy okay i don't have to write the ca exams do you also want to feel that means pass the exam at the earliest your next best attempt is the next attempt so you don't have to <coughs> push it more and make sure that whatever possible required you finish it off the earliest okay okay so this discussion about the basics of applications of financial statements i have not include any problem on the framework or on the standard because so far whatever the question they have asked is of theory question so far i have not seen any numericals so i just want to give you an overview of this which i have given okay coming to the standards one uh, of course my favorite standard is consolidation because most favorite for students also is consolidation but for to skip not to attempt but to skip so institute also likes it wherever you ignore institute likes those kind of area so consolidation will come but before that i'll quickly run through this uh, some basic standards uh, in days 1 and in days 34 and uh, in days 7 uh, in days 1 on uh, presentation of financial statements in days 34 is interim financial statements in days 7 is cash flow statement quickly i will cover those areas So coming to index one uh, again just one chart only i've included i've not included too many things we are not going in depth uh, it applies to both consolidated as well as separate financial statements it will give a format of balance sheet p and l other comprehensive income and also statement of sales and equity in indian context we have schedule three in the international context they have uh, international accounting standards that's why they have this uh, standard where format is given okay what is important for us is classification of current and non-current current you means you know within 12 months or within operating cycle is current what is receivable beyond uh, 12 months is non-current i will not go beyond that but if i ask you one basic question on those electricity deposit will it be a current or will it be a non-current electricity deposits in general it has to be non current because you are expected to receive it uh, after longer period of time only when you vacate the premises but if you are in a rental agreement and your rental agreement expires in 6 months in those cases it is expected to be realized within 12 months so in those cases they have to be classified as current item which means for the previous year it may be non-current and the current year it may be current so this is what is called as reclassification of assets and liability so when you prepare the financial statements for the previous year it might be shown under non-current but when you show in the current year it might be reclassified as the current now the question is when you prepare current year financial statements so to provide for current year as well as previous year so where will you show will it be like current year column will be under current and previous year column will be under non-current that is not a proper comparison so we have to restate the previous year financial statements i'm not going to change the previous year statement but in the current year the column which i have for comparative purposes will be moved from the uh, non-currents to current so that is called as reclassification or restatement of uh, assets and liabilities <coughs> Uh, okay, this deposit also is connected in a way with financial instruments, but I'll quickly tell you. 
then we will discuss again there later but i'll just give an idea so if i give a deposit in a bank i earn interest income but if i keep the deposit same example i will give you electricity deposit i'm not earning any interest but i would like to report that if i have earned interest income how much i would have earned or how much income i am forgoing by not earning any interest these things to be reported how to be accounted we'll see it in the financial statements uh, discussion but here just give a, giving an idea when i talk about fair value accounting all these things we are trying to record so what we record is not just on the paper as per agreement i have given a electricity deposit of 1 lakh show 1 lakh deposit that is not the indias principle what is the value of this 1 lakh had i given it to somebody else i would have earned interest income then show those incomes on notional basis yeah even on notional basis so whatever is happening in the transactions we would like to report and that's where the faithful presentation relevance items all comes into picture that is the objective of indias it's more principle based it is not a rule based whereas accounting standard was more of a rule based so for fair presentation uh, indias one should say compliance with indias okay last point uh, you need to keep it in mind uh, comparative information if there is any change in accounting policy or reclassification like the example i told you you need to prepare three financial statements to change from revaluation model to cost model we have to follow retrospective method of accounting so you provide current year and previous year that is normal and you should also provide beginning of previous year so three columnar statements is applicable when there is change in accounting policy and when there is restatement and reclassification so that's the brief idea about uh, indias one okay again next one uh, indias 34 i'll not spend much of time explaining in full what is the most important relevant for examination point of view first of all interim final statements it is not compulsory but whenever you prepare interim financial statements then you have to follow this uh important point is regarding uh, you prepare all these contents of financial statements you have to follow same accounting policies as uh you are following for annual financial statements it cannot be different you have not specified mentioned there it's something called as even expenses and something called as uneven expenses or uneven incomes uh, in as we use use the word discrete and uh, integral anyway i'll give a important point here if something is even expenses we will recognize proportionately if something is uneven expenses we will recognize fully for example for the entire one year rent you pay it in first of april so it is related to entire year but you are paying on first of april you will spread that money across 12 months you recognize in every quarter that is even expenses if you take an example of bad debts which will not occur evenly throughout it happens so those kind of bad debts extraordinary income profit on sale of investments so those kind of things we will apply fully in the period in which you will recognize uh, if you take an example of uh, income tax income tax is on income which accrues evenly throughout the year so what we have to do is for income tax we have to estimate what could be the annual income estimate annual tax you get one tax rate average tax rate that average you apply it on all the income quarterly it is very similar to if you know uh, the tds provisions what we used to do section 194j tds on profession whatever the payment may 10% you deduct but what do you do with respect to tds on salaries section 192 
you don't simply deduct thirty percent or whatever the tax rate. You take the employee salary, estimate what is his annual tax, then divide by twelve every year. You deduct. Same logic is applicable here also. So we estimate what is the company's annual income, then annual tax. You get one tax rate. The tax rate you apply it on income, so that it is recognized every year or every quarter or proportionately. So income such as interest income, interest expenses, rental expenses, they are all even category. They are proportionate. Whereas bad debts, profit on sale of investments, those things are uneven. They are recognized fully whenever such incident occurs. So the point to be kept in mind is even and uneven. And uh, one example they also ask this one. Which is uh, what is the periods to be covered? Balance sheet when you prepare, it is you have to prepare the whatever the date on which you prepare the balance sheet in corresponding previous period. That's over. Whereas P and L you have to provide totally four. You have to provide for current quarter and current year uh, YTD. YTD stands for year to date. So if you are preparing the the quarterly financial statements on 30th of September. 2023 so you prepare for the quarter ending september 23 and corresponding previous quarter ending september 22 current year previously you provide but also year to date means 1st of april till 30th of september and correspondingly previous year so that's what i mean here you provide for current Current interim period, cumulatively YTD. Current period means the September ending quarter. Cumulative means from first of April till September, six months. If you are doing December, December quarter is the first one. Then from April to December, cumulative YTD and corresponding comparable in the previous years. Same year ending, but you take the previous year. Same period, but previous year. Okay, so that would be under in days thirty-four. Uh, only the major points from exam point. Okay, uh, cash flow statement. Uh, I will not be doing in detail, but I don't know to what extent you are comfortable. Cash flow statement broadly dividing into operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. Operating activities means relating to regular course of activities. Investing means related to the asset side of the balance sheet. Financing activities means relating to the liability side of the balance sheet. Typically, we follow uh, indirect method, which means we start from profit as per P and L. Then we do adjustments. Primarily, we do two kinds of adjustments. One is uh, non-operating; the other is non-cash. Non-cash means we add back elements such as depreciation, and non-operating we add back elements such as interest expenses, dividend paid, those kind of things. So we start with profit as per P and L account, add depreciation, add loss on sale of fixed assets, minus profit on sale of fixed asset, add back depreciation, then uh, add back interest expenses, any finance cost, those things. Then we do mainly uh, we also add back tax provision so that we get it profit before tax. Then we do adjustment towards working capital. Where we consider all current assets, current liabilities, except cash, and except income tax itself. So, if if there is an increase in current assets, then we do minus. If there is a decrease in current assets, then we do plus. The opposite we do for current liabilities. The logic is very simple. If the asset increases, the cash should reduce. Both are assets. That is the simple reason. So, current assets increase minus. Current has decreased plus opposite we do for current liabilities. Then last slide and we subtract income tax. What we get is cash flow from operating activities. Investing activities means the sale of fixed assets, interest received, purchase of fixed assets. The net amount is uh, investing activities. Financing activities means uh, bank loan taken, bank loan repaid, shares issued, interest paid is subtracted, dividend paid is subtracted. That is. Cash flow from financing activities. If I add all the three, what I get is net cash flow during the year. Add opening cash and cash equivalent. What we get is closing cash and cash equivalent. 
so we will not be discussing more than this summary Okay, so let's uh, go into the monster that is consolidation. Prohibited area for most of the people. Some people even get nightmares because of consolidation. They get dreams on consolidation. But for me, it is one of the most favorite chapter. So consolidation basically means combining the two things, the holding plus subsidiary. I will not go too much into it. But there is one area that you should be aware that is on uh, definition of, or I think I should discuss this also maybe. When should you apply which standard for that reason? In SFS, SFS means separate financial statements, in CFS means uh, consolidated uh, financial statement. This chart must be there. Yeah, the same chart. If you think from the holding company point of view, they will have one element called as investments in subsidiary. That is in their balance sheet, their balance sheet I call it as SFS, separate financial statements of holding company. So one line will be there, investment in subsidiary and that investment in subsidiary can be valued as per index 27 or as per index 106. What does index 109 financial instrument says is every investment in equity must be valued at fair value basis. We have two types. A fair value through OCI or fair value through P&L account, which we discuss in financial instruments. But it has to be compulsorily valued on fair value basis. But if it is investment in subsidiary, investment in joint venture, investment in associates, you can measure it on cost basis. That is the exemption kind of thing given by India's 27. So, in days 27 is investments in separate financial statements applicable when investment in subsidiary, investment in joint venture, investment in associates. So, what will happen in consolidation process is that investments will be taken away and the assets and liabilities of subsidiary will be replaced. And that is the reason they are giving this exception of, okay, you can go ahead and value on cost basis. Anyway, the investment will go out, assets and liabilities of subsidiary will come in. So, when you prepare the concerned fast statements, investment of subsidiary will be taken away, assets and liabilities of subsidiary will be replaced. Okay. That is one point to be kept in mind. One more important point is this. Yeah. Huh? Who should prepare consolidated financial statements? I think CA students should prepare consolidated financial students in exams. So, apart from that, the entity who controls, so if I told you remember, the word is again control. If one entity controls the another, that entity should prepare consolidate past statements. Then what do you mean by control? Three elements, keep it in mind. Compulsory three elements. Power over investee, rights to variable returns, ability to use the power. Power over investee means where do you get the control? Control may obtain by majority of the shares, which is what for exam purpose we take majority of the shares. Control may also come by, maybe you have board of directors representation. You, you control can also come by some agreement, shareholder agreement tells you without this company's approval, major decisions cannot be taken. Many times it would happen, like for example, now Baiju is going through a tough phase. Somebody might tell, I will invest in your company, but I will invest only 20%, but without my approval, you cannot make any decisions. So only with 20% also, you might get the control. 
but for exam purposes for solving problems we will simply take majority holding 50% plus as the controlling stick for examination purpose but practically it can be any other percentage which gives them the power over investee rights to variable returns meaning if the returns changes as a investor your returns also should change we, we call it as uh, skin in the game like you make decisions but somebody else will suffer like our politicians they will make decisions and we will suffer they will not uh, you know suffer anything at all they enjoy so those things are not called as control or that is not satisfying this point of right to variable returns if you make a decision if good things comes it should influence you if bad things comes it should also influence you so as a shareholder if i have 60% i make proper decisions my profit will increase my valuations will be higher if uh, i make wrong decisions my valuation will be lower both ways i am influenced that is right to variable returns and ability to use the power sometimes power will be there but you are not in a position to use it uh, sometimes when you have uh, investments or company mnc's uh, multiple nationals are involved they will put a condition telling that without the approval of government entity cannot change its line of operation say if you are supplying defense uh, products to government and government put a condition that any key management personnel change in your company any uh, line of activities you have to change any product line you have to change you need to take government approval so you have the power but you are not in a position to make use of it in those case also you will not have be having control all the three things should be there you should have the power you should have the right to variable returns and the power you should be able to use it not just having the power but you should have the ability to use it if all the three are satisfied then there exist control and one exceptions you should be aware of it uh now main exception i'll talk about that is uh, investment entity investment entity if you are an investment entity you need not prepare consolidated financial statements it's typically applicable in cases of venture capitalist private equity funds pvc funds where they invest in so many companies and they are not interested in running those operations they are only interested in capital appreciation when if the company clicks you being a shareholder your share value will increase you might have 60% 70% but your intention is not to run the organization your intention is to just to get capital appreciation so in those cases if an investment entity then you need not do consolidation other exception also there but i'm only focusing on main exception other exception says if the, if you are intermediary you need not prepare like a controls b b controls c as long as a prepares fast statements b need not prepare so intermediary subsidiaries intermediary controlling people need not prepare financial statement the one consolidated financial statement okay that's what about investment entity <clears throat> okay all these things i'll come to it i think it should Let's go for the important points. Okay, now coming to the problems in consolidation. Usually, people follow the working note approach. Working note one, two, three, calculation of goodwill, calculation of market interest, or NCI like that. I follow a tabular approach. so for some of you if it is new it might take little bit more time but i will assure you it is worth it and many people who have followed this approach have found useful and especially time saving from exam point of view if it is slightly new to you so i'll go little slow on this formatting again i'll not go too much in depth to into the logical behind this i'll go into the process of how to do it 
Uh, this table also is there, uh, you don't have to take it. One table you have to write down, but one is there. That let me show it. Yeah, this is there. This is what I am going to explain now. So, what is the process of consolidation? Is holding company balance sheet we take, subsidiary company balance sheet we, take, we merge it. Holding company elements is not a complicated one. The issue will be with respect to the subsidiary company elements. So, I am telling you from subsidiary company elements balance sheet what and all we do. We take the subsidiary company's assets, entirely we push it to the consolidated financial statements. We take subsidiary company's liabilities and we will take it. The difference will be with respect to the equity items which are share capital and reserves and surplus profits. With respect to share capital, we will divide this into two kinds. One is what is belonging to the owners of uh, subsidiary company. Owners of subsidiary company is a holding company and others are called as non-controlling interest. So, share capital will divide this into two parts, non-controlling interest and holding company share will go to the goodwill calculation. So, share capital will take the subsidiary company. Holding company share of share capital will go to the goodwill calculation. Outside of share will go to the non-controlling interest calculation. Whereas profits, we should divide this into two kinds of profits. Profits which were there when the acquisition took place and profits which was created afterwards, which we call as pre-acquisition profits and post-acquisition profits. Pre-acquisition profits means at the time of acquisition, these profits were already there which means uh, they use the word uh, net assets on the date of acquisition, uh, this will be part of it. Anyway, profits we divide into two parts, pre-acquisition profits and post-acquisition profits. Pre-acquisition profits again will divide this into two, outsiders interest will go to NCI, whereas holding companies interest will be going for goodwill calculation. Post-acquisition profits, outsider share will still go to non-controlling interest, but Holding company share will not go to goodwill because goodwill is there only at the time of acquisition. This will be going to the consolidated p and account and that is uh, overall or we call it as other equity. Uh, post acquisition profit share of holding company in subsidiary will be going to the consolidated p and account. Now whatever I have discussed this step, I have converted this into a tabular format. So I will discuss with you the tabular format. This you need to write down, but not now. Let me explain few line items, then you can take it down. So, this is the format I am going to write. Please observe. I will give time to write down. This is important. The particulars, amount, goodwill within brackets, because if negative answer comes, it is goodwill in my working not format. That is why. Other equity, NCI. Uh, then subsidiary elements and then holding company elements. From subsidiary, I just told you what we take is share capital and we write the amount in the amount column. Holding company percentage as given in the heading, I will take it in goodwill column. Remaining amount, I will take it in NCI column. Pre acquisition profit, same treatment. I write the total amount. Holding company percentage, I take in goodwill. Outsider share, I go to the NCI. Post acquisition profit, the column will change. I will not take it in goodwill column. Instead, I take it in the consolidated p and account column. And NCI will get their share anyways. Then holding company, we will have investments. I told you investments will be replaced by net assets. Net assets means these three items only. Share capital plus profits. So investment in subsidiary is an asset item. So entire amount I subtract in goodwill column. And the holding company's reserves, means I call it as holding company p and L, that also will entirely amount I write it in con p l. See, when I mean subsidiary, every item comes in two columns. You have to divide between the owners. The moment I come to holding company, it will come only in one column. And if it is, uh, we are going to solve problems where there are multiple subsidiaries are there, triangular holdings. 
So in those cases also, we'll write one more holding, uh, I mean, a subsidiary company, one more subsidiary company, then holding company. There might be joint venture associates. So only one table will comprise of n number of subsidiaries. Will also comprise of all necessary working notes. So when I do the total, if the total is uh, negative, it is goodwill because investment is more. Then only negative will come. If it is positive, we call as capital reserve or GDP gain on par gain purchase. Uh, Confield other equity goes to balance sheet, NCI other equity will go to balance sheet. So this is the basic structure, then we have to understand various adjustments, adjustments like revaluation, depreciation, unrealized profits, impairment, all the adjustments we are going to fit in one place. So you write down up to this stage now, but leave some line items for subsidiary some line items, holding some line items so that if adjustment comes you can fill it up. Write this statement slowly. Question word format for consolidation, particulars, amount, goodwill, one PL, NCI, share capital, pre equation profit, post equation profit, sometimes uh, these two put together, share capital plus pre equation profits. This is also called as uh, net assets of subsidiary on the date of acquisition because share capital was there, pre acquisition profit was there. So it would be termed as net assets on the date of acquisition. There will be many more adjustments we will incorporate.
any question on this format so far <coughs> Uh, I think Okay, so moving on, uh, this method what we did now, the goodwill in this uh, table what we get is called as proportionate method. The reason why it is called as proportionate method because uh, we have taken only related to holding companies share of items. Another method is called uh, NCI uh, fair value method. So in our format we have to do one small adjustment. So as of now what we have done, we have taken NCI on proportionate basis. But in the problem, if they tell you NCI to be valued on fair value basis, what we have calculated now is proportionate. Now from proportionate to fair value, whatever the difference, I am calling it as NCI adjustment. So for example, in these two problems, in the amount comes to 5000. But in the problem, they say uh, NCI is fair value calculated at uh, 6000. That 1000 rupee extra is added in NCI column and it is subtracted in goodwill column. So it is difference between, I will call it as uh, fair value minus book value. So fair value will be given in the problem. Book value is what is sum of these two items and uh, any other pre acquisition element comes that also we will take it into consideration. So that one line also you write it down NCI adjustment. This will come only when you value it on uh, fair value basis. NCI adjustment difference between fair value and book value and book value is these two amounts basically uh, proportionate amount as on the date of acquisition. That is what it is called as book value. If it is fair value is there, the differential amount you add and you subtract. Of course, if the amount is negative, then in NCA column minus, in goodwill column plus, it is both are opposite. So, basically with this effect, NCA is increasing, goodwill is also increasing. Uh, that is the indirect impact. The book value would contain any element of NCI at the time of acquisition. So, share capital was there at the time of acquisition, pre acquisition profit was there at the time of acquisition. So, those two amounts is what is proportionate amount and we would like to reflect on NCI at fair value, the so differential amount I will take it. So, that way fair value of NCI is reported. If it is proportionate method of goodwill, this line item will not come. Okay. And uh, what is the ultimate effect of this? Now we have included goodwill not only relating to the holding company share, but also related to the NCI share. So ultimately we have shown overall goodwill of subsidiary. Okay. Then we have some adjustments. Let us discuss that. One of them is called as revaluation profit or they call it as a fair value adjustment difference between the fixed assets, uh, machinery taken over at higher amount, building taken over at higher amount, those kind of things. Revaluation, again this is all revaluation of subsidiary, that is what we are trying to talk about and this is the revaluation or fair value adjustment during acquisition and therefore 
this also is given treatment same as what you have given as pre-acquisition profits exactly identical element so we write the amount in the amount column holding company share will go to goodwill outsider share will go to nci and also for nci this adjustment calculation we will also take this amount into consideration because this is also present at the time of acquisition so this book value would comprise of share capital pre acquisition profits and also the revaluation profit element it is a pre acquisition element revaluation at the time of acquisition and subsequently when the value of the asset goes up you have to provide more depreciation so we call it as depreciation on above and depreciation will be a minus you, you can treat revaluation depreciation as opposite if revaluation profit is there then additional depreciation you have to provide if revaluation loss is there then depreciation will be a plus number it's a write back and depreciation will happen after acquisition it is for the subsequent period therefore it will not come in goodwill calculation it will come in con pl column and outside the share anyway will come in nci column and these adjustments we will again have to do when we prepare the balance sheet when we prepare the fixed assets the building machinery reversion profit is added depreciation is subtracted okay and then uh, one more adjustment is uh, unrealized profit when the goods are sold by holding to subsidiary or subsidiary to holding and goods are still remaining in stock so just imagine what would happen if subsidiary sells it to holding company subsidiary company has recognized the profit and that profit element is included in the stock of holding company indirectly you are valuing the stock including the profit which is not appropriate when we combine the profit element is called as unrealized profit so again it is applicable only if the closing stock is still there if the stock is sold then this adjustment will not come and there are two types of sales possible whether it is a holding company to subsidiary or subsidiary to holding we should take under the heading depending on seller point of view because seller only makes profit so if subsidiary is the seller so we take it here that is urp sale by subsidiary unrealized profit sale by subsidiary seller is what we should take it urp stands for unrealized profit and uh, usually take it as this transaction is post acquisition no because usually question is silent so we subtract in con pl and we subtract in nci but if the sale is by holding company we take it under holding company and when we take it under holding company we don't allocate entire amount we will take it only in con pl column we don't allocate so you write down those two also unrealized profit sale by subsidiary unrealized profit sale by holding company you take under respective seller heading under subsidiary heading you divide whereas under holding heading entirely you take it in con pl okay there is uh, one more adjustment called as impairment of goodwill So this goodwill we have recognized initially at the time of acquisition. Subsequently, there might be impairment. How to calculate the impairment? The details will have an impairment standard, thirty-six. 
here what is the accounting treatment of it impairment is resulting in goodwill will fall goodwill should reduce now in our format goodwill is negative representation in our working out format so to reduce i am going to do a plus and where will the minus go that means where will the goodwill be written off to we will write off to p and l account so we will subtract in p and l the impairment of goodwill we will take it in goodwill as plus column and we'll take it in con pl as minus column but here you have to be slightly careful whether this goodwill is full goodwill or proportionate goodwill it depends on the previous method what we follow if it was only related to holding company if it was proportionate goodwill what will it is fine but if we had done this nci adjustment means we also recognized nci share of goodwill So when you write off, you have to write off NCA share of goodwill. Also, you write one more line with the star telling if fair value method is followed. If fair value of NCA is followed, so you write this uh, amount under NCA column also within one star. That star representing if. fair value of nci was followed and there is one more small adjustment but again lot of confusion is there and lot of explanation also can happen but i don't want to go in detail that is dividend paid by subsidiary So when subsidiary company pay dividend, what would be the impact? Is what I would like to show it here. When subsidiary company pay dividend, NCA share will come down. NCA representing the holding company as a liability towards them. And if you pay some much, it's like reserves. Reserves is coming down. So NCA you reduce and con PL also you reduce. You don't have to worry about. the acquisition profit post acquisition profit adjustment against cost of acquisition none of those things are to be worried about so we can just write one more line dividend paid by subsidiary again under uh, subsidiary we write means it is dividend paid by them focus on the word dividend paid if it is dividend proposed we don't have to give any adjustment we can ignore dividend proposed dividend de uh, declared no adjustment required dividend paid Amount you proportionately divide. No need to worry about pre-equation, post-equation. You subtract in con PL and you subtract in NCI. This will have to add back while analyzing pre-equation profits, post-equation profits uh, when we. that we'll discuss little later but as of now dividend paid will be subtracted from con pl and nci so basically when we do this pre equation profits post equation profits so there if something is given us paid during the year we will calculate the profits before declaration of dividend because now we are subtracting there we add the plus minus impact is taken care in respective places that anyway if you when we doing a problem you will be able to follow it better So this will have all adjustments in one place. Beyond this, there are a couple of more things. Things like multiple acquisition, how to handle. Uh, things like uh, disposal, how to handle. I think those kind of things uh, should be understood only with help of numericals. But as of now, this should give an overview of consolidation. I think this itself will give you sufficient uh, base to solve the problems. I'll just. I have not included that one. I'll just see it. If uh, I'll just discuss it at least. If not solving, let's see. We can discuss. Okay. So let's discuss this one. Uh, triangular holding the theory part element. Uh, how it is going to be different from solving our regular questions. I will discuss. in the context of our regular working note format not outside that 
so our regular format works overall same in case of triangular holding it goes something like this like x limited has got let's say 80 percent in y limited and y limited has got let's say 70 percent in z limited so we are having two holding companies here x limit is also holding company y is also holding company and we are going to prepare not two consult balance sheet we prepare only one consolidated financial statements so we are our format goes like this First, we will write the Z limited and we will write like share capital, pre acquisition profit, post acquisition profit of Z limited. Then we will write Y limited, share capital, reserves, all those adjustments. And then we will write the X company, uh, their reserves and investments, and we will write it. So, all those will come in our same working note format. We will not prepare multiple working notes one after the another. It is just one table takes care of all the three companies. Even if there are more, it will take care of this. Only point to be kept in mind is when we allocate this Y company allocation here, uh, eighty percent is held by X Limited holding company, twenty percent is outsider that is NCI. That is straightforward. So Y Limited will do eighty percent here, twenty percent here. Uh, that will be completed. But with respect to Z Limited, we have to consider a percentage of percentage of. So, how much X limited overall has in Z limited is 80% of 70%. So, 80% of 70, so that becomes 56%. So, remaining is 44. So, by allocating this, we have to do 56% to holding company. Balance 44% will go to NCI. So, that you should be careful when you do the last lowest subsidiary point of view. And one more portion will be there. X limited will have investment in Y. So, when we write X limited below that, we will write investments which subtract from the goodwill column, like we have done in the earlier cases. But with respect to Y limited, also will have an investment in Z limited. That is how they got that 56% or that 70% that, that share. So, under Y limited, we will write investment. This one point be extra careful. This you can say subsidiary in another subsidiary why limited is subsidiary that is subsidiary so when one subsidiary has got investment in another subsidiary we write investment here but this also will be allocated between holding company percentage and nci percentage the same percentage 80 20 will apply so when i write why limited i write share capital I will be writing uh, reserves, pre-acquisition, post-acquisition and under that I will write investments in Z. An investment in Z, ideally I should subtract only in goodwill column. But I do not only that, I will also subtract in NCI column. Logic being the share capital I have allocated like that. The percentage of percentage happened. When I do 80% of 70%, indirectly that allocated between the NCI and uh, the Y limited. That is the logic. But anyway, you keep that aside. Just focus on how. Don't worry about why. Investment of subsidiary in subsidiary, you need to allocate between the holding company percentage and NCI percentage. That is the only point you have to keep it in mind. Just to summarize again, in case of triangular holding, two points to be kept in mind. The lowest subsidiary, the percentage is calculated by the percentage of percentage. Second point, when you take the intermediary investments, that also will be allocated between goodwill column and NCI column. So, keep those points in mind, that will be relevant for solving triangular holding problems. So, now let us look at one variety of problem called as step acquisition is what uh, they refer it or we can also call it as uh, multiple acquisition. So, there are two methods possible or we can say two scenarios possible uh, let us discuss those scenarios and the accounting treatment thereof so you can observe let's say first situation initially you acquire 60 percent and subsequently let's say one year later you acquire 15 percent so this is a case where the first acquisition itself you obtained 
control because when you obtain 60 percent that means normally we say the control is obtained so subsequent 15 percent when you obtain there is no uh, change in control because you already have got control now you got more control but there is no question of less control more control you have got control so this first case is called as first acquisition uh, resulting in control second example let us say initially you got only 30 percent and subsequently you get 45 percent so the control is obtained only in the second acquisition so in the first case when will you recognize the net effect of subsidiary goodwill of subsidiary and nci that is on first acquisition itself in the second situation when will you recognize all these elements that is on 1416 when you obtain the control 30 45 it becomes 75 so initially when you obtain 30 percent you will only recognize investments you don't do any recognition such as goodwill or uh, nci or net assets like that you only recognize investments so as far as the first thing is concerned because you obtain the control on first acquisition you recognize goodwill nci net assets on first acquisition when you obtain again 15 percent goodwill is not going to change you are not going to make any difference with respect to goodwill or even net asset the changes will be earlier now you had 60 percent which means nci had 40 percent now your share has become 60 plus 15 means 75 and therefore uh, nci share has become now reduced to 25 that 40 percent of nci now is only 25 percent of nci so nci is reduced in place of that you are making investments you are making a payment so if i see journal entry wise only one simple journal entry will come and that is nci account debit because nci will have a credit balance to reduce we will debit nci account debit to bank or to investments and difference any will be adjusted in other equity that is in con pl it will not be adjusting in goodwill it will not affect any other net asset so the first one is very straightforward thing and that's why you don't see much of problems also on the first element whereas the second case is concerned you recognize the goodwill net assets etc only in the second acquisition so journal entry what you are going to pass will be goodwill account debit net assets of subsidiary account debit to bank or that is for the investment made and to nci and you have already have the previous investments so we are going to write it as two investments that investments will now be be recognized and one more point is that investment will be valued at the current value on fair value basis so that all the three elements will be recognized on same lines so multiple acquisition quickly i'll do the summary for you as far as accounting is concerned so if uh, second acquisition results in or let's say first acquisition itself results in control first acquisition gives control so how do you account for first acquisition and how do you account for second acquisition the first acquisition you recognize your regular uh, journal entries that is you uh, obtain control on first acquisition so journal entry will be goodwill account debit net assets account debits of subsidiary to nci and to bank or to investment that is what we used to pass even under normal circumstances in case of consolidation whereas in case of second acquisition because you already recognize the goodwill we are not going to change net assets we are not going to change uh, because you are obtaining some portion of nci so nci account debit to bank that is for second investments so you are not going to make any other changes except this one journal entry and difference if any you will transfer it to other equity or consolidated b and l account maybe profit or loss loss means it will be debited Whereas if second acquisition gives control, then in first acquisition, 
we are going to pass an entry very simple entry which is investment account debit to bank whereas in second acquisition that's where you getting the control the entry will be now you recognize goodwill you recognize net asset net assets na that is net assets of subsidiary to nci you recognize nci now fresh to bank that is for the second investments what you are making this is for the second investments and two investments that is for the first investments and this first investment will be revalued so there might be a fair value gain so i'll write it as maybe like a other equity or conpl or let me just call it as fair value gain or loss i'm just assuming gain so fair value gain that is reassessment of the previous equity held previous investment held so that will be transferred to con pl okay so this will be a set of entries passed in uh, first acquisition second acquisition at different points in time so you quickly note it down and see if you have any doubts and then we will go further <laughs> while writing uh, i'll just read once more so you get a revision so two situations possible the first acquisition itself gives control example may be like uh, 60% and then you obtain 15% or second acquisition gives control means first you get only 40 the second acquisition you may get like 35 example purpose so if first acquisition gives control you re recognize the journal entries goodwill accounts na net assets of subsidiary to nci to bank that is for 60% acquisition subsequently obtain 15% so nci is reduced and to bank to other equity as a balancing figure if lost then other equity will be debited if second acquisition gives control then the first acquisition will be only one simple entry investment to bank that is for 40% and when you acquire 35 percent more when you obtain control you debit goodwill you recognize goodwill you recognize net assets of subsidiary to nci to bank that is for second acquisition and first investment whatever is there that will be closed so two investments and not only that the previous investments whatever was there this will be reassessed revalued fair value of previously held equity investment this will be revalued and when you revalue it the profit or loss that will be taken in con pl account Okay, so I hope you have taken that down. Any other doubts on that aspect? Uh, 
Correct. Not required. Because when you obtained first acquisition, you obtained 60%. So how much of net assets you acquired or you recognized? You recognized 100%. And 40% you recognized as NCI. So when you obtain the control, you don't obtain the control of 60%. You obtain the control of 100%. The shareholding may be 60%. But the recognition of assets and liability will be 100%. Again, going back to the original discussion we had, framework. The objective of the financial statement is to reflect what entity controls. So you control 100%, you own 60%. So that's why what you are not owning, we are calling it as NCI. Now when you change it to 15% more, the control of net assets is not changing. But NCI will change. What you own is only changing. What you control is not changing. So NCI you are reducing and uh, making a payment. So difference you are adjusting. So that is a logical aspect there. Net assets is not given change. Uh, the net assets is the net, net, NCI is only being uh, changed. But if I take your point with respect to goodwill. Goodwill can be recognized under two methods. Proportionate method or fair value method. So if you follow fair value method, that means goodwill is already recognized, goodwill related to holding company, goodwill related to NCI. So you have recognized goodwill at full method. But had you recognized goodwill on proportionate method, that means the goodwill would represent only 60%. So now when I have 15% more, should I recognize additional 15% on goodwill? No, mathematically the answer is yes, but the standard says goodwill is not changed. That's for different aspects of Again, controlling aspects, uh, for, to what extent entity has recognized goodwill, those elements would come. So logically or mathematically, the goodwill, if you follow proportionate method, it should have changed, but it will not change. That's one of the things I would say with respect to AS21, with respect to NDS, AS21 would change the goodwill also. When you recognize 10% extra, the goodwill of 10% is recognized. If you have 5% more, again goodwill of 5% more is recognized in AS21. In India, yes, that goodwill will remain same. Goodwill is not undergoing any change. Okay. So, okay. So, that is about the multiple acquisition concept. The similar thing will hold good. Again, we'll discuss later. If you have 80% and you sell 10%, then what should be the impact? When you obtain 80%, you are obtaining control. You are giving 10%, are you losing control? No. So if you are not losing control, goodwill is not changed, net assets is not changed. Only NCI will undergo a change. The entry will be exact. Reverse. You receive money, so bank account debit. NCI will increase because you are selling, so it will be 2 NCI and difference will be adjusted in other equipment. So the multiple acquisition situation and the disposed situations are exactly conceptual and opposite. Okay. So that would be the theoretical aspects. Okay. So next concept let's discuss is on disposal. Just like multiple acquisition, we had two cases. Disposal also we can have broadly two cases. Then. Many more cases can be done within that, but broadly two. In one case, it is disposal resulting in loss of control. In other case, disposal not resulting in loss of control. So first we can say not resulting in loss of control. And second case, resulting in loss of control. So when you lose uh, control, that can have further situations. It can have an outright sale. Like you have acquired 80%, you sell entire 80%. Outright sale. Or you retain some portion where it continues to be an associate. Like if you have 80%, you sell 50% till you have 30. 30 is sufficient to call that as associate. So 
remaining portion is retained as associate or remaining portion is just retained as investment. That is, you have only 10% remaining, 70% you sell. But all of them will come under similar situation resulting in loss of control. So it might be outright sale or some portion might be retained. So not resulting in loss of control is exactly the opposite of what we discussed in multiple acquisition, where initially you have, for example, 80%, then you sell 10%. That means you don't adjust goodwill, you don't adjust net assets. NCI is now getting increased. Earlier it was 20%. If you sell 10, that becomes 30%. So NCI is increasing and you are receiving some money towards it. So only that entry will be passed between bank account and NCI. Difference will be adjusted in other equity, just like the way we discussed in multiple acquisitions. So not resulting loss of control. That means goodwill, net assets is not changed. NCI is increased. The journal entry will be bank account for whatever sale proceeds. Then to NCI. NCI will have a great balance. Now, when you do NCI, NCI is getting increased. So, to NCI, two other equity difference, if any. Two other equity, that is a balancing figure. This is just exact opposite of what we discussed in multiple acquisition, where first only you have got control. So, not resulting in loss of control. No control change means goodwill net assets not changed. That remains same. Okay. If resulting in loss of control, that means you have to de-recognize goodwill, you have to de-recognize NCI and you also have to de-recognize net assets. So basically what entry you passed on acquisition of control? Goodwill account debit, now goodwill will be created. The net assets debit, now net assets created. Then NCI credit, now NCI will be debited. Then you wrote to bank for making a payment. Now here it receive money, so your bank account will be debited. And some balancing figure might be there. You might sell above the net assets goodwill. So difference would be called as profit or loss on sale of disposal. Sometimes some portion might be retained. Like 10% might be retained or an associate 30% might be retained. In those cases, the investment will be debited and that will be valued at fair value basis. So due to that valuation also, some profit or loss might be appearing. Anyway, that balancing figure will take care of it. So de-recognize goodwill NCI and net assets. Then difference if any. recognized in CONPIA, recognized in CONPIA as profit or loss on disposal, profit or loss on disposal. And when you dispose, there is one small point to be kept in mind, uh, we will discuss once I complete this. That is in conjunction with the uh, financial instruments I have to discuss. First, let me write down this journal entry. So, entry, you receive money, sale proceeds, so bank, sale proceeds. Then NCI will have a trade balance, so you have to reduce it. I mean, you have to de-recognize, re so it will be debited, NCI account. And any investment retained. Investment retained and that will be valued at fair value basis. Fair 
two, the goodwill is derecognized entirely to net assets. And in this case, maybe profit or loss, I assume, let's say profit on disposal that is going to CONPL. If it is loss, I would have debited it. Correct, correct. No, no, that amount happened to be same, same in that problem. That, uh, that coincidentally, the 100 investments became 300, so 200 happened to be goodwill. It is just a coincidence, but it is not necessarily only because of that. In that problem, amount wise happened to be equal. Uh, but that is not the case all, all the time. So if, if amount was not 100 and 200, if the amount was original cost of investment was let's say 150 and new cost of investment is i mean the fair value is let's say only 180 so 30 will not be the goodwill always so that in that problem it's just a coincidence of mathematics that it happened like that. Okay, so the one small concept here I would like to touch upon, the concept of with recycling and without recycling. If you remember, okay, let us have a quick revisit of that concept, what we had applied as with recycling and uh, without recycling. When you recognize certain elements, initially you recognize in ONCI, but in certain cases, subsequently you take it to PNL. And in some cases, you directly take it to reserves and surplus, that is to other equity. So when you initially recognize in OCI, subsequently recognize in PNL, that is called as with recycling. Initially you recognize in uh, OCI, but subsequently recognize in the reserves and surplus, other equity directly, they are called as without recycling. Let me just give a quick example of how the journal entry would look like. Uh, for example, if it was, let's say, investment in bonds okay, let's say the cost was 100 rupees and the year end fair value became 102 so what is the entry would pass at year end assuming it is classified as a fair value through oci in in that method you are going to account as the investment account Initially, anyway, you recognize the investment account debit to bank 100. That is whatever the amount you paid. The investment, you write it as 2, and then you write it as 2, fair value gain. 2, and this fair value gain not transferred to PNL. This is shown in OCI. And subsequently, when you sell, just before you think about selling, if this was a case of subsidiary company transaction, this is a profit that belongs to subsidiary, post acquisition profit of subsidiary. How would you allocate this? How would you treat this? Post acquisition profit is allocated to the holding company share and to NCI share. Holding company share will be allocated to, in our working note column, con PL. Actually, it is other equity column. Because on other equity, so many nature will be uh, divided and fair value gain will be recognized as, uh, in this case, OCI. Under other equity, one element called as uh, OCI. And the uh, NCA share, NCA share will be transferred to them as usual. Then when you sell this investment, next year when you sell, let's say you sold at 102, so you pass an entry, bank account debit 102 two investments 102 because initially 100 investment then debit to two so 102 investment account is closed and we don't stop at that point this fair value gain will be reclassified the entry will be fair value gain 
from OCI to profit on sale of investment to rupees that will be transferred to P and L account. That is what I mean by with recycling. If this was not investment in bonds, if this was let's say a revaluation of property, plant and equipment. Initially you recognize, yes, PP account debits to fair value gain or you call it as revaluation reserve as 2 rupees and you recognize in OCI. But when you sell, so when asset is sold, you don't transfer this to P and L account. Instead, what will you do? You will do the revaluation reserve account debit to general reserve or retained earnings is what we call it. So you transfer, you don't transfer it to P and L account. So when revaluation reserve is recognized initially, if it was done by a subsidiary company, you will allocate between the holding company share as OCI, outsider share will go to, uh, I mean outsider share as the uh, OCI and the outside the sorry, the holding company share will be recognized as OCI. Outside the share will be recognized as NCI. Now the question is, when you sell the subsidiary, listen to this point carefully. When you sell the subsidiary, the impact should be given like the asset is sold. So when the holding company gets the control of subsidiary, you recognize subsidiary. And subsidiary company has its revaluations that also holding company will recognize it proportionately. And when you de-recognize the subsidiary because you lose the control, you are getting rid of subsidiary, it's as good as subsidiary's assets are sold. That is the impact that to be given by the holding company. So during this discussion, what we had, this entry will happen. Apart from this, one more entry also should take place or one more set of entries should take place. If it was a case of element, like when we recognize post acquisition profits, what is the journal entry for post acquisition profits uh, passed in group books? Group books post acquisition profit. Uh, we, if you remember, we also wrote down net assets of subsidiary, we write it down and then 2 con PL to NCI. Con PL is the holding company share and NCI is NCI share. That's how we recognize. Uh, even in our working out column, con PL one portion, NCI one portion. That's how we allocate post acquisition profits. In post acquisition profits, there will be some elements of OCI profits also, OCI elements. That also will pass the same entry. What entry do we pass is uh, whatever the assets, corresponding assets accounts, debits to OCI of holding company and we allocate it to NCI, whatever NCI share is. In our working note, it does not make difference because this also will come in our other equity column. So that is not going to be different. So, so focus on this point. This OCI, recognized in group, which is a share of subsidiary company. When you sell the subsidiary company, this OCI should be closed. If it is in the nature of with recycling, this will be transferred to CONPL. If it is in nature of without recycling, this will be transferred to the retained earnings or the general it is under reserves and surplus, but it is just changing its behavior. So previously part of OCI, now it will be part of the general reserve. So the treatment in simple words, I repeat, when you sell a subsidiary, the impact should be given just like when you sell the asset, what treatment would have been given. This is in addition to the set of entries what we passed on disposal of subsidiary. So I'll just give a small chart on that or it might be there, I don't know. Anyway, just let's write it for our practice. When you see this kind of problems, it will be useful. 
so when they give you information on recycling information related to subsidiary assets and liabilities we don't worry assets and liabilities we already taken as part of uh, net assets de recognized when you write two net assets i i mean net identifiable asset when you de recognize everything is de recognized over there so that impact you don't have to worry but on the corresponding reserve what are corresponding reserves might be there you will have like revaluation reserve you will have like fair value gain uh, on uh, bonds you have like uh, actual gain or loss you have so many elements like this corresponding reserves so corresponding reserves nci share you ignore because it is already part of nci so only you need to worry about holding company share if it was that nature is with recycling such like, as i have given example here debt investments classified as ftoci fctr will come under a foreign currency translation reserve those elements holding company share will transfer to pnl if it is without recycling others such as uh, revaluation reserve uh, actual gain or loss they are not transferred to pnl they are transferred to retained earning so right now this chart will be helpful when you solve problems on these elements Uh, this logic applies if sale of loss but no loss of control only loss of control only when there is loss of control this logic applies this chart is applicable only if you lose control because if you don't lose control you don't de recognize any of them so this chart is relevant only when the control is lost
Okay, great. Okay, so let us take a look at the standard in the S one 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 joint arrangements. There are broadly two types of joint arrangements. One is uh, joint operations, and then we have joint ventures. But before that, when will you come to the standard? Only if there is something called as joint. Control. So when do we apply in this one one zero consolidation? Only when there is control. When do we apply in this one one one? When there is joint control. And joint control means don't simply take if two people put together have more than fifty percent, it does not become joint control. So you you have like if uh, A has forty percent and B has forty percent. And C has twenty percent. You can't say that oh A and B forty plus forty percent together they have joint control. Then why not A and C also have together A and C forty plus twenty is also sixty. B and C forty plus twenty is also sixty. So in that manner anybody will have if you combine together it will be more than fifty percent. So mere addition if it is crossing fifty percent that is not termed as Joint control. So, what is important is there has to be a contractual arrangement. The joint arrangement, that arrangement may be between the parties that we will work unanimously. Means we will work together. If A and C says we always come up with a single vote, so A and C will always vote together either for or against. So if A and C decides we will vote for it, forty plus twenty percent, it will be more than that. If they decide against forty plus twenty, sixty percent, that is resolution or whatever the conditions will not be passed. But it is not a situation where A passes yes and B passes no. That should not be the case. And the agreement may be between those two parties, or it might give shareholder agreement. In the shareholder agreement, in the articles, it might mention that A and C always vote. Together, or the decision is passed only when A and C pass together. So when these kind of arrangement should be there, such a way that the set of people, either one, I mean either two people or more than two people, they have to make a decision to pass certain resolutions. So those people can decide either in favor or those people can decide against unanimously without. Uh, the support of this. So joint control means there will be more than two part, two or more people, but through a joint arrangement, contractual arrangement. The contract can be in writing, the contract can be in uh, oral, the contract can be through shareholders agreement, or it can be separate contract. But there has to be a arrangement between the set of people to vote unanimously, to vote similarly. Only then it is considered as joint. Control. Okay, if it is joint control, then there are two ways in which it can be accounted. One is called as joint operations, and the other is called as joint venture. Primarily, a joint venture means separate vehicle is formed. Separate vehicle meaning separate entity is formed. Maruti Suzuki coming together. Okay, Maruti Suzuki Private Limited or whatever limited. If you don't form a separate joint venture. You will account it as joint operations, and accounting for joint operation means you account proportionately. There might be joint ownership. For example, uh, you will have a house. A house will be owned by both husband and wife. A joint ownership. That's not called as joint venture. That's just a joint ownership. The joint ownership will come under the category of joint operations. The so joint operations means no separate entity being formed. It might be for the purpose of Sharing income or sharing expenses, things like that. So, especially when things are there like oil extraction, we have to lay a pipeline for a longer period or longer uh, uh, space. You cannot spend all out of money from your side, and when extract oil, all companies will have the benefit. So, what you do is instead of you paying entire amount, you will sign an agreement with three more 
companies telling that let's share the expenses. So those kind of things will fall under the category of joint operations. And how the accounting for joint operations will apply? Joint operations will have, we'll look a few more points. Uh, joint operations we simply account as per respective index your share of respective income and expenses. Like expenses are shared 60%, 40%, whatever amount spent, 60% you recognize, 40% other person will recognize. If it is joint ownership, uh, you recognize 30% of the ownership as let's say property and equipment, you are responsible for 30% of the asset, you have paid 30%, whatever you have paid in your books, you show it as the proportion of the assets. You don't show entire assets because you don't control the entire asset. You control only proportionate assets. So joint operations is where you account on proportionate basis. The word to be kept in mind is you recognize its share, meaning you account it on proportionate basis. You don't recognize the full value of the asset or transactions. Okay, so let me just uh, repeat few points here. The joint control will apply only when, oh, sorry, so the joint control will apply only when there are, what is the important point to be kept in mind? There has to be joint control and joint control there means there has to be a arrangement between the two people that they will vote similarly, unanimously. And joint operations meaning that the income and expenses are shared and accounting wise they recognize proportionately. Joint venture they are a separate entity being formed. And if it is separate entity being formed, the accounting for joint venture and accounting for associates are same. Whereas under AS 27 it is different. Anyway, you would not have been aware of AS 27, so you don't have to worry about it. But in the next set of IPC students, they will learn uh, AS 27, so they should be aware of the differences. <laughs> anyway, so if you classify under joint operations, you recognize it on proportionate basis to the extent your share of income, expenses, assets, liabilities. You have taken a loan under joint name, you proportionately recognize. If it is joint venture, you account it as per equity method, which is applicable even for investment in associates. So, associates and a joint venture with separate entity, the accounting treatment is same. So, we will discuss the accounting treatment when we go to the uh, in days 28 accounting for associates. Now, few more points to be kept in mind. The joint venture, even if there is separate vehicle, can still be classified as joint operation by applying this concept of you used to call something like lifting the corporate wheel, something like that, where even though it is a separate entity, we don't consider that in these situations. So far that they have given certain conditions. You are classified as joint venture only when it has to be separate entity, but that is not sufficient. You should also satisfy three more conditions. Even if one of the condition is not satisfied, it still be classified as joint operations. So, separate entity is there does not mean that it will straight away become a joint venture. Okay, what are those three conditions to be satisfied? First of all, there has to be a separate entity. In addition to that, the legal form don't give the parties the rights to assets and obligations. So, in the shareholder agreement, it should not say building belongs to Mr. A, the owner. Furniture belongs to Mr. B or building one is owned by Mr. A. So, the, the, what is the nature of an entity? Is that you cannot have one-to-one -one relationship. Can you say like this, uh, you have purchased one share of Infosys. You go to Infosys and say that this chair, I am the owner, I will take home. Or you buy one share of PVR. You go and watch movie and then say, this is my chair, I'll take my home. Like the way we used to tell in our you know, childhood when we play cricket, this is my bat. You better give me, otherwise I will not give it to you. See, the nature of entity is such a way that you cannot establish one-to-one -one relationship. You, you prepare a balance sheet. 
you have source of funds, you have application of funds. Can we say share capital means fixed assets? Share capital means the cash balance. We can't establish that. It is always the overall ownership. It cannot be a specific ownership. So the legal firm should not give. It should not say that this loan is the responsibility of director A or this asset belongs to this person ownership. Clear a separate ownership should not be given. The nature of entity is that it is always a collective ownership and not an individual ownership. The legal form don't give the parties rights and obligations. And even the contract terms don't give the parties. Legal form, form means the, when you are defining memorandum or the company structure itself, you give like that. This company, 30% is owned by this person or you, you make something like uh, shareholder category A, shareholder category B. You do like this. Category A shareholder will be owner of uh, uh, buildings in Delhi. Category B shareholder are the owners of buildings in Bangalore. So this is legal form. When you are creating the structure itself, you are clearly defining this asset is belonging to a certain category of people. That is legal form. A contractual terms also should not be there. So even between the parties, they should not have signed an agreement. You take this building, I take this building, that's, that's how we'll manage the business. They are not illegal. You still can run the business by making the arrangements like this, where one person is responsible for one category of assets. It is not illegal, but for the purpose of the classification, they are not considered as separate entity, joint venture. They will be considered as joint operation. The legal form should not be there. Contractual terms should not be there and also output produced are not entirely for the co-ventures. Like A limited, B limited comes together, start company and whatever is produced in that company is used only by A and B. It's as good as joint operations only. It's as good as you coming together, uh, performing manufacturing activities and you're sharing expenses and incomes and all the responsibilities. That entity don't have an independence. It is not selling it to anybody else, outsider. So in that case also, it is going to be called as joint operations and not joint venture. So it has to be a separate entity plus these three conditions. If all are satisfied, then it will be classified as joint venture accounted as per the equity method that we apply for associates. Even if one of the condition is not satisfied, we follow joint operations and joint operation means you account for your share of profits and losses, income and expenses, not for the entire entity. So that's basic application of India's 111. So hardly you can expect maybe a theory question on this. And beyond that, whatever the accounting we apply of associates, the same thing applies here. When we go to the associates, there we learn the meaning of equity method of accounting. So that would be discussion on theory in this 111 joint venture. Next, in this 28, accounting for investment in associate. So this standard will be applicable in two situations. When in base 111, we discussed if it is a joint venture being separate entity, the accounting will happen here. Or if you are an associate, accounting for investment in associates, for that also, the same standard would apply. So first of all, they talk about what is the meaning of significant influence. So when the investor has good impact, on the financial policy, operating policy, on important aspects of the organization. So if you have, usually we take it as more than 20%. That is only for examination purpose, but it is not a rule that we follow as such. So if you have more than 20%, then we say that it's a good amount of shareholding. You will have an impact on the decision for sure, but you will not be having a decisive authority like a holding company, in those cases, you are not called as subsidiary, that is called as associates, where entity has not control, where entity has a significant influence. Again, it is a matter of judgment, uh, depends on case to case basis. Okay. Accounting wise, accounting for 
investment in associates accounting for investments in joint venture being separate entity that situation joint venture both we follow called as equity method remember investment in subsidiary investment in joint venture investment in associates we follow in days 27 which is usually carried at cost or on fair value basis as per index 109 so index 27 allows you to maintain these investments at cost whatever we are discussing now the investments are not in separate financial statements but in consolidated financial state consolidation does not mean only holding and subsidiary consolidation also means the investor and associate consolidation also means investor and joint venture so if you have investor and joint venture then also you prepare separate financial statements where only investment is there and consolidation financial statements where investment will be accounted using equity method the equity method of accounting is not in separate financial statements it is in consolidated financial statements Okay, what is this equity method? Uh, equity method basically means it should represent proportionate ownership of associate. So, if you consider an associate net worth of one lakh, you are having twenty five percent. So, you have to recognize twenty five thousand. Next year, that one lakh becomes two lakh because they make profits. then my investments of 25000 should become 50000 indirectly you have to recognize post acquisition of profits before i explain the equity method i'll take one step back if you purchase the shares of infosys so you are the shareholder of infosys so at the end of the year infosys declares i make so much of profit can you take that into your books of accounts and say i am a shareholder so i have made profit as well logically yes legally no logically yes because the shareholder of infosys you are one of them the profits belong to shareholder so profit also belongs to you may not be full profit but proportionate profit fractional ownership but you cannot take the profit out because in the legal structure of the company you don't have the legal right to control and when the legal right comes only when the dividend is declared so only when dividend is declared the investor shareholder recognizes as his income again the word is control when the profit is there it is your profit but you cannot take it you have to wait for the board of directors to approve uh, and they have to declare and then you get the control you can recognize it as dividend uh, receivables whereas in case of associates that is compromised to an extent where the accounting is very similar to what we do in case of partnership forms so if partnership forms makes a profit of 1 lakh the partner will recognize in his books as his share of profit he will not wait for to withdraw the profits from the firm the moment the partnership firm makes profit the partner will recognize in his books as share of profit in fact as per income tax they also say share of profit is exempt that is to say that first of all there has to be income then only exemption comes so accounting wise also that is what the method here also we are going to apply so equity method of accounting means initially we recognize investments it will be like investments to bank in the books of investor and subsequently when there is a post acquisition profit we will pass an entry investment account debit investment in associates to share of profit from associate of course your share only you don't recognize the full share you recognize only your share indirectly you represent 
a proportionate share of the ownership of the associate. And one more point is this investments includes goodwill. What is the formula or how do we calculate goodwill as such? Goodwill is difference between the purchase consideration minus net assets taken over. So the investments will always include goodwill. So here also we calculate goodwill, but goodwill is not disclosed separately. It will not come in the balance sheet as intangibles. It will be only disclosed in the notes to account. The investments in associate is worth 275,000, which includes goodwill of 25,000. Of course, proportionate goodwill only, but that is shown only in the notes to accounts. As far as accounting is concerned, initial recognition will be investments at cost and subsequently any share of profit from associate, whether received or not, it will still be recognized as investment account debit to share of profit from associate. And when you receive dividends, the dividend portion will not be taken to P&L account because dividend is paid out of your share of profits. So when share of profits only you have taken to investments, you have taken to P&L account, when you receive dividend, again you can't take it to P&L account. It is like being happy two times. If you get a message, salary created to your bank account, you are happy salary came to my account. Then you are withdrawing money from ATM. Again, you can't be happy. So, money is coming to my hand. It is with you and is coming to you only. So, you can't take that to P&L two times. So, when the income is recognized on accrual basis and this would have been taken to P&L account, this would have been taken to consolidated P&L account. When you receive dividend, again that cannot be taken to consolidated P&L account. That will be subtracted from investment. So, the entry will be bank account debits to investment. This is for any dividends received. Again, here also there is no concept of pre-acquisition dividend, post-acquisition dividend. Any dividend received will be credited to investment. So, this is initial recognition, investments to bank and investment to share of profit and then any dividend receives, you will take it as bank to invest. So, primarily that is all the summary of equity method of account. Other adjustments also you have to do, something like unrealized profit is there. If you have any fair value gain, like what we discussed in consolidation, fair value adjustment, depreciation, everything we have to add and subtract, like the way what we do for consolidation of subsidies. But primary uh, elements are these things. Uh, just a small point, anyway, we might cover it later. This is a typical case of defer tax also. Because this transaction we are doing only in books of account. For income tax purposes, this share of profit is not taxed. Because you tax, you pay tax only when you receive dividends. So, when you recognize the share of profit and you have investments here, so there will be a difference between the book value of investments and income tax book value of investments. So, this is the case where you recognize defer tax liability. Liability because you are recognizing a profit, but you are not paying a tax yet. So, you have to create defer tax liability. When you sell the investments, the defer tax liability will be reversed. Or when you receive dividend and therefore you pay tax, at that point in time, uh, defer tax liability will be reversed. Uh, reversal of defer tax would take place at that point in time. <coughs> okay, so that is about in the years 28, in the years 111, for joint venture as well as for associates, we follow same method of equity method of accounting. So, primarily I hope you got the difference. What do we do in consolidation of subsidiary? Investment in subsidiary will be taken out 
and the net assets that is assets and liabilities of subsidiary will be replaced the logic being holding company controls the assets and liabilities whereas in case of investment in associate or joint venture investments will continue investment will not be replaced because you don't have control over associates but you still have a majority of the ownership or you still have good amount of uh, impact and therefore we follow equity method of accounting the investment in associate will be replaced by investment in associates but along with a post acquisition share of profits so that would be the conclusion of the consolidation aspect in days 103 business combination ideally we should have understood this standard first then we come to consolidation because in days 103 first applies when the control is obtained but there were let lot more other aspects not just about the control and therefore uh, we decided to take it slightly later but point to be kept in mind is business combination is applicable at the first time when the control is obtained but control of what it is not the control itself is important it is the control of business so as per index 103 Two things to be kept in mind: you should be careful about what is control, which we have discussed in the consolidation. Control means there has to be three aspects: uh, there has to be power, there has to be right to variable returns, and ability to exercise that power. So those three are contributing to the control. But now the question comes: what is a business? It's a very interesting philosophical question. In general, if somebody asks you, Uh, we'll come to this thing but i want to set the basics in general if somebody ask you what is business i go to job is my is it my business i come and teach here is it my business we are running academy is it business again don't uh, try to apply the income tax business profession here here business means it is Uh, a business we don't differentiate between a business and profession that is only for income tax purpose so when i say business combination is applicable to business what do you mean by business how do you even define business so okay if i'm i'm selling this i'm selling all the chairs here am i selling my business then or from the buyer point of view is he acquiring the business it, it's very difficult in that sense to define it's easy to explain but difficult to apply we can give many examples yes this is yes this is no but practically it's very difficult to define for example if i tell you i have a software company five people are working for me we are building a product we don't have any customer so far we are trying to build some product now one company came and acquired and all those five people now are working for that new company does it mean they have just taken over those five people or they have taken over the business how can you say business because there is no customer at all so that's where lot of issue would come so practically i would call uh, different things let us only look at what does in days 103 says easy to apply an exam practically this is a very different game altogether okay so as far as in days 103 is concerned they ask us apply concentration test it is not compulsory it's a choice whether you have taken or not if you have taken whether it is passed or not what is concentration test is when you take over a business it means you are taking over assets and liabilities in both assets and liabilities whether a single asset is dominating if you take an example of a travel agency or travel company they have lot of buses and you take over that bus company out of the 1 crore consideration you paid 95 lakh is towards the buses that means you are not acquiring the business you are acquiring the bus it is called as asset acquisition it is not called as a business acquisition so concentration test basically tells does any asset dominates typically we take like 90% or more 
if some asset is dominating or some category of asset is dominating it is called as asset acquisition and importance of asset acquisition is we don't recognize goodwill we will set off that or any amount excess paid will be either apportioned among the assets or you take it to pnl as maybe loss on acquisition loss on restructuring things on those lines so if it is asset acquisition in this 103 does not apply so if the concentration test don't satisfy then you go to the same step as what we are following now but if that uh, concentration test not satisfied or decide you not to take then you check whether there is any output so for a, you to tell business there has to be goods there has to be services there has to be customers to check whether any output exists if output yes mostly it will be business purchase you can just say that i mean they also have point if one of the condition not satisfied critical process skill was or process significant i'll not go too much in depth to it if output exists, usually from exam point of view, you can take it as yes, there is a business acquisition. If output does not exist, typically happens in cases of software startups. They don't have customers, but one person will take over the other companies. Like you might be nowadays, just for example, building artificial intelligence product. Just for example purpose main issue of the CS students now is asking doubts. So if some company, three, four people come together, let's solve CS student problems. There are so many problems. At least let us solve this one. And they develop a product which says, you go and ask a doubt, it will give the answer based on the particular section or content, like how that particular faculty answers, not the general answer. Like for example, if somebody considers how I behave, how I explain, taking my notes into consideration, my method into consideration, they prepare an artificial intelligent product training on my explanation, they have built a product, one app, so it will answer just like the way I answer it. They don't have customers, but let's say we, our academy decide to acquire them. The product don't have, there is no ex exact customers are there, there is no uh, number of units to establish, there is no sales to establish, but there is a critical process and includes a skilled workforce. So there are network being established, there are computer system being in place, code being written, those kind of things. If both are satisfied, it's a business purchase. If both are not there, then it is just a asset purchase. In summary, what they are trying to tell is, how do you define a business? Business should have customers or business should have at least critical process and skilled workforce. If those things are there, it is called as business. If not, it is called as asset purchase. That is to summarize. So if it is a business purchase, then what you are going to do, uh, there has to be a control. Uh, these are the steps to be followed. You have to identify the acquirer, acquisition date, identifiable assets. You recognize goodwill or capital reserve. And most important point is this. When is the acquisition date? Connecting with this, when the control is obtained. So it is not about the legal transfer, legal ownership, where the shares are transferred in particular name. When the acquirer controls the activities of the acquiry. That is the date on which the acquisition date is there. Okay, let me give small points to be kept in mind while doing the business combination. And then we look at those points, it will be more relevant. Let's say A Limited acquires B Limited. So what does A limited get and what does B limited get? When I say A limited acquires, they have to pay the amount called as purchase consideration. Which may be in the form of cash paid, which may be in the form of shares issued, 
or any other consideration like land given any of those things. And what does A limited get is assets and liabilities or in other words we call it as net assets of subsidy. Our working note should be to first to calculate purchase consideration, the second working note is to calculate the net asset. The difference is what you usually call it as goodwill or capital reserve, or here we also refer it as gain on bargain purchase. And another working note will be the, uh, the form of purchase consideration, what is the breakup of it. But what is the difference between this you would have learnt in AS14 in Inter also with respect to Indus 103 is. When you say I acquire delimited net assets, it need not be 100% acquisition. It is just that you acquired 90% from existing shareholders, which basically means you are not acquiring the company as it is. You are getting the shares of another company, your company and another company both continue to exist then also in days 103 apply. So that is called as acquisition of shares, acquisition of interest through shares, where both company will continue to survive. That is where initially we apply in days 103 and at the end of every year we apply in days 110 consolidation. Whereas in another case, what problem you used to solve in AS14 is be limited after acquisition is dissolved. So A takes over complete B limited, the B limited no longer exists. Like PVR taken over INOX, now INOX is no longer separate entity existing, it is being taken over. So in those cases, AS14, I mean INDES 103 initially applies, subsequently INDES 110 will not come because another entity no longer being existence. Either of the cases, what is the important points to be kept in mind? In here A limited we called as the acquirer and B limited, let's say we can call it as acquiree and this net asset should be taken over at fair value. All the assets and liabilities are taken over at fair value. Few small exceptions here and there, maybe we can take it up later, but it should be taken over at fair values only and that's where the fair value adjustment would come. And whenever fair value adjustment would come, there can be defer tax impact. And regarding the fair value element, there are few more exceptions, like if it is a contingent consideration, if it is share based payments, contingent liability, few specific discussions are there, we will handle it in a moment from now. But what point to be kept in mind is, only the acquiry is taken over at fair value. I am trying to explain from the exam problem point of view. They will give you two balance sheets, acquire A limited balance sheet, B limited balance sheet and they will ask you after acquisition prepare the combined balance sheet. In those cases, B limited being taken over that will be revalued amount, but acquirer will always be taken over at or for solving problem purpose it will be at book values. As a result, when you prepare the combined balance sheets, all A limited elements we take it at book values, B limited amount will take it at the fair values. That is one point. The second point is especially with respect to these two elements, one is uh, share capital, other is uh, reserves and surplus or other equity as we call here. The share capital will be existing share capital of A limited, the acquirer plus whatever the issued share capital issued to B or B limited shareholders. That will be the working note to be kept in mind. Regarding reserves and surplus, A limited reserves and surplus will continue, acquirer reserves will continue, whereas B limited reserves will not come. Because you take over only assets and liabilities, net assets, not the reserves part. So, reserves will not be taken over, exception being one situation, it is called as entities under common control. 
if entities are under common control then it is taken over at book values and even reserves are also taken over what is entity under common control i'll explain in a moment from now there we apply pooling of interest method so in those cases even the acquirees reserves also will come apart from that what are the other reserves that will come during the course of acquisition will be security reserve the security premium because if the shares are issued above face value that face value will come in the share capital but the premium element will come here so this is the security premium on issue then a capital reserve might come that is difference between uh, purchase consideration net assets if you paid less that gain on bargain purchase the capital reserve might come and one unique thing can come and that is share based payment reserve esop reserve share based payment reserve so if the existing the b limited has a esop plan and a limited replaces with its new plan so those cases you take over the share based payment reserve calculation will come to it that will also be part of the reserve so existing the acquire reserves but these three typical reserve would come in most of the problems security premium capital reserve and share based payment reserve if there is a defer tax component of they come in the respective defer tax provisions the long term provisions or on the non current assets element yeah so these are the overall points to be kept in mind while solving problems now as far as adjustment is concerned one un universe adjustment that is uh, everything is taken over at fair value basis one more small point is uh, i told you you have to identify acquirer that is also very unique problem Uh, there is a situation we call it as uh, reverse acquisition it is like telling i am acquiring and in that process i am acquired in movies also they will show certain situations right like one person will be very innocent and uh, other person will fell love in with that person that person get married and after that the other person turns violent see that was not my true face this is my real face and the story goes on like that so here also let's say a limited has 400 shares they acquired b limited and they issued 400 shares so 600 shares so after acquisition thousand shares so a limited shareholders after acquisition will have 40% whereas b limited shareholders will have 60% in the merged entity so this is what we call it as reverse merger where the account legally a limited taking over b accounting acquirer becomes b limited and what is the impact of accounting acquirer b limited all b limited book value should continue a limited fair values to be accounted b limited reserves will continue b limit a limited reserves will not continue and you have to account as if b limited is taking over a limited not only for business combination but also for uh, eps reporting for the purpose of profit calculation so those kind of things also one problem is there okay let me go through the adjustments quickly adjustments will not take much time because it's uh, you should be able to follow okay what are explained so far now this is what is in the form of uh, chart purchase consideration should be as per negotiation nci can be valued on fair value method proportionate method that you are aware of it we have discussed in consolidation assets and liabilities will be at fair values Uh, this is an important point 
contingent liability is recognized, not just disclosed. It's an exception. Generally, contingent liability is only disclosed below balance sheet. The logic is very simple. If somebody says this company has a case pending versus another company don't have any case pending, our purchase consideration will not be same. If somebody says my case is pending in the court, I will definitely say, okay, I'll pay you only a little bit less than. So purchase consideration will have an element of indirect impact of contingent considerations and corresponding net assets also should be having so contingent liabilities. So contingent liability is recognized. That's the point to be kept in mind. And as far as possible, intangibles other than goodwill to be recognized separately. The logic is we recognize goodwill as difference between purchase consideration and net assets. So if you don't show certain intangibles separately like copyright or a brand or a license, then that also will be included as part of goodwill which may not be appropriate. So to the extent identifiable, intangibles are recognized separately and then we write down the balancing figure as goodwill. Uh, direct cost, that is uh, amalgamation expenses are not adjusted against goodwill, they are charged to P&L. If the land is given as purchase consideration, its fair value is considered. Measurement period, measurement period means like in days 10 what we uh, going to uh, uh, understand. As on balance sheet date, there is uncertainty and subsequently that uncertainty will be resolved. So as on the date of acquisition, certain fair value is uncertain and subsequently that issue is resolved. So when the issue is resolved, that liability or asset is readjusted and corresponding effect is given in goodwill or capital reserve. That is called as measurement period. Initially, you recognize it on provisional basis. When the measurement period ends, normally maximum we take it as 12 months. That means when the uncertainty is resolved, corresponding assets and liabilities are adjusted and the effect is given in the goodwill. Step acquisition, we have seen in consolidation, any previously acquired equity will be remeasured on fair value basis. If any separate relationship is there, you are counted separately, like mutual owings, those things you are counted separately. Okay, uh, contingent consideration. Contingent consideration also to an extent I think we have seen in some discussion earlier, but anyway, we are also going to see the uh, discussion in our classes. Contingent consideration means amount payable upon satisfying certain conditions. At the beginning, we should recognize it on fair value basis. But if it is payable to employees in connection with employment, like for example, you say, I am acquiring your company, you should also work after acquisition for next five years. In those cases, if I am making a payment that is not in connection with the owner, but in connection with the employment. So if the amount is paid towards the condition of employment of a person, then that is a employment expense, employee benefit expense, not part of purchase consideration. If it is payable to shareholders, if it is within measurement period, the fair value adjustment, you can adjust in goodwill itself. If it is after adjustment period, depends whether that is in the nature of equity or not as equity. Equity means the number of shares to be issued should be fixed. We will read that in financial instrument. Not equity means it is uh, the amount like obligation to pay cash or the number of shares issued is not fixed. If it is nature of equity, we don't remeasure. So whatever the initially we recognize on fair value basis, that will continue till the end. If it becomes confirmed, we have to issue the shares, that uh, contingent consideration will be converted into share capital and security premium. It will never be remeasured if it is equity. If it is nature of debt, we have to remeasure at the end of every year. So initially it was 20 lakh. At the end of the financial year, it became 21 lakh. 1 lakh loss we recognize in PNL and liability becomes 21. Actually, next year when you make payment, it is 21.2 lakh. Again, recognize 0.2 lakhs loss and the liability will be debited and to bank, the liability gets closed. Uh, this is contingent consideration. Uh, let me discuss about the share-based payments 
reward these are the also the elements that they will include in solving problems share based payments are what two varieties possible the acquirer replaces with his whatever uh, acquirer a limited had share based payment plan he will replace with his plans or acquirer does not replace means whatever the acquirer is having the same plan is being continued if acquirer replaces then the calculation goes like this the fair value of the original award multiplied by vesting period completed divided by either original vesting period or the new vesting period whichever is higher the logic behind this calculation is we are calculating how much expense is supposed to be recognized till date so for example the value is 10 lakhs and this expense is spread across the vesting period vesting period means how long it takes to become eligible condition to be satisfied so usually it will take let's say 5 years to complete so 10 lakhs divided by 5 we recognize every year 2 lakh but after this acquirer replacing this now no longer 5 years required it is sufficient you complete only 3 years 3 more years are sufficient to you don't need 5 years it is sufficient you do only 3 years so you don't spread across 5 years you will spread across 3 years or whichever is higher no okay you will spread across 5 years and then you multiply it by whichever is uh, how many years is completed so out of 5 years let's say 2 or 2 year completed you multiplied by 2 by 5 so the total expense divided by higher of original vesting period or new vesting period and multiplied by the number of years completed more logic behind this calculation it is uh, we will consider when we discuss in days uh, 102 there where the situations are there we will revisit this formula at that point in time any difference that any additional expense additional amount will be recognized in post combination period if the replacement did not happen then to the extent vesting happened it will be part of nci to the extent not vested it will be recognized after business combination as an expense uh, okay one more point to be kept in mind regarding the e merger this is where the entity under common control situation also could arise so when does the de merger applies uh, when the new company is being formed for example a limited has two segment x and y and y is being formed with the new entity something like y uh, limited separate entity being formed so in those cases we call it as de merger so from the y limited entity point of view it is acquisition it is acquiring from a limited so how do you account in a limited and how do you account in y limited for a limited it is the assets and liabilities given up so you will credit to net assets and any purchase consideration receivable you will debit it difference will be profit or loss on de merger that is as far as the seller is concerned for the buyer in this 103 apply so that depends on whether the control is with the same person or the control changed that is what we call it as a entity under common control let me explain that concept quickly what is that entity under common control same example only i'll take let's say a limited has two segments Uh, x and y or mobile laptop something like that and y division is being sold and new company is being formed called as y limited now the question is uh, who was controlling a limited earlier let's say for example the mr p is having 60% and once you form y limited you issue the shares because you are getting uh, the wide division and you have to issue the purchase consideration and you issue the purchase consideration to mr p i mean you issue the purchase consideration to all the shareholders and p being the shareholder he will also get 60% of the purchase consideration so earlier wide division was controlled by ultimately mr p only and after acquisition wide limited is still controlled by mr p because he has 60% of the shares so before 
acquisition after acquisition the control is with the same person and that's where we say it is a case of entities under common control which are institute examination questions they have asked like this what is one more possibility that could happen mr p did not have 60% let's say he has only 40% he don't have control or nobody had any one person have specific control that means uh, y division earlier was not controlled by anybody specifically now y limited also is not controlled by any one person or you cannot identify that this is having the control in those cases we don't apply entity under common control we apply regularly whatever in this 103 says and what is the uh, situation importance of entity under common control if you follow entity under common control that means there is no goodwill can be recognized common control business means you don't recognize goodwill and all assets and liabilities are taken over at book values and even reserves are also taken over reserves are taken over and this is called as pooling of interest method and this is a carve out this is not there in ifrs this is there only in indias because only indians are capable of thinking those extraordinary thought like if one division is making loss what do we do we'll transfer to other person within our uh, group only and he will acquire at a higher price the higher price is normally is foolishness but in accounting terms we call that as goodwill so a, a loss making division we convert it into a goodwill and don't think it is not possible uh, something like this happened indirectly in nirav modi case where uh, he had a inventory he sold that to one more group entity at a higher price like 2 lakhs he sold it to 20 lakhs and that entity sold to another entity in the same group at 2 crore now the asset is looking at 2 crore and based on the 2 lo 2 crore he took the loan from the bank so that's how situations are there so we indians are capable of doing it that is why when the controller remains before and after you are not allowed to recognize goodwill you are not allowed to uh, take over assets at fair values that is on in days 103 the merger specifically entities under common control okay so these are the theory aspects relating to business acquisition in summary we discussed of course this is only a summary part only when you do problems you will be able to apply these concepts okay so let us start the new chapter financial instruments so financial instruments is definitely important chapter from exam point of view and also it has connection with so many other standards so if i ask you on basic question do you think these are financial instruments a currency note it is spent it is not a tab or a mobile it is not a credit card or debit card it is so even without looking at the definition you know the concept of financial instrument but slightly on a larger scale if you think can we say that everybody's asset is somebody else liability if you think about you have a bank balance for a bank it is a liability if you think you have uh, invested in bonds debentures of a company for the company it is a liability if you think i have invested in shares of the company for the company it is issued shares so if you imagine everybody's assets is somebody else liability so if you prepare world consolidated balance sheet 
everything is set up one person investments other person's uh, liability other person share capital one person investments so what remains is non financial instrument like building furniture gold you don't have anybody else liability there they are asset on its own so they are non financial instruments you now technically on one side we can think like that anyway let's go to the definition as what uh the standard says in this 32 talks about definition of financial instruments very simple definition financial instruments is a contract where it is financial asset of one and it is liability of another or equity instrument of another this is not a new definition at all to you because what is the definition or e accounting equation you would have learned long time back accounting equation is asset equals to liability plus capital which is what this definition also financial asset equals to financial liability plus equity so if you talk about bonds for the investor point of view it is an asset from the company point of view have issued bond it is a borrowing it's a financial liability if you think from equity shareholder point of view for him it is an investment it is equity investment yeah, asset it's a financial asset from the company point of view it is a shares issued so that is a equity instrument but more importantly the first one is also important it is a contract there has to be a contract without which you cannot call it as financial instruments for example you can say income tax for the assessees it is income tax payable for the government income tax receivables so it inevits one person asset other person's liability but you are not paying income tax because of any contract that is a legal obligation the legal obligations and all will not be called as financial liabilities they are not called as financial instruments so financial instruments it has to be asset of one and it has to be either liability of another or it has to be equity of another so what i do is a, a first i'll go through all the definitions and whatever the standard says then we can take up uh, that, that means i'll take up this financial instrument uh, definition and also classification so i'll consider the entire standard uh, as one chapter okay what is a financial asset financial asset comprises of cash equity instrument of another contractual right or a contract settled in own equity instrument cash is an asset and did not explain equity instrument of another means investing in shares of companies contractual right to receive cash so first point is cash and here you have a right to receive cash for example you have debtors loan bill receivables you have rights to receive cash or another financial asset in the sense they will not give you cash but instead of that they'll give you check which is bank they or their customers can pay you bill receivable another financial asset or exchange financial asset where it is potentially favorable as of now i'll just tell you because it is favorable it is an asset if it is against it's unfavorable it becomes liability as of now i'll keep only that much i will revisit this definition Uh, in a moment from now and the contract settled in own equity instrument so if you have a balance sheet asset side you had one concept called as investment in own debentures where you buy your own debentures from the market and you settle by uh, or you cancel we, we cancel the debentures like that can you buy your own shares in the market can tcs buy tcs share in the market that is actually called as buyback and once you buy back you cannot keep it with you as my share i'll show it in my investments you have to immediately cancel it you know about company law procedures to do the same therefore in india this point is not present yet for contract settled in own equity instrument 
it is there in other countries where there in their asset side they show investment in own shares it's also called as treasury shares so when you have an asset which will be settled by issuing your own shares a typical example i told you is buyback imagine if buyback cancellation did not happen you're still showing the balance sheet as investment in own shares they would be called as settled in own equity instrument in the indian indian context this is actually amounted to buy back so it is not uh, relevant in indian context but it might be some foreign companies and all you do consolidation so in those cases this points still be there from exam point of view the last point is not to be worried much let's go further what is the financial liability financial liability is an obligation to deliver cash or another financial assets you may pay cash or you may accept a bill or you may issue check either you pay cash or you pay another give another financial asset or exchange an asset or liability which is potentially unfavorable so as of now i am just use the word potentially favorable is asset potentially unfavorable is liability more about it i'll give an example later contract settled in own equity instrument so you have a liability but you are not paying cash you are settling by issuing shares this can happen n number of times one example can be compulsorily convertible bonds so you are having a bonds which is a financial liability but it will be settled by issuing your own shares so that is in own equity instruments you are purchasing raw materials from suppliers and the settlement will happen by way of issue of shares that is contract settled in own equity instrument uh, employees have given their services you have an obligation to pay them and you give the obligation you settle the obligation by issuing shares the esop whatever we call it that is also contract settled in own equity instrument uh, derivatives i should talk about debt and equity compulsorily convertible preference shares will definitely come under contract settled in own equity instrument whether the liability component or equity component so that's where we have to discuss the concept of uh, you know compound financial instruments or hybrid financial instruments will come to that just want to know whether i've included that in the chart i'll cover all these points uh, compound financial instruments is there okay we'll come to the compound financial instruments in a moment from now i'll go to the next topic and then i'll revisit this point again derivatives uh, derivatives i hope you would have learned in detail and that may be forgotten by now in your advanced financial management derivative chapter as far as accounting is concerned three condition to be satisfied the derivative should change with respect to underlying asset initial investment should be zero or minimal and it should be settled in future date if you take an example as options where you pay some amount called as option premium and option premium will be very minimal as compared to underlying asset so the infosys share is 1500 rupees its option price only may be let's say 20 rupees so there is an investment of 20 rupees but it is minimal as compared to the underlying the original asset under that and value should change with respect to underlying variable to so that infosys share price will change with respect to the i mean the option price of infosys will change with respect to the infosys share price so if infosys share price changes its option price also change so it is connected and that is why it is a derivative and settle at a future date in options we will use a term called as expiry date and on the expiry date the contract will be settled and that is what settled at a future date if i consider the example of futures initial investment will not be there or minimum investment will be there that's called as margin that also margin will come back when you settle the future agreement 
the value of the futures changes with respect to the spot so that point is also satisfied and future is all definitely settled at a later date future date the future and options can be taken as a quick example so before i go further let's see if i can give one small practical example anyway now market is not trading at least just to give an examples right what is spot price what is future price because even if i have to give some examples i want you to be on the same page for that purpose okay so this is the nsc website where usually the transactions are happened in india mainly we have two nsc bsc let me take infosys the share price is uh, thousands 693 i hope you can see that Thousand six ninety three is the spot price, or we can say that's let's call that as underlying asset in for the share price. Let's come to derivatives. We are in Feb two thousand twenty four, so let me select the futures expiry date. Let's say the current month Feb twenty four. The price you can see it is thousands. Uh, 704 i think what was the base the spot price 1690 and this is 1704 usually future price will always be slightly higher than spot price because that accounts for the time value of money so what is this 1704 means if i purchase the futures means i get the right to buy or i will uh, not the right i am obliged to buy the infosys share on 29th feb at the price of 1704 so entering into future contract means i am entering into an agreement the agreement is to buy the infosys share price at 1704 on 29th feb so date of settlement is 29th feb but date of entering into the contract is today or whatever the date on which you purchase but what is the advantage of entering into this versus spot market in spot market i have to pay immediate cash in future market i don't have to pay the full amount i only have to pay margin amount margin money will be marginal amount that is insignificant so and on the expiry date suppose the price happens to be not 1700 if it happens to be 1800 then i have a profit of Hundred, or let's say not about expiry date. Two three days later, you are holding this instrument where you have an obligation to buy the info the share price at thousand seven hundred and four rupees, but market price becomes thousand seven ten for some reason. That means you are sitting in a profit of six rupees, and that is what I am calling it as. potential favorable position so you have taken in the future you have purchased the future that we called as long position and the share price has gone up so you are sitting at a profit so that is what is called as potentially favorable so you recognize the at the end of the year if that was situation you recognize it as financial asset the joint entry would be uh, financial asset account debit to fair value gain the profit whatever is the unrealized gain but if the share price has gone down then you expect a loss to happen similarly if i take options expiry date 29 feb let me take all option or let me take let's say a particular price of 1700 or 710 option premium is 30.75 i'm not sure you can see 30.75 is the option premium so what is the meaning of 30.75 i'll be paying today 30.75 rupees and by paying what i get is the right 
the right to buy the Infosys share at a strike price of 1,710. So, this is called as call option, holder position. By paying the option premium, I get the right. And 30.75 is the maximum, of course, I can lose. So, 1,710 is the right to buy the price and 30 rupees I am paying up front. Suppose tomorrow if the share price goes up, then this option premium also will go up. 30 rupees might become 32 rupees. So the 2 rupee will be my uh, profit. But this, I can never a situation where I can get more than 30 rupees loss because that's a maximum amount of premium paid and nothing can come back. Beyond that I don't have any obligation. So for a holder, the 30 rupees will be called as a financial asset. At the end of the year, I have to revalue it. We will come to the recognition, subsequent recognition and all. But on 29th February, suppose Infosys share price happens to be 1700. Which means your option has no value. And you have paid 30 rupees, entire 30 rupees is gone. You will not get anything back. Suppose share price becomes 1800. You are having the strike price of 1,710, but market price happened to be 1,800. So the option value is 90 and you have paid 30 and therefore the difference is your profit. Anyway, that is the derivative gain. Works mostly like a lottery only. But anyway, uh, any questions that you want to ask on how the future works? and options works if you have that base i can take up further on their accounting treatment so do you have any questions on any of these numbers with respect to prices now you have paid already 31 30 rupees you already paid and you got the right that means the right is already with you and if the market price increases, that right is not relevant because you already purchased. The right is relevant if you want to sell it. So somebody else will buy from you at 35 rupees. So you get a profit of 5 rupees. So that is a continuous price discovery happening. That is the choice you have. Either are you going to settle on net basis or are you going to settle on uh, delivery basis. See, by purchasing the premium, you have got the right to buy the share at 1710. Or you can give the right to somebody else. If you give the right to somebody else, you get whatever the 35 rupees amount. But you will not be able to buy the share again because you have given the right to somebody else. So you treat this, what I usually call in my sessions as, treat like a gift coupon. So if you show this gift coupon, you get some discount on the underlying asset. Let's say laptop you purchase, you get discount. If you show your yourself, you get discount. Or if you give the coupon to somebody else, that person will get a discount. But you are transferring the gift coupon and you can collect the money from him. So that, that's how the settlement will take place. Uh, if you transfer the right to somebody else, you collect the money from him and that person will get the right to buy from the company or buy from the writer. So that's the options or call option position. Any other questions? This understanding is important, so I will take one or two more minutes extra just to cover this point. Let me go back to the example of futures. Same example I take. Today, Infosys spot price, what was the number? One six. 
nine zero something nine three okay and future price is one seven zero five let's say i'll take it as one seven zero five so today if you buy future at what price you will buy at 1705 so how much will you pay after buying you will not pay 1705 rupees it is just a commitment that you are giving on expiry you have two methods of settlement we call it as settlement on net basis or settlement on delivery basis settlement on net basis means okay let me do net basis later settlement on delivery basis means this future contract what you have you will execute meaning you will pay 1705 and you will receive one share of infosys market price has no impact on settlement on delivery basis if it is settlement on net basis effectively this you have what contract you have entered when you do settlement on delivery basis you have executed that contract you have fulfilled that contract now when it comes to settlement on net basis this contract is going to be cancelled and another name for cancelled is called as square off So earlier you did buy, and now you are going to do sell at whatever the rate on the expiry date. Suppose expiry date happens to be thousand seven zero eight. That means you will receive profit of three rupees. You will not receive the shares. So you should understand the difference between settlement on net basis, settlement on delivery basis, because accounting depends on these two varieties. if this point is not clear then the accounting part of it also we will not be able to follow it so that's why i just want to spend quickly a couple of minutes on the futures part of it so let me know if you have any doubts on this and then i'll also discuss about the uh options also quickly you can Uh, by doing only square off, not by settlement by delivery basis, because there you can do by cancelling the contract. So enter into one future sell contract. So future buy contract, future sell contract gets cancelled. That day also you can do it. It, it is the intraday transaction. That day also it's fine. That's possible. Okay, so any other doubts on the futures part? And you need to know the difference between settlement on delivery and settlement on net. Settlement on delivery basis means you execute the contract. Settlement on net basis means you are cancelling the contract and differential amount you may receive and differential amount you may pay. And that is why we are using the word if differential amount is receivable, that is creating a financial. Debt. If the difference amount is loss, you have to pay. that is creating a financial liability as so future you may have financial liability or you may have financial asset depending on you are in profitable position or you are in loss position no it I mean it depends on the price moment whether the price has increased or price decreased so you have bought the future at 1705 if the price has gone up then you can cancel it at profit if the price gone down you will have to cancel it at loss it's an obligation you can't avoid now here you can do no on delivery practically you can 
definitely you can make the payments and you will get the shares delivered in fact if you don't do anything that will happen automatically no for the timing the futures you mean uh, it, it it will be a contract and you have entered into future by contract and you have not uh, squared off that means the delivery will happen so that means the money will be taken out from your account and and the shares will be transferred to your demat account on expiry date on expiry date and that is why they take some money from you that's called as margin so they take money from you as an advance for this purpose only because what will people do is uh, you enter into a contract and later when it's not favorable you run away from there so that is where they take some money as a deposit that's why it is called as uh, margin money and that margin money will not be like initial margin money every day the price changes they keep on collecting the money from your account uh, so that it's not waited uh, till the day to settle every day whatever the difference they keep on taking the money or if it is profitable the money will be given to your account you will keep getting the money where I mean, the the margin money will keep adjusting towards that okay this is on the futures let me just quickly talk about the options there are two types of options one is call option let me talk about call option call option means there will be two people holder and other person is called as writer and holder will pay premium that's option price what we saw the 30 rupees that is what is uh, if you click buy that means you are paying premium and you can also sell means the other person obviously have to uh, sell that is called as that person will receive premium and why do you pay premium by paying premium you get the right to buy at we have selected the strike price as 1710 if the holder has getting the right to buy the writer therefore will have the obligation to sell at 1710 on expiry date suppose if it happens to be 1000 uh, you know 800 rupees that means the holder will get a profit of the differential amount 90 rupees the same profit will be loss for the writers ah that is the net profit that is the 90 amount is the payable or receivable on expiry date and minus the premium will be your net profit or loss but if you consider what is the transaction takes place on expiry date the difference between the strike price and market price and that is why we say holder has paid premium and that is his maximum loss he cannot lose more than that whereas writer can lose any amount it is unlimited prof unlimited uh, profit for holder therefore it becomes unlimited loss for the writer that is call option so for a holder we will recognize it as financial asset for the writer we will account it as financial liabilities coming to the put option yeah if the price is 1600 you have a right to buy at 1710 you are not under obligation so you don't require to buy you will say that i don't want to buy so whatever 30 rupees you have paid that is lost that will not come back and that is the maximum profit for writer and that is why usually writer makes more money than the holder because most likely that price will not increase or it will not increase beyond a point so writer usually will be at a advantage position there 
unless it crosses that holder will not be able to make money the holder position is like a lottery ticket buyer and writer position is like a seller the holder position is like in a casino you go and play you are the holder the casino is the writer so most probably they will make the money there and options and futures is nothing but derivatives so it is nothing but gambling uh, it is there for insurance purpose and all that is on other side but at least majority what is there in stock market now i would just say it is a legally allowed gambling place and people make money in derivatives only by selling their courses not by trading so that's what people ask can i make money by intraday trading in derivatives yeah you can make but you have to sell course you, if you trade only 99% of the people lose 1% of the people gain that is as good as the lottery ticket winning chance so the probability is less unfortunately i have also spoken to so many people when i was appointing few people c students were telling i'm trading intraday and managing my father's money if at all if any of you are doing it i sincerely request please stop it that's not what we are meant to do that is just <coughs> some phenomenon happening outside it is it is a way of transferring from money from one hand to another where is your value addition i'm not talking about long term market investment that's a different case I'm just talking about is derivatives and all the only way for you derivatives are useful is in examination because it can give you marks so focus only on that beyond that don't try to trade please don't involve in such things how much ever you do whichever strategy you adopt it is ultimately one person profit other person's loss so there is no value addition there okay so put option is also two people will be there holder writer holder will still pay premium writer will still receive premium but the difference is by paying premium the holder gets the right but it is the right to sell at whatever particular price strike price right to sell and because holder gets the right to sell the writer will have obligation to buy so usually when we choose call option if you are expecting the market to give good news market price to go up we select call option and if something is expected market to go down then we can select put option so in 3 4 months time election is coming so what do you think will happen to the stock market after election now, honestly let me tell you one thing nobody knows the future if somebody tells i know this will happen there are only two kinds of people who tell the future one is god others are liars there is no other people who can tell i know the future or somebody tells i can teach or even if i tell i'll conduct workshops even i will not know the future nobody knows the futures but certain logical guess if you make who wins or loses is secondary my analysis is slightly different i will go like this again it's a conspiracy theory market will go up till elections the reason is there is money involved politicians need money for them to run the elections so they'll keep the stock market alive till then once or they will have various names through whatever their different names they'll make sure the stock market is high and that by selling that money they want to use it for their other operations once the election is over they no longer have an obligation to keep the stock market higher it will go down it is my personal expectation i may go right i may go wrong differently if you are in line with that expectation you can buy put option premium you pay premium by infosys share price or whatever put option premium uh, the premium number will be different of course for that and if that happens the share price falls a put option premium will go to the roof the 30 rupees now it might become 100 rupees so you might even converting like two three times or if you lose entire amount is lost so again it's, it's all about 
speculation game but only thing is call option you will use if you are expecting the price to go up put option you can use if you are expecting the price to come down that would be the interpretation for a holder again even here you still call it as financial asset for a writer you will be calling it as financial liability because holder has got a right whereas writer has got obligation so when the right comes it is assets when the obligation comes it is liability okay let's go back to the the discussion what we are doing so hopefully now you are able to understand this potentially favorable potential and favorable better derivatives also example i have given uh, futures as financial instruments if the settlement is on delivery basis i just told you if the settlement is on delivery basis that means you are going to make a payment and get the underlying asset now the classification depends on what is the nature of underlying asset in my example it's infosys share which is a financial instrument but it can also be a gold silver copper oil so if they are non financial instruments the derivative on those also will be a non financial instrument so straight away we will not tell a derivative is a financial instrument in case of future it depends on the mode of settlement in this case that ua represent underlying asset fi is financial instrument if ua that's not like some movie rating there ua is the underlying asset if underlying asset is financial instrument then it is financial asset if underlying asset is not a financial instrument then it is also not a financial instrument this one small exception is there they call it as exception for own use so if you are using the derivative contract for own use purpose so if you are using for purchase of copper and copper is used as a raw material in your manufacturing exemption for own use is what they call it in those cases you can still consider it as a financial instrument and slight depend of accounting will come but anyway let me not confuse you further there our objective should be to focus on whether the settlement is on delivery basis or cash basis if the settlement is on net basis this underlying does not matter because either you receive cash or you will pay cash so if you have taken into a future buy if the market price increase you are in favorable position if the market price decrease you are unfavorable position so liability if you, you can also short the market that means you enter into a position of future sell So in those cases, the reverse would apply. That's called as taking a short position. Considering uh, options, again similar thing. Uh, the holder is always asset, writer is always liability. But if the settlement is on delivery basis, then it depends on the nature of underlying instrument. So in general, derivative settled on net basis, that is cash. It may be financial asset or liability. If on delivery basis, it depends on what is the underlying asset. If underlying asset is financial asset, yes, then this will also be classified. If underlying asset is not a financial asset like copper, oil, those kind of things, gold, underlying instrument that is derivative is also not a financial instrument. So coming to the preference shares, is preference shares equity or liability? normally we will have preference shares are redeemable preference shares that too in indian context you have like within 20 years you can't do or beyond 20 years you can't issue so redeemable preference shares are definitely financial liability so in the balance sheet under share capital we will show only equity share capital under long term borrowings we will write it as preference share capital that is not digestive to our nerve system but i can't tell it is a financial liability it is shown under long term borrowings but certain preference shares are also can be an equity element like if it is irredeemable preference shares again may not be indian context in general otherwise they are called as equity or you also have a situation of convertible preference shares where some portions can be converted 
or not necessarily it can also be redeemed in cash where we come to situation of the hybrid instruments or compound partial instrument coming to the dividend part of it preference dividend normally they are cumulative in nature so preference dividend are going to be called as obligation to pay cash so it's a financial liability means it will come before profit after tax before profit before tax the preference dividend it's an expense for us it's a liability so when you prepare the p and l account you will not write in appropriations preference dividend will be part of finance cost if it is non cumulative in nature that is you pay dividend only when it is uh, making profits in that case until it is declared it will be part of equity from exam point of view the most frequent area is this hybrid instrument where you have to have both elements of debt as well as equity one example if you take convertible debentures convertible debenture means every year you have to pay interest on maturity on redemption you may pay cash or you may issue shares if it is cash it is becoming in the nature of financial liability whereas if it is equity then it becomes equity if it is obligation to pay cash it becomes financial liability so what we do is let us read this part again okay now logically if i ask you your is company point of view tell me they are issuing two kinds of debentures one is convertible other is non convertible bonds non convertible means they will be settled only by cash no question of any issue of shares will you give same coupon for these two obviously no because convertible bonds have got one extra feature whereas non convertible don't have that option so non convertible will have let's say 8% coupon convertible let's say they will have like 6% they have to forgo the interest because they are getting one benefit of convertibility option so what the standard says is you take this 6% as cash flows 6% 6666 let's say five year amount 106 you take the cash flow from the convertible bonds option and then you discount using the market rate the market rate is non convertible bonds obviously when you discount it the value let's say that comes to something like let's say 92 rupees I don't know the exact number. Let's say it comes to ninety two rupees. So the company is issuing convertible bonds hundred rupees at a premium of uh, at a uh, coupon of six percent. But had you given this to a person who did not have convert option, he would not have given hundred rupees to you. He would have given only ninety two rupees to you because he is expecting not six percent. He is expects. Eight percent. So the value of this convertible bond is not hundred. The fair value of the convertible bond is only ninety-two. This eight rupee is representing the money given up by the holder for having conversion option. It is the money received by the company to give the conversion option. In other words. after 5 years if this bonds becomes shares this number whatever 8 rupees we recognized that 8 rupee will be like a security premium it is the equity amount received by the company in advance you can think on those lines let me go back to that chart now let's see whether that makes sense the so compound finance instruments it has both equity element and debt element examples are convertible debentures convertible preference shares accounting is we have to calculate that debt element then from the proceeds minus debt that gives you equity and how do you calculate the debt element by calculating the present value of the obligations 
So you take all the coupons and last year redemption amount, you discount it. By discounting should be using non-convertible coupon and they represent the expectation of a person who don't have conversion option. So using that discounting rate, you calculate the present value. What you get is debt element from the total proceeds. Subtract the debt element. What you get is the equity component. And this concept also going to be used in share-based payments under index 102, where there is an option of either the employee can get the settlement in shares or also in cash. There also we will apply the similar concept. So on the initial case, my example, like if I go back to this, 100 rupees, if the company receives, they will say 8 rupee equity component, 92 rupees debt component. This 92 rupees will be shown under long-term borrowings. 8 rupees will be reported under other equity, where you mention that bonds equity element shown under other equity. And then anyway, every year you prepare something called amortization cost. Those things and all we can see later. Okay, so this is on the classification. And one more point to be kept in mind. We are not included here. Maybe at least I can just talk about it. When we classify this, whether it is a equity or debt, the classification, financial liability or equity, we classify with something called as fixed to fixed. It means if you are issuing fixed number of shares, then it is called as equity. If the number of shares are varying, then it is called as debt. Just to I'll give a small example to understand that, and also we can write it maybe. So just for example, you are going to issue fixed number of shares, 1 lakh shares. On 1 1 2024, you have agreed, and on 31st March 2024, you are going to issue irrespective of the market price. This is fixed number of shares you are going to issue, so this will be classified as equity. On the other hand, you will say, I will issue the shares depending on the market price. I will tell you what is the logical reason this happens. Issue shares worth rupees, let's say, 20 lakh. This is like you have purchased goods from a creditor, from a supplier, and you have to pay 20 lakhs. You told I will not pay in cash, I will issue shares after three months on 31st of March 24. If the share price happen to be, let's say, 50 rupees, how many number of shares will be given? 20 lakh is the worth divided by 50 rupees. How much you get? Number of shares? 40,000. If the share price happens to be 20 rupees, 20 lakh divided by 20, so that will give you 1 lakh. So like this, when the prices changes, number of shares are varying, but what is the logic? Ultimately, amount you are trying to pay is 20 lakhs, means you have a fixed obligation to make a payment. If the price changes, you vary the number of shares, amount remains fixed, so that's what representing your obligation to settle. Therefore, when you are having a fixed number of shares, it is called as equity, fixed number of shares. If it is variable number of shares, then it is called as financial liability. Just keep this also in mind. This will be useful. Okay, one more small point under index 32 we, before we go to index 109 is called as embedded derivatives.
embedded as the name suggests it is implicit in one contract one contract has embedded another contract examples i will select it as a forward contract you will separately account if three conditions are satisfied if it has different economic characteristics existing comparable deliverable and host contract is not measured in fair value let me give an example and then you'll be able to apply those three conditions better okay let me talk about an exporter who have sold goods to a customer in us for let's say $1000 tell me what is the embedded derivative here obviously it's a foreign currency so you have to tell me whether it is forward by contract or forward sell contract which one of them is here embedded derivative it is forward by so I, I used to find this issue in the brs uh, in the initial days whether to do plus or to do minus so my teacher taught me a very beautiful technique till today it works without flaw the method goes like this you look take a look at the question and from bottom of your heart feel it whether it is plus or minus if your feeling is plus you do the minus if your feeling is minus you do the plus you are always right till today it works whenever you have to take decisions go against your feelings it will be correct the reason why you are telling it's a forward sell contract because you are thinking from financial management point of view like a hedging point of view what is the embedded derivative contract is in the contract itself what is happening you are thinking one step further what is one step further i have sold goods i'll receive dollars and once i receive dollars i have to sell it so you are thinking in the second step i am asking don't go to second step be in the first step itself you are selling goods and you are receiving dollars so receiving dollars is as good as buying dollars so the contract of export not for export i have to do something else that is what hedging in your afm or in other words i try to think like this think like a barter transaction so every time you go to a hotel don't think that you are paying money and getting idlis you have to think i am selling rupees buying idlis you go to petrol bank you are buying petrol and selling rupees this might look awkward but that is the truth if you try to think in my opinion your forward contract or your foreign exchange in afm also becomes smoother because you are used to this buy sell thought buy and then how to pay sell means i have to receive rather than those you try to think buy at the same time i am selling something else See, because it holds good in foreign exchange problems when it is rupees involved you go dollar i buy dollar i pay rupees when it is between dollar and pounds that's where usually confusion arises in afm problems so there you try to think dollar coming in i'm dollar purchasing pound going out pound i'm selling it keep it very simple so think like a barter transaction so coming back to this problem in this example i'm selling goods and i'm getting dollars so getting dollar is nothing but i am purchasing foreign currency or can i say like this if i have a import transaction now you tell me from uh, your 
AFM uh, point of view. I am an importer. What should I do to hedge my position? I am an importer, so that means I need to buy the dollars to give it to my supplier. I have to enter into a forward buy contract with my bank. But if I have export transaction, I don't need that because in the export I get the dollars. So my export is substituting my forward buy contract. Not sure if you are able to connect to that. But anyway, if I have to keep it very simple, try to think like a border transaction. When it is about exporter, you sell goods, receive money. Receiving money is as good as buying the foreign currency. One more example, I'll ask you, you tell me. Lease payable in foreign currency. What will be the embedded derivatives there? Foreign currency lease payable, lease payable but denominated in foreign currency. What service I am getting and what I am giving, try to think on those lines. What I am getting is whatever the assets I am able to use, the right. And what I am selling, in case of foreign currency means I am selling the foreign currency if it is a dollar. So that will become forward sale contract. So you will separate these two, that is the uh, contract. Well, for lease contract and the foreign currency uh, sale, you separate these two. If these conditions are satisfied, different economic characteristics. For example, I told you exporter goods value is different, the foreign currency value is different. They are not connected. So they are having different economic characteristics. Existing comparable deliverable. If you want to value a forward contract, there has to be a comparable in the market. Oh, one dollar is 80 rupees. If you don't have a comparable, how will you value it? So comparable should be there. And the host contract is not measured at fair value. Host contract, that is the value of uh, the import transaction or export transaction, should not include the value of the foreign currency also. You have to account that part separately. If those conditions are satisfied, you will account for host contract, that is like export transaction separately, which is towards the goods and the foreign currency transactions separately, which is towards the foreign currency contract. Okay, so that is regarding embedded derivatives. Okay, embedded derivatives is not very popular, maybe I think one time they asked an exam and one typical problem is what they ask if they are in study metal also. Okay, let us come to the standard in days 109. Classification of financial asset and liability. Okay. Three types of assets are there. They talk too many things about business model test, cash flow test, contractual cash flow test. You can go through it, but since we are focusing only from exam point of view, I do not want to talk too much about it because when they talk about business model, we think about different models. So there is going to be different thought process. Let me just focus on classification. This chart is sufficient. There are three types classification. Either you classify it as amortized cost basis, or you classify it as fair value through OCI, or you classify it as fair value through PL account. Three types of financial assets. When will you have it at amortized cost? Before I explain this, let us see to what extent you remember a little bit of your AFM. There is one term called as YTM, yield to maturity. Why is it called as yield to maturity? You are looking at me like something happened to me. Why this fellow is speaking these bad, bad words in the evening? Or you are giving look like you are teaching FR, you teach FR. AFM will discuss separately, do not mix the two. YTM is called as YTM, is very simple, you get that yield only if you remain invested till maturity. If you exit in between by selling it to somebody else, then that YTM is not the realized YTM for you. So here is what that amortized cost concept, if your intention is to hold the bond or any investment till its maturity, market value does not matter. So you continue to hold it at cost basis, they call it as amortized cost. We will come to that, what is amortized cost. 
but if your intention is not very if your intention is not to hold if your intention is to sell then market price becomes relevant so that's why we call we classify it as fair value through pnl if you have anything held for trading purpose like derivative held for trading purpose we will classify them as fair value through pnl account or most of the times like our life we are confused we don't know whether we will have it till maturity or we will sell it you may sell or you may hold when you are not very clear then you will have in between called as fair value through oci so let's take a look at this for classification of financial assets if it is debt instrument means investment in bonds loans debtors if it is held to collect contractual cash flows as far as bonds is concerned contractual cash flows are coupon and redemption price if your intention is to receive those two till the end you recognize it on amortized cost basis and uh, if your intention is collecting ccf ccf is contractual cash flow and sale of asset that means you don't have it till maturity as long as you are holding you receive coupon but once you sell the benefit is from sale proceeds the coupon will not be there that will be classified as fair value through oci that is for debt instruments if it is held for trading purpose if it becomes a ptpl if it is equity instruments it is held for trading means fair value through pnl account if not it will become fair value through oci and here also the standard gives you one time irrevocable option one time irrevocable option of feoci meaning when you purchase the shares you tell do you want to take it as fetpl or you want to take it as fetoci if you decide okay i am going to fetoci later you cannot come back that's why it is one time irrevocable option at the time of purchase for you to choose as fair value through oci as far as liability is concerned if it is held for trading purpose then fair value through pnl uh, if not it is on amortized cost so remember that one time irrevocable option okay now let's talk about recognition so three kinds would be there initial recognition what do we do subsequent recognition what do we do and ultimately when do we de recognize initial recognition will happen at market terms that means whatever is the market rate if your transaction is on those rates so if market rate of loan is 10 and you have given the loan at 10 the market rates and your transaction price both are same then you are going to account it normally the fair value and transaction price are same but if the fair value and transaction price are not equal which are the examples let me take one example employer employee employer gives concessional loan to employee the market rate may be 10% but the loan is given to employee only at 6% so transaction is not happening at market terms so transaction amount is different the fair value of the contract is different it can happen in many situations few examples i have given so let me take the first one as example because that's what most frequently asked from exam point of view uh market rate of interest let's say is 10% this is market rate of interest for loan but actually you have given the loan to employees only at So what you are going to do is you calculate all the cash flows of year one, year two, year three like that at the rate of ten percent. If not ten percent, sorry, six percent. If six percent was the transaction amount, what is the amount to be collected from employees? Cash flows, and those cash flows you discount it at the rate of 
ten percent market rate of interest. Obviously, value would come to let's say ninety six rupees something like that. Whereas uh, amount of loan given is hundred, its fair value is ninety six. Those four rupees you have to account it separately. Just like we accounted that equity element in convertible instrument, here we call this as employee benefit expense as four rupees. Sometimes the problem might say is if you have to give the loan, the employee has given a commitment he will work at least for five years. In those cases, that four rupee will be amortized against five years. If no condition existing like that, then that amount will be immediately taken to P and L account. The difference between employer and employee that is staff welfare advance. Similar thing will happen with respect to landlord tenant. This kind of question also they have asked. It is security deposit. Where imagine you have given a security deposit of one lakh when you are in a uh, occupying a premises. After ten years, you get back that one lakh only because whatever deposit you make, that deposit will come back to you. But had you given the deposit of somebody else and they said, "I'll pay you after one lakh," uh, I'll pay you one lakh after ten years. You would not have given one lakh today. You would not. You would have given only, let's say, like something like sixty thousand. So the fair value of that deposit amount is sixty thousand, but transaction amount is one lakh. So you recognize at fair value of sixty thousand. And on sixty thousand, every year you keep recognizing notional income basis. That forty thousand differential, you treat it like an advance rent payment. Logically, if I were to tell you. If I have given deposit to somebody else, I expect interest income. But I am giving deposit to my landlord. I am not getting anything as interest, but I am using his premises. So my benefit is not interest income. My benefit in the terms of using that premise. So I have to recognize rental payments in in the form of interest sacrificed. That interest sacrificed, I'll recognize it as interest uh, income, and I'll recognize it as rental payment. So one expense also recognized, one income also recognized. Notionally, had I given this deposit to somebody else, I would have earned interest to recognize interest income, but I'm not earning it because I'm using the premises, so I recognize interest expense. Net effect will be same, but accounting wise, it holds good like that. Similarly, parent gives the loan to subsidiary at a concessional rate. From the parent company point of view, the differential between transaction price and fair value is considered as equity investment, investment in nature of equity. From the uh, subsidiary company point of view, receiving receiving loan, so it is like equity contribution received. It's like shares issued, money received from the subsidiary company point of view. But if the loan is given by subsidiary to holding company, that differential is treated as dividend received. Why will holding company receive money from subsidiary concessional rate? That is the indirect form of benefit received. The benefit received, we are, we are calling it as dividend received for our subsidiary com um, holding company received. Subsidiary company, it is paid. If it is government grant, government provides loan at a concessional rate. Then the differential amount is treated as government grant. If 10% market rate loan is given at 6% rate, you compute the present value, uh, 100 rupees loan amount, present value becomes 96. The 4 rupees is called as government grant, and the grant treatment depends on the nature or the purpose for which the grant is given. That is, will treat under in day S20. Transaction cost. How do we treat the transaction cost? Uh, with respect to FETPL, we we'll transfer it to P and L. FETOCI, we will add it to cost. Amortized cost is interesting, important. It is added to the calculation of effective rate of interest. This is applicable for financial assets. Also for financial liabilities. For financial asset, the transaction cost is added. For financial liabilities, it is subtracted from the loan. Again, going back to my previous question.
YTM. <coughs> How does that YTM is calculated? That's what is here. It's called as the effective interest rate. Let's say you have a coupon of eight rupees in year one, year two eight rupees, year three you receive one zero eight, and if you discount it at eight percent, what is the present value should be? Try to calculate without that. I am getting 8 rupees, I am discounting 8 rupees. So, that present value will be equal to face value of 100. If I put it as 9%, if I expect more, the present value will be less. Now, suppose if I tell you the present value that is market price is, let us say, 104. Then the rate of interest is supposed to be something like, it should be definitely lesser than 8 percent let us say if it is like some 7.2 percent something like that. Now I paid 104 rupees to acquire this bond apart from 104 I also paid let us say 3 rupees as transaction cost. If it is classified as fair value through PNL, the 3 rupees taken to PNL. If it is FET OCI I will add to 104 plus 3 rupees but if it is amortized cost in those cases the price today value will be capitalized at 107 and this rate of interest I have to recalculate. The same logic will hold good for liabilities also. That means let us say you take a loan of 1 lakh at the rate of 8 percent for 3 years. So, year 1 you will pay 8000, year 2 you will pay 8000 year 3 you will pay 8000 and also you will repay loan of let us say 1 lakh and today you have taken a loan of 1 lakh. So, this is normal transaction today you recognize liability every year 8000 expense, 8000 expense, 8000 expense you recognize. But if there is loan processing charges of let us say 1000 rupees. So, what is the net loan received? 1 lakh you received, but 1000 you paid. So, net amount is now 99,000. So, you have to calculate what is the implicit interest rate. If 8000 is every year payment, 1 lakh is last year payment and present value is 99,000, what is supposed to be the rate of interest? And that is what in your AFM called as YTM and in uh, financial instruments it is called as effective interest rate, implicit interest rate. Keeping the present value, keeping the cash flows, what is supposed to be the interest rates. The answer when I calculate, effectively it will come around let us say 8.1 percent like that. That 0.1 percent representing the impact of loan processing charges. The loan processing charges is not taken to p immediately. It is amortized over the period of loan and amortization not divided by 3. Amortization by calculating the effective interest. And so, if it happens to be 8.1 8 percent, first year how much interest expense will you recognize? Not on 1 lakh. Because initial recognition what you have received is only 99,000. On 99,000 you recognize interest expense at 8.1 percent. But actually you would have paid only 8,000. The difference will get added to the closing liability. And on the closing liability next year you calculate again 8.1 percent. So you keep calculating like this. Ultimately on last year the amount will come to 1 lakh. Effectively, if you add up the interest amounts, uh, 888 versus what we calculated, the differential amount would have been exactly the loan processing charges amount. So, that would be the treatment of amortized cost effective interest. And subsequent measurement, this is initial measurement what we discussed. Subsequent measure means at the end of 
every year. How do we calculate? Any interest received, dividend received is straight away taken to P&L account. Gain or loss on account of fair value change for amortized cost, we are not going to worry about any market changes. We are only worried about the fair value changes in fair value through P&L and fair value through OCI. And in case of fair value through P&L, the fair value difference is recognized in P&L. In case of fair value through OCI, the difference is recognized in uh, OCI. But what is important is, when you sell those assets, means I am calling it as realized gains or losses. When you sell those assets, when it is in case of FEOCI in case of debt instruments, it is with recycling. So when you sell, it will be recognized in PNL. Whereas in case of FEOCI equity instruments, when you sell and it becomes realized in uh, instruments, it will be classified from, I mean, it will be taken from OCI and it will be transferred to retained earnings. It will be transferred to general reserve. It will not be reclassified through PNL account. We have seen this a lot in the past. I hope you are able to connect it. Financial liabilities, you don't worry too much about this credit risk change and all. Uh, you can just say that amortized cost means we have calculated effective interest method. Fair value changes, it is recognized in p and account. Keep only that much. Reclassification of liabilities, not permitted. Reclassification of assets, uh, only business model change. And only provide prospective accounting. You are not going to change anything from the past. I have given this list, uh, summary of what are we discussed on financial assets. You can go through this, like uh, amortized cost, initially fair value, what we do transaction cost, subsequent recognition. So all those things I have uh, given. What will be discussed in the chart format, I have given this in a tabular format in one place. So this you can go through it. And de-recognition, what do you do? If it is with recycling, without recycling, how the treatment will be. Reclassification scenarios, I will not focus on much. Uh, that is not so relevant from exam point of view. Impairment, I will quickly go through that. Now, impairment is not relevant for FETPL. The reason being, it is anyway valued on fair value basis. If the value has gone down, it would have been taken care already. So, impairment is relevant mainly for amortized cost or if something specific called as lease receivables. Or a loan commitment. Okay. So, how do we uh, account for this? This actually is going to be a game changer in banking companies for which index is not applicable for this reason. This particular portion of the standard is the reason why INDIAS is not yet applicable to banking companies. So, you have to provide for, if it is trade receivable, lease receivable, lifetime credit losses. So, if you are expecting some loss to happen, how much amount for the lifetime you are expect to incur loss from this asset. So, if you have receivable of 1 lakh, we can only recover, let's say, 20,000, balance 80,000. We have to make a provision for receivables, trade receivable and lease receivable. For others, uh, you provide only 12 months credit loss. So, what is the loss that is likely to happen only in the next 12 months? Beyond that, we don't have to provide the loss. The why this is having a greater impact on banking company? Because at present, bank follow the income prudence principle given by RBI, again, I don't know if you remember your past life, where they had something like standard assets 0.4%, substandard assets, then uh, that is for secured, then unsecured. Doubtful assets, less than one year, one, two, three year, more than three years, so different percentage. Here, straight away they say lifetime credit loss, don't worry about those percentages. So, banks are going to have a very tough time 
if this portion becomes applicable that is the reason why they are keep pushing application of indias so what they did is from your syllabus only they have taken out for banking companies your juniors in ipcc will not be reading uh, banking companies but they have to do bank audits and all and the expectation is that okay financial liabilities okay the financial liabilities uh, equity is not remeasured that's the most simplest one only financial assets are subsequently measured financial liabilities are subsequently measured equity are no remeasurement so if you go back to what we discussed in things like indes 103 on business combination of contingent consideration initially contingent considerations are recognized it on fair value basis if it is in the nature of debt meaning there is variable number of shares or entity has obligation to pay cash i think in one of the questions we are seeing entity has obligation to pay cash if some conditions are fulfilled that means it is in nature of debt and if it is in nature of debt it will be reassessed recalculated and the difference will be recognized in pnl account fair value changes will be taken to pnl account but if it was obligation to give shares fixed number of shares then you are not going to remeasure because equity element as you can see here there is no remeasurement from the issuer perspective okay when will you de recognize the asset very simple what is the definition of financial asset long time back we discussed meaning couple of minutes back at still long time back financial asset is when there is right to receive cash or any other financial asset which is potentially favorable so if that right expires then you have to de recognize when will the right expires so if you are talking about loan receivable and you have received the loan in those cases there is no longer right to receive but one more case also can happen that means you transfer the rights for example in case of uh, debtors it's called as factoring the right to receive money from customer is transferred to somebody else you have outsourced it factoring arrangement or in case of uh, loan it is called as securitization which you have as a chapter in Uh, AFM securitization, which basically means you you start a separate company, separate vehicle, sub, uh, separate legal entity, and that will take over all your recoverables. So you will transfer your rights to them. And one more example I can take is uh, bills discounting. You are having bill receivable, and you give it to the bank, and you encash the money. That means the right is with the So in those cases, will you de-recognize? So important point is this: the moment you transfer, you don't de-recognize. Does it qualify? Substantial risk and rewards are to be transferred. So in case of bill discounting, you have transferred the right to other person to the bank. In case the payer does not make the payment. you still have the obligation to make the payment to the bank in case of default dishonor by the drawee payer so you cannot de recognize the asset so on the asset side you continue to show bill receivable money received from the bank you show it as advance received from bank later if all the settlement takes place then you can set it off with respect to uh, factoring also two types of factoring are there one is called as with recourse other is called as without recourse with recourse means the factor will take the responsibility of collecting the money but if he is not able to collect the money from the customer then you have to make the compensation so with recourse means you still have the obligation the money received will not be adjusted against the assets you recognize the asset money received will be shown as advance if all customer makes payment on time 
after six months or 12 months, whatever the time may be, you will set off the assets and liabilities. Until then, you recognize both asset and liabilities. If it is with recourse. If it is without recourse, your liability is uh, closed completely. In that case, you don't have to uh, recognize both of them. The asset and liability can be set off. Money received against the asset, you can uh, adjust the difference amounts to the p and account. Okay, this area examination not focused much. What is asked in exam is this. That is modification or called as extinguishment accounting. That area, I don't know why institute liked it. They keep asking this area. So extinguishment accounting means the terms of the loan borrowings changes. So you have taken a loan for 10 years at the rate of 8% and after 3 years you renegotiated and said I will pay over 15 years and rate of interest may be 7%. Changes, modification, a similar logic concept calculation will come in lease. So they say you account for this only if there is material change. Material means more than 10%. 10% of what? 10% of your existing loan with the new loan. And how do you calculate the new loan? This is interesting. Listen to this carefully. Existing loan as per book value, whatever the amortized cost. The new loan will be, we will take the revised cash flow, but we will take original effective interest rate. The revised cash flow will take it and original interest rate will take it and see whether it is more than 10% or not. If yes, in that case, we will go for extinguishment accounting. Extinguishment accounting means we deem as if the loan is repaid and new loan is to be recognized. And the best part is new loan is not the amount what we just calculated. Because the amount we calculated is new cash flow but using old rates. That is only for assessing the 10% materiality. For accounting purpose, we will have to calculate the new cash flow using the new interest rates. And you know what happens? That will come to the amount of loan taken. When we go to the new numbers, you'll be able to apply it better maybe, but I'm just telling you now itself, when you take the new loan and you're taking the new interest rate, which means the interest is calculated at same rate, discounting rate is also same. Obviously, the present value should be equal to the loan. One example I've seen like 8,000, 8,000, 8,000, discounting rate 8%, obviously the present value should be equal to the face value. So that what would happen? Uh, and that new loan amount, existing loan amount, difference will take it to PNL as impact of extinguishment accounting. If extinguishment accounting don't apply, then we will have to recalculate the rate of interest. That effective rate of interest will be recalculated. Okay. Uh, hedging. This is one area where I am slightly confused, not about the concept, but whether to cover or not, but I'll cover it briefly. I'll not include any numericals. Uh, briefly, I will cover it. So, hedging, there are three types of hedges possible. For, first of all, what is the meaning of hedging? It is a risk mitigation technique. Or in my classes, I say it is like have a backup before breakup. That is called as hedging. You have some sort of safety. Anyway, don't write those terms in examination and all. Hedging is still a risk mitigation technique. So, if you want to cover risk, there has to be something which is creating risk. So, there has to be two elements. One element is called as hedging item. Other element is called as hedging instrument. Hedging item is the one we are protecting. Hedging instrument is the instrument we are using like the options and futures. Instrument used for protection. Three types are there, fair value hedge, cash flow hedge, hedges soft net investment. As the name suggests, fair value hedge is like you are hedging a value of an asset or liability. A typical example I can borrow from AFM concept is 
portfolio hedging using index futures where we calculate like portfolio amount multiplied by something absolute silence here okay portfolio amount multiplied by the portfolio beta divided by the value of one index future contract will give you the value of one contract then okay lot of calculations are there so you, what you are trying to do there is protecting the portfolio value you are not trying to protect the cash flow the overall portfolio asset you are trying to protect so that is the case of fair value hedge in in case of fair value hedge is very simple hedging item as well as hedging instrument both of them is taken to pnl account both of them are reflected in same place basically a matching concept cash flow hedge i can take a example of the exporter so when you are exporter transaction let's say you enter into a forward contract because what money you receive from that export you are trying to protect that cash flow so that is type by type of cash flow hedge uh, in case of cash flow hedge the hedging item hedging item is the for example exporter means hedging item is debtors so if you can remember as11 or nds21 the exchange rate differential on your debtors exporter will be transferred to pnl account but here we will transfer it to cash flow hedge reserve hedging instrument meaning you have entered into a forward contract normally forward contract is a derivative so fair value changes is taken to pnl account but here that fair value change is also taken to cash flow hedge reserve meaning to oci ineffective portion means to what extent you have not done the hedging that portion goes to pnl uh, hedges of net investment is same approach net investment means you are trying to protect one particular scenario like investment in branches foreign subsidiary associate you are trying to protect the value of those investments uh, an entity hedging of a net investment and those cases you apply this point which is similar to the cash flow hedge reserve uh, typically what if at all if they ask an exam which i doubt they could ask is on cash flow hedge reserve uh, okay disclosure i'm not covering so let me do one thing quickly i will cover that aspect of cash flow hedge reserve alone or that is cash flow hedge uh, element with small numerical let's say on 1124 you have sold goods thousand dollars at the rate of uh, I think 80 rupees and the receivable after let's say four months because it is uncertain you enter into a forward sale contract entered into four months forward sale contract at let's say 80 3 rupees and at year end let's say spot rate is et.5 and forward rate et1.5 on 30th of april spot rate happen to be let's say 82.5 so if I just summarize the two things you are having uh, debtors and you are having forward sale contract one one twenty four 
then 31st of March 24, then 30th of April 24. These debtors or trade receivables, we can call it as a hedging item and forward sale is called as the hedging instrument. Forward contract is the one we are using for protecting our cash flow. So initially debtors will be recorded at uh, 80 rupees. So one dollar is rupees 80. That is initial. And on that date you have entered into forward contract. One dollar. Okay, everything is one dollar only. Let me not write. This rupees uh, 83. And 80 rupees became. 80.5 and 83 rupees became 81.5 and on 30th of April it became 82.5 what about forward rate it will be 82.5 because on expiry the forward and spot will converge So, if you apply 80 to 80.5, you recognize a gain of 0.5. That's what even foreign exchange gain. Receivable 80, now receivable 80.5, there is a gain. Now, 80.5 to 82.5, again there is a gain of 2 rupees. Now this 83 became 81.5. Tell me it is profit or loss. You have entered into a forward sale contract. Forward sale contract is nothing but taking short position. You make profit when things goes down. So 83 became 81.5. You get a gain of 1.5. Other way of understanding, you have entered into a contract to sell at 83. So 83 is fixed. If the market is trading at 81.5, you can buy at 81.5, sell at 83, you make a profit of 1.5. Anyway, that is the interpretation. But to remember quickly, in short position, when things goes down, you make profit. That's why I told you in put option also. If you're expecting the market to come down, you take put option, you make more profit. So when the market price is going down, you make profit. But 81.5 became 82.5 increased. So that is going to be a loss of 1 rupee. Now this is how you account normally. Debtors account separately, forward sale account separately. So can you tell me what is the overall profit or loss? You add all. 0.5 plus 2 plus 1.5 minus 1 2.5 minus 1 3 rupees and that is nothing but this difference between spot price and future forward rate no you did all these circles 80 rupees then 80 rupees initial spot rate you have entered into a contract 83 that means 3 rupee is known that is the amount of profit you are going to get then why is this circus? Because we treated data separately, forward sales separately. If you mix both, ultimately we will get only 3 rupees. So what is AS11 says? Forget about all these things. 3 rupee profit, a portion over period of 4 months. Simple. That's what AS11 says. 8 rupees spot rate, you receive 83. After 4 months, you know your gain is 3 rupees. So 3 rupees spread across 4 months. But what India says is, yeah, you do like that, my p and account will show me correct number, but my balance sheet data will not show me correct number, it will not reflect the fair value. And uh, derivative will not reflect the fair value. Derivative, fair value should be accounted. So what they say is, cash flow hedge reserve, this 0.5, you don't take it to p and this 0.5, you take it to cash flow hedge reserve. This 1.5 don't take it to P&L, this 1.5 you transfer it to cash flow hedge reserve. 
this 2 rupees also you take it to cash flow hedge reserve this 1 rupee also you take it to cash flow hedge reserve ultimately cash flow hedge reserve will have how much 3 rupees profit now what they do that 3 rupee profit recognize in P&L account both the years over a period of that 4 months 3 rupees you recognize uh, that uh, 4 months is the contract period so 3 rupees multiplied by first the 3 months you get and next year 3 rupees multiplied by 1 month I think how much you get uh, 2.25 and this is 0.75 so what will happen all amount you transfer it to cash flow hedge reserve and from cash flow hedge reserve you transfer it to p and l account and ultimately the cash flow hedge reserve will get closed so i have explained both the logical aspects as well as account treatment i don't think this could come because i think even your study material also they have, don't have this uh, hedging problems somewhere i have read that they have taken out the hedging problems from the study material but in the practice problems they have included in some rtps they have included so i really don't know what are they going to do in exams so it's okay to at least understand the cash flow hedge reserve because fair value hedge is very simple a hedging item difference take it to pnl hedging instrument difference take it to pnl fair value changes only here the question of cash flow hedge and all would come anyway i hope i have covered the maximum extent possible with respect to financial instruments okay next is uh, india's 115 revenue recognition this is the most important standard in my opinion, not only from exam point of view, but also from practical aspect from point of view, but also more so from a business point of view. A business exists only because of its customers, any business for that matter. So revenue is that heavy standard for that reason. So it is important. As far as India's 115 is concerned, it follows, again we will focus on the main points, let us not go through each and every small points there, the standard is a monster, so much is there, it is a 5 step process. Only one point I will focus here, it excludes non-monetary exchanges between the entities in the same line basically it talked about barter transactions same line one textile company selling goods to another textile company and buying from them why is this excluded specifically because you know every business is under pressure to show more sales so what will the salesman do you will not know those things you are only part of article chip audit. If you are part of business intelligence, you would have thought all these things. So especially on 31st of every month, if I am the auditor, I would have checked 31st I mean month end of every month, what transaction took place. So what they do is, on last day of the month, because monthly MIS goes on next day, on last day of they say, I will sell it to you, you sell it to me. So I can more show, show more sales, you can also show more sales. On 1st of every month, we will reverse it. So, cash flow is not taking place, we are able to show more sales, the tax impact is not there because anyway we are reversing it, so nobody is worried about this. But they are able to show the sales target, they will have sales target monthly and all, they can show it. So, that is why if it is in the same line of business, then it is not considered. So, audit points, if you want to write in auditing, you can mention these things as well. Anyway, so 5 step process, let us focus on these 5 steps. Anything you told? No, sorry. Five step process is what uh, this standard focuses on. Step one identifying contract with customers. So there has to be a contract. Contract may be explicit, implicit. More importantly, contract must be approved. And there are few more points. Contract must be approved. The rights should be specified. Payment terms must be there. 
there has to be commercial substance commercial substance means which has just told you now it should not be between the similar entities of uh, non monetary transactions basically cash flow impact should be there commercial substance and the receipt is probable uh, this is uh, with respect to prudence principle if the receipt is not probable then revenue is not recognized we can also combine many contracts into one contracts there are conditions uh, if it is negotiated as a single package if the prices are linked or if it is part of single performance obligation then even multiple contracts can be combined just to give an example uh, if you are constructing an apartment and you are not only constructing an apartment you are also constructing some playground swimming pool and uh, tennis court and and all so each of them may be a separate contract but when you negotiate you would have told put together amount is so much but for legal purposes you would have told by this 12 months i complete this portion 18 months i complete this portion so for legal purposes you are made a separate contract but your overall obligation is to deliver one thing as a package so in those cases we will combine all of them substance or form legally there might be separate contracts but in substance we'll combine all of them and we'll account it as single contract contract modification actually three types are there one is uh, whether it is distinct or not when there is a modification of a contract uh, okay contract modification i have it here so just for discussion purpose is it okay if we extend our session by one more day i get different kinds of reactions like it's okay you take some will like uh, uh, no you cannot take somebody like it's okay but you cannot take i don't know whether it is yes or no but does not matter my point was that is an example for contract modification huh? where it is originally for certain number of days where i have to extend either in terms of the delivery or in terms of the price that is an example for contract modification so change in price change in scope or both of them it has to be approved it has to be enforceable uh three types of modification accounting can come in this first step if at all if a question comes it will be out of uh, this area on contract modification <clears throat> so when we uh, charge a distinct product and it has got a separate price like for example again just for example purpose now we are taking uh, fr classes you told okay we'll also have afm classes for next let's say 3 4 days so it's a distinct product of course i'll have to charge separately for that so in those cases if the price charged or uh, commensurate with the standalone contract which which means the amount which is charged for the separate product would be different if i charge it separately just because you are part of the existing product i'm not giving any discount over there meaning that transaction is independent the price charged is also separate if that is the case you account it as separately you are not mixing with anything with the existing contract your original target was to build apartment and then they said why don't you build along with tennis court one basketball court also anyway people don't play let's do one thing this only will divide this into half half some some modification take, can take place but for you to supply you need additional material so that's a separate contract and how much you charge for that if you have to build a basketball court for anybody else let's say you charge 50000 and for this people also you charge 50000 if that was the case it is treated accounted separately that's what i mean by accounting separate contract the stand alone selling price is commensurate uh, separately on the other hand if it is say anyway i'm doing is part of this normally i will charge 50000 but for you because i'm doing this apartment i'll charge you only let's say 30000 then this 30000 is not a commensurate stand alone selling price 
so that will not be classified under first category maybe it will come in last and you may have to do a retrospective calculations we will come to that second distinct remaining products and change in price and we treat as termination of old and creation of new typical example you are paying monthly security charges various security agencies are there g4s sis many security agencies are there you are paying every month 25000 per month and your contract is valid for 5 years 25000 per month now one year over let's say corona hit now you are going to renegotiate telling them i know the contract is pending but i cannot pay 25000 let's make it as 20000 per month so in those cases the distinct remaining products the services of every month is distinct so whatever one year happened we close it one year contract is over and we treat the remaining five years contract as a fresh contract so termination of old contract and creation of new again going forward we treat like a new contract and account it prospectively no adjustment with respect to what is already have taken place the last one is where calculations will usually apply no distinct product or a part of single performance obligation like apartment example i gave you during the discussion they thought that it was supposed to be complete by three months now it will take uh, maybe three months uh, three months and 10 days more and originally the contract revenue was supposed to be 10 crore now because of the cost increase you negotiated and told that now it will take 10 crore 50 lakhs the price has changed but your obligation did not change or even in the first case i told you where uh, there is a new product but the price charged is not commensurate with standalone selling price in those cases we account as if the existing contract is continued and we follow something called as retrospective accounting cumulative catch-up basis cumulative catch-up basis means we account how much percentage has been already completed or what was the revenue supposed to be recognized minus what is the revenue already recognized as a balancing figure we will calculate and this approach is used in so many places even in share based payments in days 102 where terms will change so what we calculate is we calculate what is supposed to be the closing balance of share based payments minus what is opening balance and as a balancing figure it is calculated anyway, that is just remember it, it will be used in many places uh, even in leases also this will be relevant okay so that is regarding step one on contract with customer step two identify performance obligations in the contract okay Performance obligation means it's a promise that the seller is making. And what do you mean by performance obligation or distinct performance obligation? How do you say whether it is distinct from another? So if I ask you one basic question, today you are getting newspaper and tomorrow you are getting one more newspaper. So it is a distinct performance obligation or same performance obligation? It is distinct. You are thinking about the type of obligation. Don't think about the type. Each obligation is distinct. Every day you have to eat. You can't say that it is the same I'm eating. No, even if it is same idli you are eating, every day you still have to eat. That is a distinct performance obligation. Please don't use the word. The reason why you are thinking means uh, distinct means something has to be unique. Now, that is not what we are thinking. Whether it is to be done today also, to be done tomorrow also. If yes, then they are two different obligations. For example, if it is a car company has told you, I will give you free service three times. Each of them is one performance obligation. Each of them they have to perform. So that is what is distinct performance obligation. Uh, two conditions are satisfied. Where it is a separate performance obligation is customer can benefit on its own or readily available resources. Sometimes what they do is uh, they make separate contracts like, like construction of apartments. We will give you first, first floor, then we will give you second floor, then we will give you third floor. 
So can we say each of them are separate contracts or separate performance obligations? Unless all of them are complete, the customer cannot enjoy the purpose for which he was supposed to consume. So therefore, all of them put together is called as one performance obligation. If you want to call them as separate, the customer should be able to consume it independently. If he can consume independently, then each of them is a separate performance obligation. And promise to transfer is separately identifiable. There should not be integration. There should not be modification. There should not be highly interdependent. Let me give an example. Again, let me take same example of construction. And the company provides two types of services. They also provide you the design, like how the construction should be there. It should be like you know, the blueprint. They will provide you considering your inputs. And they also provide the services of construction. They are bringing the materials, getting the labor, and then getting the product ready for you. So these two are separate performance obligations. One is on design, other is on construction services. At the same time, if both of them goes back and forth, in the sense, you are not just giving a design and say, okay, you construct yourself, or you give me the design, I will construct for you. You are telling, there is a design, I start constructing, let's review the design after some point in time. If you change a modification, Let's change the design accordingly. I will also change the construction services. If these two are interconnected, then we have to consider both of them as one performance obligation. That's what this point says. Basically, it says if the goods or services can be consumed by the customer independently, each one of them is distinct. If they have to be consumed together, then they are called as one performance obligation. If I take the class example, uh, I am teaching, so class providing uh, teaching service is one. Also, I have given you book. Now, can books be used separately and the classes also can be conducted separately? Depends on, again, the nature. Sometimes the books will be given like, we will give you paragraph, but there will be a lot of blanks. So, you cannot use the books on your own because you don't know what the blanks to be filled up. You need to come to the class. So, they are called as, they are, in, they are dependent, they are integrated service. So, they will be put together called as one performance obligation. So, see, then there is something called a series of distinct goods and services. It might be distinct, but it is having the same pattern of transfer. Like for example, every day the newspaper agency have to deliver the newspaper. Every day newspaper is distinct, but the mode of delivery is same. Uh, morning they have to get up, some boy has to go collect it and they have to distribute to the each and every house separately. The same thing is repeated. It's having same pattern of transfer. So that is called as theories of distinct goods and services. And what is the reason why we consider this series of distinct goods and services is we connect with step 5, which says performance obligation over time. Means we can recognize the things proportionately. If, uh, if it is a series of distinct goods and services, we can recognize the revenue proportionately. We don't have to wait for the completion of the contract. That is the reason why they use this series of distinct goods and services. That is regarding step two on performance obligations. So, first step is regarding identifying the contract. Important point from exam point of view is modification. Second point, identifying performance obligation. Performance obligation will help to identify us when the revenue to be recognized. Uh, the important point is whether the performance obligations are distinct or not. And accordingly, revenue will be recognized. An important point regarding distinct is if the customer can use it independently, then we can say that that obligation is different, distinct performance obligation. Third one, transaction price. The transaction price is the amount that customer has to pay. Sometimes it will be fixed, sometimes it will be variable. 
So transaction price is the amount of revenue. It is recognized when the PO performance obligation is satisfied. That will come in step five. Except constrained variable consideration. Constrained variable consideration means it is uncertain. And they also give the data. What is that constrained uh, uh, consideration? Conditions estimation of variable consideration. Constraining estimation of variable consideration. So basically what they tell is, Uh, if it is having the possibility of reversal, significant chance of reversal of revenue, then such revenue should not be recognized. And I also they use this word transaction price is uh, what entity is expected to entitle. Expected to entitle. This is a 2E you can remember. Uh, it may be question also we may see later. Now only I will give an example quickly. Suppose you give the table like this. If a customer buys between 1 to 100 units, I will give you the price at 80 rupees. If customer buys between 100 to 1000, I will give it at 70 rupees because if you purchase more, the rate will be less. If you buy more than 1000 units, I will give you only maybe at 60 rupees. Now, if customer purchases 89 units, how much will you charge him? You will definitely charge 89 rupees. 80 rupees. 89 units, 88 rupees. He purchases again, next time he comes and he purchases 20 units. How much you will charge? Okay. If you treat this as independent rate, you will still charge 80 rupees because it is still between 1 to 100. But sometimes when the transactions are with regular customers, you say, I will apply this rate not on independent transaction but on cumulative basis. So, if you consider this as a cumulative transaction, you have purchased 109 units and if you purchase 109 units, you have to charge him only 70 rupees. So, the, when he purchases this 20 units, you will not charge 80 rupees, you will charge 70 rupees and not only that, he has already paid 10 rupee extra for this 89 units that will be adjusted against, okay, that is what actual transaction takes place but accounting cannot happen that way. The accounting says, were you expecting this to happen? If the customer is very regular customer, and uh, based on your experience, he always purchases between 100 to 1000. If the answer is yes, so when you purchased initially, uh, when, you, when you sold the goods initially, 80 rupees you might have received, but you know out of 80 rupees, 10 rupees is actually going to be adjusted against the next purchase. So the 10 rupee will be accounted as advance. Because what entity is expected to entitle? on this transaction is only 70 rupees. Of course, that is based on expectation. If customer did not come, whatever the advance at the expiry of the period, you can recognize that as revenue. That is later point in time. But as of now, even though you receive 80 rupees, how much you are entitled to receive based on your expectation, it's only 70 rupees. That's what they talk about uh, recognition of the transaction price. And the variable consideration, variable consideration meaning there might be escalation clauses in contracts, uh, there might be bonus also that if you complete the project within so much you get uh, extra bonus. Maybe your parents also might tell you, no? if you complete the CE examination in this attempt, I will get you four wheeler or if you do it in the next attempt, I will get you two wheeler. 
or if you don't pass at all i'll get to three wheeler at least you can survive after exam so some sort of bonus some sort of incentives can be given on satisfying certain conditions so they are also coming under variable consideration okay it may be fixed it may be variable you have to consider these four elements i don't want to go in detail to this four elements but i will discuss the important points okay regarding variable consideration the three methods to be applied let me focus only on those two methods variable consideration is recognized provided the significant reversal don't occur if your uh, for example if your parents have told that if you complete the ca examination i'll give you something like let's say 1 lakh just for example purpose and you finished your intermediate so in your opinion you have finished 50% of the course so you have done the party 50% is anyway done 50% party i will do remaining 50% party i'll do later but now only you realize that remaining 50% is distant future or uh, we don't know when that is going to come so but you have already enjoyed now whatever amount received you have to give it back so when reversal is likely to take place do not recognize the variable consideration depends on expectations especially this is applicable in case of uh, wealth management firms where i have been part of where they tell you give me the money the clients give the money we will charge you the fees only if you make the profit so we will tell that one year or let's say uh, we, you give me the money for five years we will not charge any money fee at the end of five years how much our money you have done we will take a share or we'll compare how much with nifty has done market has done a proportionate share we can share to those kind of things so if those kind of things are there one day suddenly market goes up you go and don't go and spend entire money anyway fees will come because next day things can reverse the stock market is on those lines so if you are depending on uncertain events and things are beyond entity's control that's why they call it as constrained variable consideration significant reversal is likely to happen do not recognize in those cases in other cases where you you are uh, you are approximately aware of how much is going to come then you can follow two methods expected value method most likely method most likely method means when there are only two possible outcomes 60% probability 6 lakh will come 40% probability zero will come we simply take 6 lakh we don't worry about the probability when only two possible outcomes are there wherever probability is high corresponding amount we will take it into consideration and that is called as most likely amount if there are more than two possible outcomes there is 30% probability 5 lakh will come 60% probability 3 lakh will come 10% probability zero will come you follow your probability approach one column x another column probability the next into probability the product column the total that's called as expected value that is the variable consideration you need to keep it in mind uh, refund liabilities yes this also i should discuss this is applicable when the type of sale is called as uh, sale on approval basis where you make sales or even in case of this e-commerce companies and all they will sell you but there will be time for you to return and if you don't return then only it is considered as sales but that is what is legal but we go with substance in substance what do we do you go by historical experience if your experience says that out of 100 units i sell only 3 units come back in those cases what do we do is we recognize the 100 as sales and we make a provision for return on those the percentage of return likely to happen to the, to the extent things are likely to come back we make a provision that is uh, we don't wait for enter revenue to be recognized only at the end of the approval term based on expectation 
we recognize the sales and to the extent is likely to come back you make a provision and what would happen if things comes back you have to give the money back if you sell 100 units three units come back as per expectation for those three units for which you receive the money that money has to be given and that's what they call it as refund liability the better name for refund liability is you treat it as advance so on 100 units if three is likely to come back you recognize the revenue for 97 units for three units you treat it as advance if three did not come back at that point in time advance can be converted into revenue now if the units come back or likely to come back they are part of your inventory if things comes back so you should also recognize the element of inventory so if entity ex uh, entity expects to refund then you are going to measure it as the advance and when those units are not part of revenue if they are not part of revenue they are part of your inventory if it is not sold it has to be unsold you can't keep it outside both the places so then you have to recognize them as part of inventory measurement at okay so what are the factor constraining variable consideration i told you when it is beyond the entity's control or when it is for a longer period in those situations uh, the significant reversal can take place okay significant financing component very simple example that is if the sale price includes interest component then that have to be recognized separately especially in case of installment sales and how do we calculate like the way we have seen in financial instruments you calculate the present value and uh, from the contract price minus the present value the difference is what is financing component and not recognized immediately uh, financing component is over period of time financing component is connected with time value of money over a period of time you recognize there is one practical expedient also you should keep it in mind if the time period is less than one year entity need not separate it it's a choice it's not a compulsion if the time period between the date of providing service and date of collection is less than one year entity may choose to provide total amount without segregating into revenue and financing component non-cash consideration Again, I will not go in depth into it. I will give one typical example where this is applicable. Uh, okay, non cash concern. Non cash consideration is the is nothing but a barter transaction. You will record it on a fair value basis. I think this is not going to be much of importance. This I would like to focus consideration payable to customer. Interesting term consideration payable to customer why would company pay to customer customer should pay to company you can think of things like your cash back or some customer loyalty points on one side but there is one more typical situation this is applicable i'll give same example i used to give i still give same example in case of let's say a retail store or something like a supermarket store so in supermarket store if you buy let's say coca cola you are buying from whom customer is buying from the supermarket or customer is buying from the coca cola company itself you are buying from supermarket not buying from the coca cola company there because it's a redistributor uh, connected channel so if you think from coca cola company point of view for them to sell, it has to be positioned in a particular place. So people also call no, it is not supermarket, it is super marketing. Each and every element is there is not a coincidence. It is positioned strategically. Like when you stand in a queue, only you will find out chocolates, chewing gums next to that. It is not by coincidence, it is positioned there. So people standing in queue can use that. And if you can see, all the chocolates, biscuits are all only in the lower ones. It will not be in the top. Because when you get the children go, they can easily pick it up. 
it is meant for that so there is nothing is coincident over there so if you go and see that itself is a case study by itself any supermarket you observe more than shopping i observe these kind of things that has other consequence let us not discuss about those things so when you want to position your product in a particular place coca cola company will pay supermarkets they might say that during diwali season keep my products here there will be stand out inside i will uh, advertise my products for which supermarket will pay so the the coca cola company will pay the supermarket that is fine they are getting one kind of service that is a uh, uh, shelf rent may be they are paying different kinds of service if they get service they pick the they, they make the payment not an issue but what will happen is because they are both of customers of each other they tell you show higher sales i'll show higher sales and then we will set up no actual cash flow would take place so if those things are there that is not accounted if the payments are for distinct goods and services up to fair value it is fine you recognize as if purchase from anybody else but if it is above fair value any excess amount you show will be reduced from revenue that's what consideration payable to customer okay allocation of transaction price tp so step 2 we have discussed about performance obligation step 3 we talked about transaction price step 4 is connecting the both so what entity should do is performance obligation what customer should pay is transaction price but there may be one transaction price but many performance obligations so we have to allocate that is what is step 4 allocation of transaction price uh, it should be in a, in a way in which it depicts entity's entitlement it may be one performance obligation a series of performance obligation it can be anything you focus on this it has to be on sasp basis stand alone selling price basis if stand alone selling price is 1 lakh for one product and 20000 for another product so total has to be 1 lakh 20 but if you are giving them at 1 lakh 18000 in that case the discount should be allocated on both the products proportionately on what proportion basis on sasp basis that is on stand alone selling price basis if no stand alone selling price is available if the product is so unique that it is not available in the market for you to compare then you can go for things such as market assessment approach for example you are selling one furniture customized furniture the value you are not able to compare then what do you do you take the normal furniture available then whatever effort you have put labor effort you add it labor charges that becomes comparable price that is market assessment approach expected cost plus approach cost plus approach is uh, your costing methodology uh, how much money spent to develop that product then on that do you apply a reasonable profit that much will become your revenue residual approach is balancing figure approach there are five products being purchased four products i can compute the fifth one i don't know how much it is that will be the balancing figure residual approach allocation will be on proportionate basis allocation of variable consideration will be on proportionate basis a changes in transaction price we will account it as per modification what we discussed that is what is applicable here also so that is not required to be looked at separately step 5 performance obligations will be satisfied but ultimately this fifth step is important when the revenue is recognized in parlance with as9 we use two terms one is called as proportionate method or completed service method so do you wait for the contract to complete to recognize revenue or as and when the work is completed proportionately we can recognize that's what they use two terms performance obligations over time performance obligation at a point in time but before that this is the most important one what is the principle for recognizing revenue 
I don't know if you, this word we have been using it a lot. When there is a transfer taking place, and when the transfer takes place, when customer obtains the control. When does customer obtain the control? Should the legal title be transferred, physical possession be transferred, or the payment should be there? Therefore, customer get the right to get the goods. There is no one single answer. That's why they use the word. These are all indicators. Physical transfer, right to payment, legal title, risk and rewards, any of this. They are all indicators that the transfer has taken place. There is one single point we can say that at this point revenue is to be considered. Okay. As far as the two types of uh, recognition is concerned, performance obligation over time, meaning it is proportionate method of revenue recognition. One of the three conditions should be satisfied, simultaneously receive or consume the benefits. See for example, internet. As and when the service company is providing, I am also using it. It is not like at the end of every month, then I get the benefit. It is a continuous benefit received. So that is an example of simultaneously receiving the benefit. It creates an asset that the customer can control. For example, in case of construction company, the obligation is to deliver 10 lift in an apartment, 10 lift. Now the question is, uh, if they deliver one lift, can they start using it for that one particular block? If the answer is yes, that's what it means, create an asset that customer can control. It, it need not wait for remaining product to be delivered. In that case, this proportionate revenue can be recognized. Third point, it does not create the asset for entity's use, but it creates enforceable right to payment. Simultaneously, consumer is not getting the benefit. Consumer is not getting an asset which he can control. But what is happening is, for the work being done, customer is obliged to make a payment. So in those cases, you can recognize revenue. So for example, uh, a CA office is providing uh, Due diligence services. Now, due diligence services means only when you submit the report, ultimately they can make use of it. As and when you do the due diligence, they don't get the benefit of it. You have to prepare the report and submit it. So, first point not satisfied. The consumer is not receiving simultaneously the benefit. Customer is not getting an asset. Second point is not satisfied. But the terms of the contract says, to the extent work done, due diligence you have performed, you have the right to receive payment for it. Even though the two conditions satisfied, because of third condition, right to receive the payment, revenue can be recognized on proportionate basis. If all the three conditions, even, even if one of the conditions is not satisfied, you are not able to satisfy all the three, you are not in part of at least one of them also, it becomes performance obligation in time, meaning you have to wait for the completion of the service, only at the end, revenue can be recognized. Until then, it can only be like a closing stock or unbilled revenue kind of thing, but revenue cannot be recognized unless the service or the product is completed. So, some people also say this sentence, we only live once, we should enjoy. I differ with that opinion. We die only once. We live every day, every second, uh, every minute. We die only once. So, according to me, performance obligation over time is life, and performance obligation at a point in time is death. And for other purpose, it might be different. But what can be recognized proportionately is performance obligation over time. And how do you recognize that percentage? This, this applicable only for this first one measure of um, computing the measure of progress is only for the first one. For second one, anyway, you have to wait for the completion. Proportionate thing don't apply. So you can do by output method, you can do by input method, or you can do uh, recoverable cost method. Uh, it is like asking, in your syllabus, when will you say that you have completed the syllabus? 
I mean, of course, you can't say I've completed, but at least you will tell, right? I have completed 80% of syllabus. How will you say 80% of my syllabus is complete? Does it mean out of 10 chapters, if I read 8 chapters, 80% is complete? What if the two chapters only 30 marks comes? It's like telling in AFM, except forex and derivatives, portfolio management, I read everything. Those only are going to constitute about, I think, 40 50 marks. Like telling in FR, uh, I don't know consolidation, I don't know business combination, financial instruments. Apart from that, I know everything else. So you can't say that three chapters means 30 percent. So, similarly, in measuring the progress, how do you do it? Is it based on how many units being delivered or value of those units or the expenses? Right. As far as exam is concerned, mostly we will follow input method input method means expenses incurred divided by total estimated expense meaning expense incurred plus to be incurred so that is the major thing we apply in case of examination point of view expense incurred divided by total expenses estimated there's one small point to be kept in mind. Somehow in the examination, they keep asking this particular variety again and again. So I should have it. If any cost contributes significantly, but not having any performance obligation, but amount wise it's significant. In those cases, they are recognized revenue at cost basis. And remaining is considered for performance obligation basis. A typical example is again, let's say, installation of lift. And the cost of the, the co total cost of is uh, let's say 50 lakhs. And the lift cost is 40 lakhs. So when you purchase the lift, if I apply this formula, the cost incurred is 40 lakh. I purchase the lift. Divided by total cost of the project is 50 lakh. So, just by purchasing the lift, 80% of the project is over. That is not the case. So, in those cases, you take out that 40 lakhs out, remaining amount is 10 lakhs. Of the 10 lakh expense, how much you have spent? Like you have spent 4 lakhs. So, out of 10 lakh, 4 lakhs means percentage completion is 40%. And the lift will be recognized that cost equal to revenue basis. So, if the project is 75 lakhs, then seven, out of 75 lakh, the lift is 40 lakhs. So 40 lakhs will be at cost. Remaining 35 is applied on the percentage. In my example, it is that 40% revenue is applicable. Anyway, we might see a numerical later. So that's one question which is being repeatedly asked in exam. So I wanted to cover that. Okay, regarding discount, or it can also be for uh, this uh, customer loyalty points. One. Point, I have to discuss that. It they will give you like this. For every 100 rupee you purchase, you get like one point, which you can use it in next purchase. So, you have purchased goods worth 25,000 rupees. So, how many points you will get? Uh, to 25,000 into 1 by 100. That is 250 rupees, 250 points you get. And 250 points, let's say that you can use it for purchasing goods later. You will get discount of 250 rupees. So, and later another person purchases goods of, and they get a 250 rupees discount in the second transaction. So, what they say is, this discount of 250 rupees, even though you have given only during the second transaction, it is there because of the first transaction. So, this 250 rupees should not be recognized only in the first transaction, it should be recognized in both the places. So, like 25,000 and 250 rupees, this is called as Standalone selling price, the so total becomes 25,250. Uh, this you allocate between actual transaction is because you have given 
50 rupees off, how much you collected from them is only 25,000, what you collected at the beginning. So, this number should be allocated between 25,000 and 250 and whatever amount you get, that is the amount of revenue to be recognized. So, that is one customer loyalty point, the discount, you have to keep it in mind. Just because you get a discount in second time does not mean that you should recognize only that. It is like telling, they will tell you in advertisement, toothpaste, buy one, get one free. So, what do you do? You go and tell, give me that get one only, that buy one I do not want, that free one only you give it to me. It will not work that way. Only if you buy one, the second one discount is applicable and so discount is actually to be apportioned on both the, so that is what this one point. One more small special point I would like to focus on consignment arrangement, okay, that is ultimately sold to consign customers. Principal versus the agent, you understand, principal means you take the responsibility, agent means it is intermediary, anyway, that I am not going to focus much. Sale with right to return, I told you, refund liability will come, warranty is fine, okay, ah, this one portion I would like to discuss, in not detail, but at least overall. Repurchase agreement. It was there in your AS9 also, if you remember your past life. Repurchase agreement means, as the name suggests, you sell the goods today because you need money or whatever reason. Goods are sold today with an agreement to purchase it back later at a fixed price. For example, you are selling goods at 1 lakh and agreement to repurchase after let us say 2 years at 1 lakh 21,000. So, now you are selling, 2 years later you will buy it and therefore it is not accounted as sale, it is not accounted as purchase, it is accounted as financial arrangement. So, this 1 lakh is treated as loan taken and 1 lakh 21,000 is treated as loan repaid and differential amount is treated as the finance cost recognized as expense over the term of contract. Some more varieties under that, if you have an obligation to purchase or right to purchase or you have uh, obligation to sell, so those kind of things are there, uh, do not have to go too much into that. But in general, it is the financial arrangement, the difference between those two is termed as finance cost to be recognized over the terms of loan. So, that is what is the major points of India's 115. There is different varieties uh, under that. Okay, so these are the major elements in India's. 115. Again, I have not covered 100%. Whatever I thought most frequently asked areas in exam, I have covered those areas. Do you have any other question on this? Okay, great. Okay, now that we have done with to an extent the big fish that is on things like as consolidation, fund instruments like that. Let us move into various other standards uh, in this 8. Accounting uh, policy standard, again will not spend too much of time, let me just focus on the important points. Basically, this standard is applicable when there is no specific NDAS covering such aspect. So, we have certain specific standards such as like only for share based payments, we have a standard. Only for let us say research and development expense, we have a standard of intangible asset. Uh, we have government grants, where if you receive grant from government, how to account for it. 
But what if if you receive grant from, let's say, your holding company, or you receive grant from somebody who is not a government, so you can't apply in base twenty. Then what do we do? So, in the areas where the index is not there specifically, we apply this principle: selection and applying accounting principles. This is much larger than just talking about uh, what accounting stand used to do. We talk about uh, all the principles, conventions, practices, what entity used to follow, what industry follows. All those comes into picture. What should be considered? We call it as primary considerations, secondary considerations while selecting accounting policies. Uh, for example, how do we decide whether we go with P4 method of inventory valuation or average cost, weighted average cost of inventory method valuation, whichever reflect the closest to the entity's operations. So it should be reliable, economic substance, neutral, prudent. It should not be biased. Uh, it should re reflect what is the in, uh, transactions of the company and so on. Changes in accounting policies uh, required by an index, or if it results in better and relevant information. For example, you are having a building. You are following cost model. Now you are. believing that the buildings value is changing fast maybe because now the airport is coming uh, near by the area and the market value is changing continuously so now you feel that it is not sufficient to just report on cost basis now what you want to report the building on a revaluation basis so circumstances change so that's where when you change your accounting policies or when new accounting standard comes then also you have to change accounting policies okay what are not changes in accounting policies the transactions that did not occur previously so for example you are giving employment benefits to the employees or um, uh, you are giving some super annuation benefits which was not given earlier and now you have started giving it that is not called as change in accounting policy because that is introduction of a policy and not a change in accounting policies an early adoption of any index is also not a change in accounting policy uh, if whenever you do a voluntary change there is for example cost model to revaluation model like that you have to go for retrospective accounting and retrospective reporting retrospective means that even though the changes might have taken place in the current year you have to go back to the earlier years and change it of course you can't change the books of accounts but your financial statement should be reported as if the changes have done in the past which means you have to give the cumulative effect in the reserves and surplus opening balance so had you changed from uh, let's say revaluation model to cost model for a particular asset so when the asset was purchased let's say 5 years back and you go back and calculate instead of following revaluation model had i followed cost model what would have been the changes in pnl changes in balance sheet and had you followed that as on latest opening balance of reserves what would be the cumulative amount outstanding and what would be the balance of assets account so things like that you have to do retrospective accounting and retrospective reporting if it is change in accounting estimates for example if the changes in useful life happens or residual value changes or even depreciation method changes we only go with prospective accounting that is we provide depreciation for remaining life we don't change what is already happened in the past prior period errors again they are not prior period items they are prior period errors errors meaning you had the information at the time of preparation of financial statements and you decided to omit or you decided that it was not considered a misstatement happened so a provision is not an error like you make a provision for tax and actual amount happens to be different that is not an error error means you had information but you did the amount differently so there has to be a mistake element it is called as prior period error again material errors should be reported retrospectively otherwise you can just uh, you need not specifically account for it uh, and again they are also to be reported retrospectively a selection of accounting policy you expect sir 
uh, hierarchy in selection. Again, I'll not be going too in depth. Clean is accounting policies. Overall, I told you there has to be a retrospective accounting, uh, retrospective calculation, and retrospective. I give some application like this, except when it is impracticable. So, if you are changing from cost model to revaluation model, you have purchased the asset, this building, 25 years back. And going back to 25 years, you can't calculate revaluation at the end of every year. You really don't have the data. So, when it is not practicable, then you can state this and go with whatever the data available. Okay, and whenever there is a change in accounting policies, if you remember, we have discussed in India's one also, in case of change in accounting policies, three year financial statements should be reported. So, those two points to keep in mind. So, this is a summary of uh, accounting policies in day is eight estimates and prior period error. Okay, in day is 10, event occurring after balance sheet day, typically you also would have had accounting standard four. Event occurring after balance sheet day, it means it should be occurring after balance sheet day before the approval of accounts and before the approval of accounts normally we take it as the date on which accounts are finalized by the board of directors that is the date on which we say that accounts are finalized the after balance sheet day before the accounts are finalized in that period if any transaction occurs they can be of two events adjusting events or non adjusting events Adjusting events are events where those transaction in that period when it occurs, it should be relating to a condition existing on the reporting period. So, the key word to be remembered is this. Condition existed on at the end of reporting period. So, as on 31st of March, there has to be some uncertainty and subsequently those uncertainties are resolved. A typical example, you should always ask, uh, there is a situation of insolvency or there is a situation of some issues with the customer where 31st March you knew that some problem is with the customer to make the payment and post balance sheet date, the insolvency is declared, then you are going to make a provision for total debts even considering that insolvency into consideration because at the end of the financial year you had that expectation that the customer is facing problem. So, condition existing and then subsequently resolved. But if the information you came to know about the customer only is after the 31st of March, then it is called as non-adjusting events. Uh, non-adjusting events are not adjusted. If they are material, they are reported. And proposed dividend to be specifically given, it is non-adjusting event unless it is approved in the board of their, uh, approved in AGM, it is not a liability for the company and therefore proposed dividend as per NDS 10 is non-adjusting event. Proposed dividend declared by the board of directors in their finalization of accounts meeting, it is not considered as adjusting event. Uh, only exception being going concern. Going concern means that even though it is non-adjusting event, but the impact is so severe that it is having issue with the fundamental continuation of the company, then even though it is non-adjusting, it is considered as adjusting event. For example, on 15th of April, there was a fire and companies, 90% of the books, stock, furniture, building, everything got destroyed. So, in those cases, you can't say that on 31st of March, I was expecting the fire to happen. Unless you are the one who put that fire, you can't expect that fire to happen. It is a non adjusting event. But 90% of the asset is destroyed and therefore, the company will be closed down in the near future. So, going concern assumption is not valid. So that will be treated as an exception. And in those cases, I mean, if going concern assumption is not valid, in them, all the balance sheet values are reported on realizable value basis for assets and liabilities are on settlement value basis. No longer present value of future cash flows, cost or in whichever is less, nothing of those sort applies for if the 
going concern assumption is not valid, assets are valued on realizable value and liabilities on settlement basis. And one carve out is there that is long term loan under INDIAS, this is there only in uh, INDIAS, not there in IFRS. Long term loan under INDIAS, uh, you have taken a long term loan which had certain conditions, covenants, and there is a breach of such conditions and when there is a breach obviously it will be classified from long term loan to short term loan and if you remember under INDAS 1 we also had things such as you can go to uh, them and take a grace period and if it is grace period is up to uh, beyond 12 months then you can continue to show it as non current but if this is one more small point before the approval of payments you go to the lender and take an agreement not to demand immediate payment. If this is not talking about grace period, nothing of that sort. You just go and tell that, you request that person, please sign that, I will not ask immediate payment. When will you ask? That will decide later. But we are preparing the books of accounts now, give your immediate signature on this paper that I will not be asking this immediate payment. If that is the case, then you can treat it as adjusting event. Okay, so that's the main point regarding in the S10. Okay, next standard in days 113. Again, that's focus only on the main points. Even though this is a very small standard, in my opinion, this one standard is equal to one subject. That is your AFM paper is entire thing is mixed in one standard called as in days 113. How to calculate the fair value? <coughs> okay. So, first of all, in days 113 does not tell when to calculate fair value, but whenever you have to calculate fair value under various standards, these guidelines are considered. So, what is the fair value? The most important point is it is an exit price means it is a sale price, it is not a purchase price. It is always going to be different. If you want to purchase a mobile, newly purchased mobile, let us say 10,000 and if you sell it after two days, it will not be 10,000, you have to sell it at a different price. So the price at which you buy versus the price at which you sell is always different and here we always talk about an exit price, the price at which you are expected to sell. In an orderly transaction, between market participants, market participant means not between related parties like holding subsidiary, they might be influenced, so we don't want to take it. In an orderly transaction means in a normal situation, not in an uh, extreme circumstances where you might pay a different price. And restriction, we should consider instrument specific and not an entity specific. So, for example, if it is a software company, in the articles they say, or in memorandum, I don't know whichever it is, where they can only do the business of software services or software products. They can't do real estate. If they own a land, you should, while valuing the land, you should not consider, oh, this is a software company. Land should be considered only for the purpose of usage of software. Because article said you can only do for software service. Skills. You can't think on those lines. The entity specific restrictions is not considered. If the land is sold to somebody else, they may construct, they may do real estate, they may make it into apartments and sell it, or they may make it into a CZ and make a different value. So the land value should not be influenced by the restriction placed on its owner. It is to be valued independently. So entity specific restrictions are not considered. Whereas instrument specific restrictions, for example, if you have vehicle valuation, vehicle, if it is yellow board versus white board, if it is yellow board means whoever purchases, it should be for commercial purposes and it has a restricted use. So, the owner does not matter. So, you have to value from the instrument point of view. Okay. Sometimes, the assets or the units may be sold in different market. 
in those cases which one should be considered so if you talk about investment in shares it might be but uh, you know the stocks might be sold in nse stocks might be in bsc stocks might also be sold in foreign exchanges so you are selling assets in stocks in different markets first preference is wherever the principal market means the volume where you are selling is highest that is the first preference if that is not there the second preference you should go for most advantageous market and most advantageous means where the receipt is maximum net realizable value is maximum net realizable value means selling price minus the all cost that is transportation cost as well as transaction cost so you consider the transportation cost consider the transaction cost then you see what is the net proceeds from the sales which are market is highest that is considered as the preference to not i think it's printed as presence to in the chart it should be preference to first preference is highest volume second preference is the net receipt is maximum as far as valuation of fair value is considered transport cost is subtracted transaction cost is not subtracted so for you to determine which is the most advantageous market i'll be doing selling price minus transportation cost minus transaction cost transaction cost is like brokerage expenses net amount i will consider to determine which is most advantageous as far as fair value is concerned this amount what i calculated is not fair value selling price minus transportation cost only this will be reported as fair value transaction cost is accounted separately transaction cost is not included in the fair value okay what are the other important points to be discussed there are three approaches market approach market price approach cost approach that is the uh, replacement cost or the buying price approach or income approach like in your uh, afm you would have done valuation of shares based on market price or valuation based on like p ratio method earnings multiple method those kind of things income approach okay what to be kept in mind i would say is this level 1 inputs level 2 inputs level 3 inputs these are the hierarchy meaning these are the preferences you should consider while calculating fair value first preference is always quoted price means market the first preference given to market because market is a collective opinion of many people it's not one person's opinion and it's very difficult to uh, change those prices of course they are also experts are there but as compared to individual price determination versus market determine market is always more superior we also say in stock market as uh, price is the ultimate thing market price is ultimate thing and you have technical analysis which says that market is perfect uh, all the theories also are based on that uh, there is also a sentence we use like in gujarati bhav bhagwan che which means that price is god so oh, that's what stock market we say that uh, don't try to play too much with it stock market price is ultimatum because it is a, it's a collective behavior of so many people so it, it should be right so first preference always given to market if you don't have a market price the second thing is go for quote of similar price see for example if you talk about afm uh, you are valuing two months forward contract and two months forward contract means uh, a forward contract expiring after two months you can go to the market and take it so for example you have may ending contract is there and june ending contract is there that is available in the market but you don't need may end or june end you need may 10th because you have signed a contract with the bank expiry date being may 10th so how will you assess those so we take the may ending prices we take the june ending prices and between those two price we try to interpolate like if the gap is 30 days 
then the swap point is so much, then you need only for 10 days what is the proportionate amount. So those kind of calculations, using the market price, you try to determine what is relevant is level 2. Level 3 is unobservable inputs, meaning you purely do it based on management assumptions. Like you may do it on cost based upon, if you remember in days 115, long back we discussed, where uh, while valuing the transaction price, the first preference is given to SISP, standalone selling price. If standalone selling price is not available, then you may go for market adjustment assessment approach, where the price we take it and then we do modifications. If that is also not available, then we go for cost plus approach then we may go for residual approach. So, various approaches were there in determining uh, the transaction prices or the consideration. So, that is the level. First level is given to the external factors. The second level is calculated based on external factors and third one is the management assumptions. That is the preference to be given. Okay. That is about index 113. Marie. Next standard in the S20, government grant. So I used to say how to remember this number 20 easily. Whenever you talk about government, you feel it is 420. So in the S20 is government grants. Okay. So government grants, uh, a fairly simple standard. It is very similar to AS12, only one the special point with respect to uh, Concessional loan will come, otherwise it's same as AS12. So grants should be recognized when there is reasonable assurance that entity will comply with the relevant conditions. Conditions may be to provide certain employment, condition if you pay salaries, you get so much of reimbursement, or if you are setting up a solar plant, you get some uh, subsidies, all these are government grants. So when should we take it to p and account? If the grant is related to revenue or expense, then you recognize it in the p and account in the year in which the corresponding elements are considered. So for example, uh, government is paying 25% of your salaries. Like you are starting up the unit in a backward area, some northeastern states, so government told, in your first two, three years, whatever salary you pay, 25% government will reimburse. So, the three years, like first year salary is 1 lakh, so the grant receivable is 25,000. And you recognize the 25,000 in PNL account. So, how will you report the 25,000? Will you report 1 lakh as expense and 25,000 as income? Or will you report 75,000 as net expense? Both kind of presentations are permissible. Of course, it has to be consistent. So in the exam, if they ask you, you can write either of them and give a note accordingly. So either the grant can be reported on gross basis, meaning income is full and expense is recognized separately, or you can re report the expense on a net basis. Both are allowed. Even subsidies related to revenue also will be recognized in the P&L account in the year in which corresponding elements are recognized. The important thing is with respect to assets. For example, entity is purchasing a solar plant and government has the policy of providing flat 25 lakh if you purchase or if you invest in solar plant. So if you invest in 1 crore in solar plants, 25 lakh comes from government as subsidy towards the plant. Again, the two ways of accounting treatment, that 1 crore minus subsidy 25, you can say my net cost of fixed asset is 75 lakhs and on 75 lakhs we will provide depreciation or you can treat 1 crore as the cost of asset and 25 lakh as a deferred grant. And how 1 crore will be transferred to PNL? That is in the form of depreciation, same way in the same proportion the grant will be transferred to PNL in the proportion of depreciation. So two methods are there, either you can treat as deferred income or you can subtract the subsidy or the money received, the grant from the cost of fixed asset. 
there is also something called as repayment A repayment means you may have to refund the government grant received either in part or in full for example uh, now uh, it is before elections so bjp government gave you government and they gave you for 3 years and suppose if the bj government loses and congress government comes and say that or whatever refund you pay it back now very likely situation i mean if those when government changes happens that happens i don't know if you observed or not when one government is there the flyover starts and another government comes and flyover will be there only for next government until it comes back the flyover will be like that only the people can go and they have to fly themselves the flyover will not help you you, you observe uh, surrounding yourself so much of construction contract will be that and if the same government comes then the contractors also get, will get the same job you see one road will be laid down then they will dig it up and again they will lay down within 6 months so the, for them it is a perpetual business continuous business contract that as long as government is safe you get it so for some reasons if you have to refund the or repay the the grant whatever has been done earlier you reverse it so if it was taken to pnl account as income earlier now you are going to take it income or pnl as expense earlier you have subtracted from the cost of fixed assets now you will add to the cost of fixed asset or earlier you have credited to deferred income now you it will be debited to deferred income but if any excess payment is there the excess payment will be taken to pnl account and if any loan is given at concessional rates this we will calculate as per in the uh, 32109 financial instruments where you calculate the fair value at the market rate and difference between the loan amount and the fair value is treated as the grant non monetary grants meaning if the government only gives the asset free of cost they are not paying cash they are giving the asset directly that is non monetary grant you are, you can have two choices either you can recognize the asset at fair value and corresponding amount at grant meaning if the asset value is 10 lakhs you recognize the asset 10 lakhs and grant also 10 lakhs and accordingly asset is depreciated 10 lakh deferred grant you take it to pnl or you say zero but in the notes to accounts you might mention the balance sheet includes a grant a non monetary grant received uh, from the government recorded at nominal value say rupee 1 something like that so that it represents some sort of assets owned by the company okay so that is regarding summary of indias 20 if the grant is given for what purpose i mean while giving the grant what condition did the government put of course one condition is they have to get back something below the table but on the table what was the condition there has to be some conditions to be satisfied to be eligible you have so for purchasing an electric vehicle they have given you the grant so if you purchase the vehicle cost is for research meaning to the companies who is doing research on electric vehicles uh so do you satisfy have to conditions like should you reach any stage like by 3 years end we have to give them a workable electric vehicles or we have to give a electric vehicle which will cost less than 1 lakh so there are all there has to be some target and based on when you are expected to complete the target you recognize that money in pnl account no that then why should they give the money so see they are giving the money because you already spent ha huh, so out of that when you receive the money grant it is taken as deferred grant and depending on when you are expected to utilize you take that in pnl account so if you are expected to utilize that grant over 5 years initially the amount is taken to deferred grant and depending on the amount you are going to spend you will recognize not equally depending on how much will you spend the amount received is 1 crore you are expecting it to initial year i'll use 20 lakhs then i use 30 lakhs then i use 20 lakhs so which are proportion you are expected to satisfy the condition or spend that money in that proportion recognize the grant also it will not be recognized fully now and it will not be straight line method it will be proportionate based on expected usage ultimately it is accrual principle or matching 
when you are expected to make use of it in that period you recognize yeah they, however the underlying it is toward expense the grant received is toward expense so how will you treat the expense same way you treat the grant it just follows the underlying treatment this was as well ha uh, in the, the nature of cap promoters contribution you know, transfer to capital reserve those things are not there in india it has to be recognized in pnl in some reason or the another because when you receive a government grant it will be for a purpose so depending on the purpose treatment the recognition also will be in pnl account in one year or in multiple years okay so it's a quick review of india's 20 Okay, next in days one zero two, share based payments. Share based payments are primarily for employees, so let's focus on that only. Employee stock option plan or employee stock option purchase plan. So when it is purchase plan, it is offer given to them immediately. There are no conditions to be satisfied. That means there is no vesting. They will give the problem like it is vested immediately. In those cases, the expense is recognized immediately. And what would be the expense? And how do you calculate that expense? Uh, you will always have something called as issue price and market price. so under employee stock option plan shares will be given to the employees not at free of cost but at a price which is at concession at a discount so if market price is 100 issue price may be 80 the 20 rupee is the concessional amount and therefore employer will recognize that as employee benefit expense an effective journal entry if you want to recognize and like if it is vested immediately it will be bank account like in this example you receive 80 rupees i'm doing it for one share and the discount which i call it as employee benefit expense 20 rupees and share capital assuming face value of 10 then balance will go to securities premium that is 90 rupees this will be the effective journal entry passed in case of share based payment so this employee benefit expense recognized immediately when it is no vesting no conditions but typically there will be vesting conditions therefore this amount of 20 rupees is not recognized immediately this is recognized over a period of the vesting period so there will be something called as grant date the date will be there is something called as grant that is the date on which announcement takes place then there is vesting that is when the condition is fulfilled and then there is exercise So this period between the grant date and vesting date is called as the vesting period and in this vesting period the employee benefit is expense is recognized proportionately over the period depending on what is the vesting period which may be fixed or which also may be fluctuating so in the vesting period the journal entry will be employee benefit expense to Uh, share based payment reserve or esop outstanding and in the exercise period exercise period means after vesting uh, when they uh, they will have the time to exercise in the exercise period this journal entry is passed that is you receive the money and you debit the esop outstanding 
and you recognize face value share capital excess and securities premium. So this is employee stock option plan where initially whatever is the difference you recognize. In fact, this difference is called as intrinsic value that 80 and 100. But as far as uh, in this 102 is concerned, they say don't follow intrinsic value, follow fair value, which may be less than 20 rupees or more than 20 rupees. That fair value you are not asked to calculate here because it is a part of AFM and many people don't want to calculate even in AFM, meaning that fair value of uh, option is calculated using uh, uh, risk neutrality model, binomial model and black holes model and so on. So they will give you the fair value in examination, that fair value is the concession amount. So one is the employee stock option plan, you recognize proportionately in the vesting period and another one is stock appreciation rights. Stock appreciation right means shares will not be there, entity will be paying equivalent amount of cash. So it is an obligation to pay cash, obligation to pay cash means it is in the nature of financial liability and financial liability accounting treatment is should be reassessed on at the end of every year. So when the fair value change happens in uh, ESOP, employee stock option plans, we are not going to consider it. Whereas in case of stock appreciation, right, we have to consider them as debt. So every year it needs to be reassessed, revalued. And there will be compound financial instruments also, which basically means uh, ESOP with a cash alternative. ESOP with a cash alternative means the employees can either receive cash or they can receive shares. But when you receive cash, usually it will be less number of shares. If you receive shares, it will be more number of shares. Equivalent amount of uh, shares they paid in cash, that usually will be less. So we calculate something called as the debt component and equity component. So for example, they might say, the employees will have option either to receive 100 shares each value in that let's say 80 rupees that is in cash, equivalent amount of cash or you can even go for 120 shares but in those cases share price will be let's say valued at 75 rupees. So 100 into 80 means 8000. What is 120 into 75 comes to 9000. So the difference 1000 is called as equity element that 8000 obligation to pay cash becomes debt component. So that how do you recognize 1000 is not recognized immediately, 8000 is also not recognized immediately. The debt and equity component is only assessed at the beginning and how will you calculate? Just like the way we discussed earlier, it is recognized over a period of vesting period where equity will not be revalued every year debt component fair value will be reassessed every year. Otherwise, accounting treatment would be similar in both the cases. So before we go further, uh, while calculating the numericals, I would like to stress upon one specific format which I usually solve in my problems. So I would like to discuss that format and then we can go further. Just for example purpose, let us say, the vesting period is 3 years, and number of employees at beginning, I mean grand date, or let us say 500. Year 1, it would have become, let us say, 480. So, for how many employees we have to recognize the expense for 500 or for 480? The answer is neither 500 nor 480. The answer is how many of this 480 are expected to be there for another 2 years? Because the vesting period is 3 years. Only if you complete this, you are eligible to get the ESOP. So, even though 480 is there, number of employees are expected, that means you are expecting another 20 people to leave. So how many people are expected to fulfill condition is let us say 460 
and uh, let's say that pair value is 30 rupees. So how much expense you recognize is 460 employees. Let's say each employee is given uh, 100 option each. 100 option each. So 460 into 100. Pair value is 30 rupees. And uh, over a period of 3 years. So into 1 by 3. You will get it as... Uh, Four lakh sixty thousand. Okay. Okay. In the second year, this four sixty is now revised to let's say four fifty eight employees in year two. So how would you calculate year two then? It will be four fifty eight employees multiplied by hundred into thirty into again one by three. If you recognize the expense, I think you get uh, four lakh fifty eight thousand. But one more thing also should be kept in mind because four sixty become four fifty eight. The two employees we have already recognized in the year one, which needs to be reversed. So I need to subtract it. So if I do the two employees into hundred into thirty into 1 by 3, how much that comes to? I think uh, 2,000. So 2,000 I have to subtract. So effectively it becomes expense to be recognized is 4,56,000. And in the year end, what will be the number? Uh, share based payment outstanding, ESOP outstanding, 4,60 plus 4,56. Um, 9,16,000 will be there I think. Okay, anyway, that will come to it. Instead of calculating the, like this, calculating with the, uh, when employee changes, what if fair value also changes, not for uh, equity, but for uh, SAR, stock appreciation, right? Then this calculation becomes much more challenging. So, we don't follow this one by one change approach. We follow cumulative catch up adjustment approach. So, we calculate the closing balance and we subtract the opening balance. So, 4 lakh, uh, 458 into 100 into 30 and we do not do into 1 by 3, how many years have completed by this year is 2, so 2 by 3, this will give me the closing balance. So, if I calculate this, I think I get the 9 lakh 16,000, then I subtract the opening balance of 4 lakh 60, I will get 4 lakh 56,000. Especially when fair value changes, number of employee changes, and in some problems, vesting period also can change. So, this balancing figure approach will be useful. And for that purpose, I follow this tabular approach, uh, which we use in solving uh, problems when we go further. Again, it do not by heart this format. If you are comfortable, you can even calculate with this one line calculation like this. Until you are comfortable, Maybe you can follow this tabular format, logically constructed. Let me explain. Then we may use it later. First, you write number of employees expected to satisfy the condition, which might change every year. Then options per employee, number of options. Each employee is given 100 options like that. That is usually fixed. Fair value of the option. Fair value of option is difference between that market price and the excise price. In case of equity, this number will be taken as on grand date and next we will not change it. ESOP in the nature of equity. If it is nature of debt like SAR, stock appreciation, right? Then this fair value also will undergo a change every year. Then we multiply all of them. That is the number of employees with options per employee and fair value. What we get is the total expense. Then I say how much is the vesting period? Let's say Fire resting period, pre resting period, then we calculate the closing balance. Closing balance is calculated as the total expense multiplied by how many years completed divided by what is the resting period. So, total expense multiplied by number of years completed divided by 
the expected or total vesting period. So this will give me the closing balance of the share based payments ESOP. I compare with opening balance, of course first year will be zero. The difference between closing and opening balancing figure I get expense for each year. This will be the format I will be following for solving problems on ESOP. I am not sure if you remember this formula we have seen somewhere in Indias 103 which is closer to Indias 102 in business combinations while calculating the replaced award non replaced awards when it is being replaced we take the fair value of replaced awards into number of years completed divided by original vesting period or the new vesting period whichever is higher so this is the format for calculating part of purchase consideration so logical aspect of calculation behind that formula is exactly this this format if you feel that lot of calculations are there especially in problem where they say if your average profit is so much then vesting period is two years if average profit is so much vesting period is three years in those cases this tabular format will be useful okay so that is a summary brief discussion on in the s one zero Okay, so next standard in days 41, agriculture. This is the only standard which is specifically with respect to particular nature of business. No other standards talk about software manufacturing separately. This is the only standard which is purely on a separate business sector, agriculture. So we don't know whether we do agriculture or not. At least let's try to understand by doing the standard to an extent in days 41 agriculture let us go through the summary points relevant for example. So, what is an agricultural activity? It is a management of an entity of biological transformation or harvest of biological assets. Please remember these keywords agricultural activity you have to use the word management by an entity of biological transformation at least that much you remember biological transformation. What is that biological transformation? When somebody has a split personality, they shift between A and B, that biologically they transfer from one to another. So, growth of humans, animals, plants, all these things are called as biological transformations. But more importantly, there has to be a management by the entity and it should be for the purpose of sale or conversion into agricultural produce. So, typical example we take is this, is fishing an agricultural activity? Fishing in the ocean, there is biological transformation, but you are not managing the ocean. If you are having that mindset, you have to come down. We are not managing the ocean. Ocean is already there. So, that will not be called as agricultural activity for the purpose of Indies 41. Whereas, if you do it in a pond where you maintain and you breed certain particular categories of fish and you sell it, yes, they become agricultural activity for this definition. So, there has to be management and there has to be biological transformation and that too for the purpose of sale. So, if you have a dog for the purpose of security purpose in a factory, now dog is also animal, that is also agriculture in that sense, animal, but you are not using it for the purpose of sale, you are not having any animal husbandry things there, you are not breeding different types of dog. So, it is not about agricultural activity. So, having an animal directly you do not apply in the S41. Then do not ask me which standard will you apply for valuation of dogs in companies. That is where we have to apply in the S8, where specific signs are not there. Then you go for similar characteristics and try to draw, draw the inspiration and apply those similar principles and whichever is trying to whichever is more of most appropriate those points you will have it for now you are not using it for for the purpose of sale or you are not doing for the purpose of conversion into agriculture produce so even for them it will not be in the s41 not be applicable it is not they are not told whether it is in normal course of business you use it or not are you using it as 
an element for the purpose of sale are you growing are you breeding or are you have maintaining it for particular purpose no it is for security purpose and whether the dog becoming 3 year to 4 year your security will not going to have any impact because of that so for you the dog biological transformation is not going to be impact having any impact that is not part of in days 41 so in days 41 applies to biological assets agriculture produce even government grants related to that or any agricultural activities it does not apply for land it does not apply for bearer plants related to agricultural activities for this we apply in day 16 bearer plants means a typical example let's say mango tree where you take the mango fruits you pluck it and then you process it you don't take the mango tree itself so the mango tree which bear the fruits are called as bearer plants as the name suggests they bear they are in the nature of fixed assets like just like in a manufacturing concern you will have a machinery and from machinery you produce goods so you have a mango tree and from a mango tree the mango fruits are being plucked so they are in the nature of fixed assets therefore they are recognized under india 16 but if the entire plant itself is the product for example sugarcane in those cases uh, they are called as not bearer plants they will be coming under india 41 so they are in the nature of fixed assets will be coming under india 16 where the plant itself is consumed fully that will be under india 40 okay that in recognition okay the, those probable economic benefit should be there okay that is not important what is important is this measurement of biological asset initial recognition you will value it on fair value basis you purchase at cost but instantly you will value it on fair value basis also uh, just before that just one quick point so if we take an example of uh, orange fruit being processed into orange juice so which are the different standards applicable at different phases orange trees their valuation will come under india 16 the process of plucking the fruits will come under agricultural activities and once you store it and if you make it into a juice and make it a tetra packet and all they becomes in days 2 under valuation of inventory so different standard at different points of time okay so the interesting important point from exam point of view is this when you buy a biological asset let's say you buy cows initially you measure at cost and you measure on fair value basis now first of all why it is important to measure on fair value basis what is the reason why indes 41 goes on fair value mode everywhere the reason is it is having biological transformation a human cannot calculate for example you had 100 cows at the beginning you purchased 10 cows you sold 10 cows year end you had 102 cows definitely very natural and very possible so my question is that two cows how do you calculate first in first out average cost it is humanly not possible you cannot ca calculate the cost of those that is why they say we will not apply cost model at all and that is why indes 41 is being freshly introduced and the theme of indes 41 is we value it on fair value basis and fair value basis is not only applicable when you value at the end of every year it's also applicable when you purchase or when you produce when you are having a harvest ready it is valued on fair value basis and what is the fair value to remember in days 113 also we discussed it is fair value always will include or we subtract transportation cost but we don't subtract the transaction cost but here the, that's why whenever we use the word they use the word fair value less cost to sell sometimes we use those words even here it is valued at fair value less cost to sell you can see it here also fair value less cost to sell in fact even initially also we recognize at fair value less cost to sell everywhere you see the word fair value less cost to sell so if you purchase let's say cows for 1000 rupees 
and you paid brokerage at 2%. So your total cost is 1020 rupees. And if you sell the cows, then also you have to pay brokerage. Because we always say that in stock market also, the buyer believes that he makes the money, seller believes he makes the money, the actual person who is making the money is only the broker. Because in both the cases, you have to make the payment to broker and both the cases, you have to make the payment to the government in form of security transaction tax. So the gain are not buyer-seller, the gain is always with respect to intermediaries. So if you are selling the cows, then also you have to pay brokerage, then your uh, fair value less cost to sell will be selling price 1000, 20 rupees brokerage cost you have to pay. So net fair value less cost to sell is 980 rupees. So on the date of purchase, you will recognize loss of 40 rupees. The journal entry what you are going to pass is like uh, biological asset account debit 980, loss on initial recognition 40 to bank 1020. In case of agriculture related activities, especially from exam point of view, keep this in mind, you recognize that fair value less cost to sell at inception also, at initial recognition also. At the end of every year, again, you calculate for the fair value less cost to sell. They are always measured at fair value. And what is one more important point is, uh, you should always segregate the changes. Like at the end of the year, the fair value of 980, say, let's say becomes uh, uh, 960. So the 20 rupee loss happened or maybe 20 rupee profit also would have happened. You should segregate this into how much is physical change and how much is price change. Physical change meaning 3 year cow would have become 4 year cow. So because of increase in age, what is the price change and balancing figure would be attributable to increasing or decreasing prices. Like the way in costing used to calculate, right? Something like price variance, volume variance, so in, in something like that we have to divide here. Uh, the difference in the fair value attributable to the price and difference in fair value attributable to the physical change. That is basically the age change. So they are the important points from exam point of view in the S41. Examination point, mostly they will focus on this scope applicability, whether it's an agricultural activity or not. And second point, they talk about the recognition, initial recognition, what I explained to you, and subsequent recognition also happens on fair value and difference is taken to P and L. Segregate this into physical and price that will happen in the notes to account. Oh, so that is summary of India S41. So uh, standards on assets now. We should not spend much time on this. Valuation of inventories, you would know it is valued at cost or NRV, whichever is less. Cost comprises of cost of purchase, cost of conversion and cost will include non-recoverable duties and taxes. Recoverable duties means where input credit is available, GST input credit available. In those cases, they are not part of the cost. And any other expenses to bring the asset into present location and conditions such as insurance, transportation cost, carriage inwards, uh, custom clearance charges, anything. An amount is spent to bring the asset into present location and condition. They are all added to the cost. As far as uh, net realizable value is concerned, it is estimated selling price minus cost of sale minus cost of completion. So if you talk about any WIP and all, even further cost of completion also is subtracted to value NRV. Valuation is on FIFA method or weighted average cost method. You can also go for specific identification method. So that is about inventory and the important points to be kept in mind, the override recovery we also discussed during maybe, uh, well we discussed uh, in, uh, interim financial reporting problem. So the calculation is fixed overheads divided by actual or normal, whichever is higher. Why we do it like this? Because if you produce more number of units, you would have got a situation of overabsorption, which is to be avoided here. That is why we take higher of normal production or actual production. That rate is used for calculating absorbed overheads. And if you produce less, in that case, there is a situation of underabsorbed overheads, which is an abnormal loss taken to P&L account separately. Then calculation, 
these two points you can keep it in mind joint products is allocated on rational basis joint cost meaning there is one activity but two products emerge two or more so we do it on proportionate basis either uh, physical units method or sale value or split off method by product means they are unintentional product you are not having the main idea of them that the, by chance that product also gets produced so you don't allocate to them instead from the total cost whatever the by product you sell you subtract it and you calculate the net cost on the remaining product so in other words by product is treated like a scrap value of normal loss so the sale value by product is subtracted from the total cost and that total cost if there are any main products you allocate between them you will also use sometimes replacement cost that depends on how the finished goods are valued if the finished goods are valued at cost that means that finished goods nrv is more uh, finished goods you are able to recover the money that is why you are valuing finished goods at cost if finished goods are valued at cost raw materials will definitely be part of it is also valued at cost if finished goods are valued at nrv which basically means you are not able to sell the finished goods even at cost price uh, selling price is below that and therefore you are valuing at nrv so if you are valuing at nrv you are not recovering the cost and therefore raw material cannot be valued on cost basis if valued on cost basis is not the thing then you should value it on net realizable value but raw material you don't normally sell you only use you consume and therefore instead of nrv we use something called as replacement cost replacement cost means the cost of purchase if you have to rebuy those goods replace those goods in your go down how much you have to pay and that is relevant only when the finished goods are sold at uh, recognized at nrv the logical aspect is if finished goods are at nrv you are not able to recognize the value from finished goods in that case it is not appropriate to measure raw metal at cost because you are selling below the cost uh, raw metal we will not know the selling price so we are using replacement cost okay so that is what is yeah as to summary cost of inventory and all is there main points i have told you and in detail these points are replicated again for your reference you can go through that okay great okay in day 16 property plant equipment uh, or I'll, i'll use the term simple words which is uh, uh, fixed assets for me that is more comfortable than using things such as ppe okay so what is the meaning of fixed assets or ppe basically they are not held for sale they are held for use held for sale meaning it will become inventory held for sale is inventory held for use either for production or even for administrative purposes or even for rental to others and are usually are expected to use more than 12 months does not include biological assets except bearer plants bearer plants which bear the fruits they are part of in day 16 uh, recognition these are the two common points recognition will happen when there is probable feb is not have it is future economic benefit So any asset is recognized there has to be future economic benefits and there has to be reliable measurement of cost you should know to acquire the asset to construct the asset what was the cost incurred same logic what we discussed in inventory it includes the purchase price but it will not includes the recoverable duties and taxes it will only include non refundable taxes means where input credit is not available and uh, you will not add general cost opening ceremony cost relocation cost abnormal expenses those things any expenses incurred up to the point of asset ready for use in income tax they use the word put to use in in days accounting we use the word ready for use until the point asset is ready for use all expenses are capitalized the special one is cost of dismantling cost of dismantling is many times people misunderstood or uh, misconceive this as a scrap value 
cost of dismantling means the amount in uh, amount to be incurred to dismantle the asset to get the asset under original condition so if you fix some network equipments by nut bolt and getting some labor if you want to clean that out you have to give the premise under the same condition as it was originally given so they are called as cost of dismantling in other words the cost of the asset is not only the amount in incurred to construct the asset but also the amount incurred to destroy the asset so the amount incurred and amount to be incurred so both of them put together it is cost of the asset amount incurred is as of now you can say asset account debit to bank but cost dismantling is amount expected to be incurred so journal entry will be asset account debit to provision for dismantling and the provision for dismantling will be on present value basis and that present value every year you add interest that is they technically they use the word uh, unwinding of discount the provision is recognized initially at present value and every year it increased by the interest on compound interest basis two methods of model either cost model or revaluation model and for which one you should apply cost model for which one revaluation model the standard does not say that is the accounting policy judgment by the entity and you have to apply for class of asset meaning group of assets having similar nature and use for similar class of assets you have to use similar model if not the consistency principle is not followed the so capitalization ceases when the asset is ready for use so up to the point asset ready for use you are going to capitalize and from that point onwards depreciation starts up to the point asset ready you keep capitalizing from the moment you say asset is ready you don't capitalize but from that point onwards depreciation starts self constructed assets no internal profits no opportunity cost repair and maintenance day to day expenses are charged off if it is heavy inspection or replacement cost existing cost is derecognized and new cost is added deferred beyond normal credit terms so if it includes an interest element that should be recognized as expense separately not to be added to the cost of the asset incidental operations such as if you are constructing a building you might receive an income for parking for temporary purposes so those income or expenses are called as incidental but not necessary for construction those things are recognized in p and l account a measurement of cost model initially at cost then every year you keep to providing a depreciation and if any impairment charges also you will provide and what is depreciation depreciation is allocation of depreciable amount depreciable amount means difference between cost of the asset and residual value the difference between those two is allocated over useful life representing consumption of the asset and that asset should primarily follow matching principle so when you are consuming the asset you are getting the benefit so the benefit should match the expenses so follow the pattern to the extent possible so uh, typically practically we will follow wdd method because as and when you use the asset the value of the asset comes down but for exam purposes the most favorite is state land method but practically relevant is return on value method because as then when you use the asset its benefits start reducing and the depreciation also therefore should be less and less and you may have to review accounting estimates such as the scrap value or useful life and all of them will be prospective accounting they are all called as accounting estimates even depreciation method is also accounting estimate if you follow revaluation model you revalue at periodical intervals but revaluation should be done only at the end of the year so if revalue model follows don't think that you don't calculate depreciation you still calculate depreciation uh, you come to the year end carrying amount after providing depreciation then compare with the revalued amount and you provide for profit or loss if it is a revaluation loss you take it to pnl if it is revaluation profit you take it to revaluation reserve and subsequently if the reversal happens that means if you initially make a profit and subsequently you make a loss then whatever profit was already recognized you set off that and then any excess loss you take it to pnl account that is the subsequent year 
interpretation. That's what initial upward and initial downward and subsequent upward, subsequent downward. So reversal, whatever we have done earlier to be reversed, then only the excess treatment will be given. Okay, this one uh, you should be aware. I don't have any numerical, but I'll just quickly cover this. Okay, that's the important point. There are two methods of creation of revaluation reserve. One is uh, proportionate method. The other is elimination of depreciation method. Proportionate method means you will increase the gross block and accumulate depreciation proportionately. Normally, when we say the value of the asset, the carrying amount, we only talk about the carrying amount. But the component of the carrying amount always includes the original cost minus depreciation so far, which is called as accumulate depreciation. So suppose if original cost was 1 lakh and depreciation is 40,000, so today carrying amount is 60,000 and if this is valued at 66,000, basically meaning you are increasing the net amount by 10 percent, 60 to 66 means you are increasing by 10 percent, then even gross amount should be increased by 10 percent, so it becomes 1 lakh 10 thousand and 40 thousand also should be increased by 10 percent, so 44 thousand. So you proportionately increase the gross and proportionately increase the accumulate depreciation, that is the method one, proportionate method, the journal entry is gross block account, in this example uh, 1 lakh 10,000 to accumulate depreciation 44,000 and thereby, I mean uh, the differences if I say uh, 10,000 and 4,000 and 6,000, so 10,000 will be a gross block, 4,000 will be accumulate depreciation, therefore 6,000 will go to revaluation reserve. So one way of creating revaluation reserve. Another way of creating revaluation reserve is elimination method. This elimination method is like uh, when you have a breakup, no? what do you tell? I mean, you would not have that experience because you are CA students, you are always into the studies, but you would have seen these movies at least. So when you have a breakup, you would have told, okay, let us consider whatever happened as like a bad dream and let's start fresh. The same logic we are applying here. Whatever accumulate depreciation, that is like a bad dream, you forget about it. So entire 40,000 you reverse. You debit accumulate depreciation and you transfer it to the uh, fixed asset and you close it out. So you debit accumulate depreciation, you reverse it, then you create any amount of, uh, you. so the new fixed assets value will now not be looking like uh, 1 lakh minus 40 or 60, new depreciation will now be only 60,000. The gross block will be at 60,000. I mean, of course, after revaluation, it should become 66,000. So, journal entry wise, what you do is you debit accumulated depreciation, which in this case is, uh, in, in this example, is 40,000. Accumulated depreciation will have a credit balance, and to close it out, you will debit, thereby accumulated depreciation is closed, and revaluation profit of you amount recognized is still 6,000. So gross block, you what you do is to gross block, you will do 34,000. So thereby, your gross block will undergo a change. And new gross block will become 66,000. So 1 lakh was there, 34,000 you credited, effectively new gross block will become 66,000. These are two ways in which you can create the revaluation reserve. But in both the methods, amount of revaluation reserve will not change. It is only with respect to the gross block and accumulate depreciation. Only those two are the amounts which are being different. And treatment of revaluation surplus. So when you create the revaluation reserve, of course it goes to OCI and it is a case of without recycling, meaning when you sell the asset, the revaluation reserve will be transferred to retained earnings and at that point in time it becomes free reserves. But there is also one more treatment. You need not wait for the end of sale. The revaluation reserve can be taken to retained earnings as incremental depreciation. So the increment depreciation is the amount calculated as what would be the depreciation if there was no revaluation and what is the depreciation with revaluation, like with, without. The difference is called as incremental depreciation. 
to that extent of amount of increment depreciation you transfer from revaluation reserve to retained earnings what is the point in transferring from revaluation reserve to retained earnings revaluation reserve also will be shown in other equity retained earnings also will be shown in other equity the difference is to that extent it becomes free reserves you can pay dividend out of it when it's out of revaluation reserve you can't pay dividend you can transfer to retained earnings means you can pay dividend and this logic of transferring is similar to what we have done in consolidation whenever there is a revaluation profit next line will come depreciation on above the same logic is applicable here that's about treatment of revaluation please yeah that's a summary part of it so this is the overview of india's team again this is part of your more of your ipcc intermediate but still it can be asked in c final exam okay let's go further okay so let us do the standard in the s 116 accounting for leases it is drastically different from as 19 but for the students it makes no difference because anyway you don't remember as 19 also the question of differences and how it would come only if you remember it if you remember at least there is something called as operating lease financing lease which even now continues but only from the lesser perspective from the lessee point of view the person who has taken lease the classification don't apply only what you have is either you apply or you don't apply that is if you don't apply it's called as exempted lease otherwise it is lease accounting the short term lease are exempted again these are all from lessee point of view short term lease are exempted and low value items are exempted short term lease means less than 12 months low value items means the values are not significant and how much is the low value item that the standard does not define low value item means that standard overall point of view it is not significant in other words the primary purpose of introducing this standard is to have an impact on accounting of rent of building not on any other aspects much so that's why uh, they use the word low value items where if you take a chair on rental basis if you take a computer on rental basis you don't have to apply the standard rules low value items and short term leases is uh, exempted then coming to the lease uh, definition it conveys the right to control the asset and not the ownership ownership is not transferred but the control of use is transferred a uh, few other points to be kept in mind again i will not go too much in depth to each of these points i'll focus only on the essential element essential element is uh, this one substantive substitution rights so for example if we take car a company has taken car on rental basis which is providing to its managing director for his commute in this 116 would apply of course if you are not using the low value items exemption but the question is who will decide which car to be used is it like one car dedicated for your company or is it like they can use any car if you think of an md obviously it will be a posh car dedicated and you cannot keep changing those so that means it is a specific asset identify asset given for the company on rental basis if we take an example of this infosys and all i don't know whether they have now they used to use this emtc buses for their commute also infosys used to hire from the bmtc for uh, uh, travel of their employees so there there is no specific that this bus is kept for infosys not like that every day they have to give them 10 buses that can be of reasonable quality so the question is if the person who gives the asset is called as supplier if he can take back the asset in that case it is not a case of india's 116 the supplier will decide 
which asset to use like in this case, example of car if the company decides which car to provide what the color the lessee don't have any choice he just have to take like in case of infos example the bus is given by bmtc infosys has to take supplier has the substitution rights he can substitute with any other machine building asset whatever it is if the supplier has the right then in base 116 don't apply if the user the person who possess if he has the right in base 116 applies so that would be the important element i don't want to go in depth beyond that that should that will confuse you more if i go on those lines uh okay this point let me say separating lease and non lease component a typical situation when you take a building on rental purposes you also pay monthly not only the rent you also pay security charges administrative purposes maintenance charges parking fees uh, this can be different component so they are called as non fees non lease components that should be separated and when i say separated it should not be separated based on the terms given in the contract it should be separated on stand alone selling price so if it is like 80000 is for rental purposes 20000 is for other services and therefore 1 lakh is what mentioned in the contract but as far as the stand alone selling price concerned if it is that is 50 50 the contract may say 80 20 the contract numbers don't matter the stand alone selling price that is the ratio to be used for recognizing lease and non lease component and if practical expedient is used it's an option given if the entity decides then don't separate it included in the lease component itself that's an option given okay what is the lease term lease term is non cancellable period where both parties cannot terminate on their own unanimously without considering other person's consent and what should be included if there is an option to extend that is uh, if it can be renewed the renewal also should be considered as part of the lease term so if you are taking five year lease it can be extended for another five year and next another five years so your lease term should be for 15 years if it is likely to be extended similarly if it is option you are terminate if you are likely to use that option then you should consider for lease term for assessing that some points are there you can go through that what are the points to be considered whether if with the building is head office building of the company they are not likely to change it frequently if it is there only for some joint venture purposes then those buildings are likely to be not renewed so you have to consider the facts of the case past experience and economic consequences of moving out of the lease should be considered you can include those points okay uh before this i'll explain what is lease payment what is in substance lease payment i'll give a overview but i would like to focus on first the lessee accounting because that is where the major component and i'll go back to the previous uh, pages so what does the lessee has to account at inception he will recognize as two things one rou that is right of use and he will recognize a liability called as lease liability so this concept basically says if you are having a lease rental of 1 lakh first year 1 lakh second year 1 lakh third year so these three lease payments are not considered as 1 lakh expense 1 lakh expense 1 lakh expense ultimately 3 lakh will be there but the mode in which you recognize varies as per indes 116 so what does indes 116 do is this 1 lakh 1 lakh 1 lakh because entity has an obligation to make a payment what you have to do you have to do the present value that present value of loan may be let's say coming to not loan the rental payments may be coming to let's say 2.6 lakhs what does this 2.6 lakh means when you enter into lease agreement 
you are accepting a liability of 2.6 lakh many times when you take house it is not your asset it becomes your liability that, that's what when especially when we do in wealth management and all we used to suggest the clients you you think that your house is your asset but actually it will become your liability beyond a point if you have one house another house another house especially if somebody is beyond 60 years 70 years no point in having so many houses and that's what many people know that whenever they want to save money they invest in real estate give an example of you no know, in bangalore 1 lakh become 1 crore so i'll purchase real estate anyway that's a different issue uh, you are obligated to maintain that house so no longer you don't enjoy that it becomes your liability no longer an asset even if you are in a rented house if a company occupies uh building they have to pay monthly rentals so when you earn money you need to keep us keep aside oh this money is for monthly maintenance you need to earn at least so much of money that's representing an obligation and that obligation you have to recognize initially so that's where example 2.6 lakh is the worth of liability of that lease agreement it's as good as indirectly you're taking a loan and taking a loan for what purpose towards the use of asset you are not the owner of the asset so 2.6 lakhs you recognize it as rou asset as well as lease liability and what will happen to this rou asset you depreciate just like any other asset so 2.6 lakh when depreciate it will go to p and l account earlier how much used to go to p and l account 3 lakhs and now how much you are taking to the p and l account in the form of right of use of asset depreciation 2.6 lakhs in this example and this lease liability don't stop this lease liability every year you recognize interest for year 1 year 2 year 3 and that interest will come to 0.4 lakhs ultimately interest also will come in the end of account overall impact wise this makes no difference but the way in which it is reported the nature of expense it is not reported as lease rental it is reported as depreciation it is reported as interest expense so the components will have the impact over a period of time not in the same year so accounting wise we should do the present value of lease payments and the present value of lease payment is recognized as rou asset and lease liability and for present value purpose of course we do the discounting rate and we have to take all the lease payments what is the meaning of lease payments so go back to the previous pages lease payments include in the uh, comprise of fixed payment if it is variable payments generally they are not included unless they are depending on an index or rate for example you say uh, we are entering into annual lease rental of 50 lakhs but every year it increased by 5% per annum inflation you have to counter in instead of rate some people might say let's uh, compare this with cost of inflation index how much ever that inflation index increase by our rental also will increase by same percentage so when you link the lease rentals with an index or a rate like libor i really don't know why they link with libor but in exam problems they have given that if you link the lease payment with a rate or with the index then those are also called as lease payment but if the lease payments are like a profit share of or revenue share of sales like a royalty kind of thing those are not part of lease payments for our calculation the so variable lease payments only if they are depending on index or rate or uh, excise price of the option at the end of the lease term if the lessee has the option to purchase the asset that price provided that it is likely to be exercised and residual value if it is guaranteed by the lessee then you are going to consider non lease components not considered variable lease payment such as profit share or electricity charges those kind of things are not part of lease payments sometimes it's called as in substance fixed lease payment in substance means they'll pay they'll say like this minimum of lease rental 1 lakh or 3% of sales so minimum is 1 lakh for sure 
and excess may be depending on the sales. So to the extent of 1 lakh, it is called as in substance lease payments. So to that extent, it will be part of lease calculations. Excess uncertain that we don't take into consideration. Lease in, uh, incentive, something like a lease back kind of thing. Uh, if you take the lease within these three years or sometime during COVID also many people got the offer because people are not occupying the spaces. So they said if you decide within next six months, we'll give you like 20% discount or we'll give you some money back. Those kind of lease incentives, if any amount received by the lessee, those are deducted from the ROU asset. Now, uh, As far as the uh, yeah, variable lease payments, they are recognized in P&L account separately. They are not considered as part of lease payment. They will not account for present value calculation. Initial direct cost, they are added in the ROU asset. That is what relevant from lessee point of view. A discount rate, either we take interest rate implicit in the lease or incremental borrowing rate. Incremental borrowing rate means uh, if the lessee had borrowed the similar amount from the bank, how much interest rate he would have paid. That is second, but most of the cases we only go with this because implicit rate is difficult to ascertain practically. Implicit rate means you take the lease payments and take the fair value of the asset and arrive at what is supposed to be the interest rate, like effective interest rate. But fair value of the asset is not available so easily. So this is not practical enough to consider, but two rates are given as per the standard. Okay, so lease liability initially recognized, which is equal to present value of lease payments. And ROU asset is equal to that. And initial recognition will be ROU asset plus any initial direct cost, any incentives are all subtracted. Cost of dismantling, that is cost of restoration, is also capitalized. Subsequently, what do we do? On a lease liability, we are going to recognize the uh, interest payments. And ROU asset, we will recognize depreciation. And any payment made will be subtracted from lease liability, like amortized cost, what we followed in financial liabilities. That is opening balance lease liability plus interest cost minus lease payments. So you maintain lease liability at amortized cost. Subsequent measurements or you said you will provide depreciation and you also provide impairment if required. So depreciation expense, impairment expense, interest expense, variable lease payments, they are not part of lease payments. So as and when they are incurring, you will take it to P&L account. Lease liability is carried at amortized cost basis. A re-measurement of lease liability, re-measurement and modification, these are the two areas where they will ask you the some big questions in examination point of view. Re-measurement of lease liability, when would happen when these situations they have given? Basically, lease payment amount will change or lease term will be reassessed or in substance fixed payment will happen or residual value will change. So how do you calculate the new number? Sometimes we'll use the original discounting rate means at the time of inception or you will use the revised discounting rate. If you try to remember both of them, it will confuse you. So you better remember when will you use the original rate. You will use original rate if Residual value changes. If index, payment due to the index or the interest rate, we remember variable lease payments connected with index. If that changes or the variability is resolved, this anyway you can ignore it. Only these two cases you will use the original rate where the index connected payments or residual value changes. In all other cases you will use the revised. So don't try to think both of them, that will confuse you. Remember one of them from exam point of view. So what will happen when you reassess the liability? Uh, the liability will be changed, therefore, from the existing carrying amount to the new carrying amount, you have to increase. And then corresponding asset will go to ROU. If you have to decrease, corresponding ROU asset will reduce. So when this situation happens, the lease liability adjustment is considered in ROU asset. So please pay attention on this point. When there is lease modification, lease modification means 
two particular things one there is a change in scope or there is a change in lease payments scope means it may be a term or it might be the area earlier you are taking one floor now you are taking two floor that might be the case or earlier you are uh, having uh, three year now it becoming five years either the lease term changes or lease uh, scope changes or payment changes for those examples we will apply lease modification for lease modification and all we will go with uh, revised rates only only for two things we go with original rates that is on residual value and if the lease payments are changing because of an index or a rate accounting wise if the increase in scope happens you are taking one floor now you are taking additional floor and the lease payment towards the additional floor is what you would have paid to anybody else that is stand alone selling price is commensurate with the new lease in that case you account it separately you are not going to mix with existing lease if not you are going to account it as like the way we are going to discuss now this is the area where somehow lot of calculations are there and people also gets confused here so if there is a uh, decrease in scope or decrease in term let's take one at a time if there is decrease in scope earlier it was for five, 10 years now no, let's say earlier it was for 10 floors now you are taking only for five floors initially what you recognize at the inception you recognize the ro usa as well as you recognize lease liability now after some time if you are decreasing that means ROU asset also should be reduced and lease liability also should be reduced. And the difference you take it to PNL account. Proportionately you reduce revised liability, uh, proportionately you reduce the ROU asset. Increase in term and increase in scope. A decrease in scope is easy because you can simply do proportionate calculation. But decrease in term you cannot do proportionate calculation. You have to calculate for ROU asset you can do. But for lease liability, you have to calculate with the new number of years remaining and discounting rate, what would be the present value of lease liabilities. So there it will be slightly challenging. You have to be careful over there. Sometimes both happens. There will be a decrease in term and there will be change in lease rentals. So you have to calculate a two-step process because if there is a decrease in a scope then the difference should go to p and l account if there is a change in lease rental then that should be adjusted in rou asset and lease liability so you have to do it a two step approach first you reduce the lease liability and then you account for the changes in the lease payments that will be on step by step approach on lease modifications yeah presentation uh, rou asset is on the asset side, lease liability on the liability side. As far as lesser is concerned, the original whatever you have learnt in AS 19 would continue. I don't know to what extent you remember. That is lesser will be classifying the asset as either financing lease or operating lease. Financing lease means where substantial risk and rewards are transferred. Substantial risk and reward transfer means it amounting to as if the asset is sold. It is not sold in ownership but in use. It is as if lessee is becoming the owner. In which of these cases the standard has given certain illustrations and those illustrations itself can be your questions in exam. The ownership is transferred at the year end, I mean not at the least term end or the lessee will have the option to purchase but below fair value. Lease term and economic life of the asset is more or less same. The present value of the lease payment, if you calculate, is almost equal to fair value of the asset. And as asset is of special nature, it is procured only for lessee. Other people cannot make use of it. So these are the illustration in which it is considered as financing. In all other cases, it is operating lease. And what is the uh, accounting treatment of financing lease in the books of lesser? He will recognize the present value of lease payments 
एंड अनगारंटीड रेसिडल वैल्यू अनगारंटेड मीन वॉट इज नॉट गारंटीड बाई लेसी दैट ऑल्सो विल बी कंसिडर्ड सो लीज पेमेंट प्रेजेंट वैल्यू एंड जी आर बी इज अनगारंटेड रेसिडल वैल्यू that present value if you take that is the rate at which lesser will recognize the initial amount of asset and subsequently you know amortized cost method increase the interest subtract the lease payment and there is also something called as gil gil stands for uh, gross investment in lease if you don't apply the present value simply add all the lease payments that is called as gross investment in the difference between gross investment in lease and present value present value is also called as the nil net investment in lease so this difference is called as finance income but not recognized immediately recognized over a period of the lease term and therefore it is called as unearned finance income difference between the gross investment in lease and net investment in lease operating lease uh, the lesser don't de recognize the asset asset will continue to be in his books and lesser will recognize the depreciation and any income he receives operating lease is your regular lease rentals income he receives he will take it to pnl on a systematic basis or on straight line basis so this is straight away taken to pnl there is no other adjustment such as interest present value and all for uh, operating lease modification and all i don't want to confuse a uh, two specific things i'll quickly cover one is the sub lease and the other is sale and lease back again i will not go in too much in depth i'll give you the overall concept sub lease means a person takes the asset on lease and gives it on lease and therefore in the sub lease you can never take the low value item or short term lease item that exemption cannot be used you still have to apply the proper things the exemption cannot be used uh so there are actually three parties so you can call something like a head lease and sub lease so one person giving the asset other person receives and the same person is also giving the asset on lease so the middleman is where the confusion arises accounting would arise so the middle person taking the asset on lease meaning in that he is a lessee and then he is giving the asset on lease so in that he is a lesser so as far as lessee accounting is concerned you account it initial you are recognize it as roi asset and you recognize it as lease liability and when you give it on lease it depends whether it is financing lease given or operating lease given if it is operating lease given then it is Uh, existing ROI asset will continue, and existing lease liability will continue. The accounting is done as it is earlier, and on operating lease, any income he receives, he recognizes it on straight line basis or any other systematic basis. But the issue would come if the sub lease you are giving it on finance lease. If you are giving it on finance lease, that means the substantial risk and rewards are transferred. Therefore, existing ROI asset should be de-recognized. and the lessee at present value should be recognized and difference will be taken to pnl account so that is with respect to sub lease as far as the uh, sale and lease back is concerned uh the important point is you are selling the asset and therefore whenever there is a sale you can you should recognize profit or loss on sale but you are also taking back the asset on lease so the control is not transferred to that extent so if you are selling the goods as well as taking it back that means you cannot recognize the profit on full assets so if you are selling for 1 lakh but you are taking back the asset 40% the fair value basis 40% of the asset coming back to you in the form of lease So, how much profit you can recognize? Whatever the normal profit you calculate, only sixty percent you can calculate. And what is one more important point is what is the ROI asset that you will recognize? It is forty percent of the cost of the asset as per your books of account. ROI asset will not be equal to uh, whatever the present value of lease liability amount you calculate. That is only for fair value purposes. So the 
uh, ROE asset amount will be equal to the proportionate percentage of asset retained. So that is mainly your sale and lease back. Maybe I'll share one uh, video on sale and lease back problem which was asked in the past. So you can go through that for numerical example on sale and lease back. Yeah, uh, there's, those are the summary points, important points from exam point of view on in days 1 1. COVID provisions are not relevant now. That is basically telling modification of accounting. We used to do cumulative catch up basis that is not required. The COVID provisions are uh, not, no, cannot be asked now. So they are not relevant. Regular modification accounting would apply. Okay, let's go further. Okay, so in days 23, borrowing cost will not spend much time on this. Uh, interest is capitalized if the asset is a qualifying asset. And what is a qualifying asset? It will take substantial periods to get ready for use. And what is substantial period means normally it will take 12 months, but that is not a hard and fast rule. In the exam, even if it is 9 months, you can give an assumption and accordingly you can give the answer. So if it takes substantial period to get ready for use, then interest is capitalized. Otherwise, things such as credit hours, uh, money paid towards advance of machinery, in all those things, interest is charged off to P and L account. And the ad additional condition is it's not sufficient. You just take the loan. It should also be utilized. Only then it will be capitalized. To the extent of utilization, only capitalized. Also, two types of borrowing is there. Specific borrowing, general borrowing. Specific borrowing, the loan taken exclusively for the purpose of a particular asset. In that case, we take the respective interest rate. If you have taken multiple loans, then we are going to do average rate, that is weighted average rate. And that rate is applicable on the amount incurred. Uh, whatever the percentage, yes, proportionately you take it for the month from the date on which amount incurred till the year end. Cut-off date for interest capitalization, once the asset is ready for use, interest capitalization is stopped. Uh, the extra thing is with respect to uh, foreign exchange difference. Uh, to cover that point quickly, in AFM you could have learned there is something called as interest rate parity theorem. That is the concept behind this application. So when you take a loan in foreign currency, there will be an exchange difference because of that uh, interest rate parity theorem. So, in case of exchange difference on liability, you have to calculate what is relevant that it is to be called as interest cost. So, a portion of exchange difference, but you are reporting it as interest cost. I am not talking about capitalization or not. Capitalization is still subject to same condition of qualifying asset. So, how do you calculate that uh, what is attributable to interest cost? The exchange difference, you calculate as difference between interest on notional loan. So, had you taken the loan in Indian rupees, how much loan you would have taken? Suppose when you have taken $1000 loan and when you have taken it was 80 rupees. Now, in the year end, let us say it has become 85 rupees. And had you taken the loan in rupee terms, so you would have taken $1,000 into 80 rupees, 80,000 rupees loan you would have taken. And Indian terms, let us say you would have paid interest of 11%. So, 80,000 into 11%, so that 8,800 would be your notional interest on foreign currency loan. Versus actual interest, how much you are paying? Let us say you are paying only 5%. 5% on $1,000 means you pay only $50. And $50 will be paying at the year end. So, year end would have been 85. So, 50 into 85, whatever that number, that is your actual interest. 
and difference between these two 8800 minus number what you got that difference is actually reported as interest cost the excess uh, excess meaning uh, what is your exchange difference 80 rupees becoming 85 so 5 rupees multiplied by 1000 dollars so exchange difference is 5000 rupees so whatever number you calculated now that is reported as interest suppose there another number it comes to let's say some 1500 something like that so 5000 minus 1500 remaining is reported as in the s21 on foreign exchange and difference to the extent of difference between notional loan and actual loan that difference is reported as interest cost so even though it is included embedded implicit in, in uh, foreign exchange difference it is accounted reported as interest cost if you have any exchange difference then in the remaining amount it's reported as in days 21 or an exchange difference. In other words, if you connect with the IRPT theorem, you can remember like this amount or the concept of IRPT is if you have a gain in forward, forward market, you will have a loss in the money market. If you feel that I am saving interest cost, you are not saving, you are losing in exchange difference. Your loss in one market is profit in another market. So, if arbitrage if theory is not there, that means that exchange difference becomes zero. If exchange difference is there, that means there was some arbitrage opportunity. And if you want to connect those, you can connect like that. So the calculation wise, you calculate interest on notional loan. Have you taken the loan in rupee terms minus the actual interest? The difference is called as interest reported under a portion of exchange difference. So that would be a quick summary of in the S23. Let's continue with the next standard in the S38, intangible assets. First of all, it is more or less uh, very similar to in the S16, the treatment wise. So, what are the differential aspects? Only those things will take a look at it. So, what is the significance of intangible assets? Basically, it does not have a physical substance, but always remember it should be a resource controlled by the enterprise resource controlled meaning you should have future economic benefits or it may be benefit of restricting others like if you have a license or copyright you can stop others being using it both of them are important it is not having physical substance but at the same time you should have the feature of assets mainly you should have the control uh, you recognize an asset just like in day 16 so those expenses are straightforward. Uh, so let's focus only on the basic elements because other elements such as purchase price is included. Non-refundable taxes are part of the cost. If you have an input credit available, they're not part of the cost. Those kind of things will apply. That means general overheads or uh, selling distribution cost uh, interest. They are all not part of cost of the asset. Uh, this is one internally generated goodwill is not recognized. The main reason being there is no reliable measurement of cost. You can't say that to gain this uh, brand or to get this goodwill, how much exactly the amount spent. It, it is a goodwill uh, brand name which will be generated over a period of time. So unless you pay for it, the internally generated goodwill cannot be recognized. As far as the research and development cost is concerned, normally we use it as interchangeable terms for accounting part. Research is uh, tasked to P&L account, whereas development cost is capitalized. So what is the difference between research phase and development phase? You can see in the next chart. Research is planned investigation undertaken for the purpose of gaining knowledge. So it is only a research. Basically means your result is not guaranteed your result is not sure so research is only a study is taken you are still finding out whether there is any solution or not whereas development phase means there is an application of research findings and in examination usually they will tell you when is the development phase have been started and research phase it will be charged to p and l account development phase will be capitalized and subsequent recognition 
the accounting policy just like in day 16 will apply also for this cost model revaluation model so what are we are discuss relating to the revaluation things such as uh, you can you have two methods of creation of revaluation reserve and once you create a revaluation reserve you can have two methods of treatment either you sell I mean only when you sell the asset you transfer treating earnings or you can transfer proportionately all those things will continue to Okay. Regarding amortization, it is just like depreciation. It is allocated over useful life. This is one new thing you need to keep it in mind. Intangible with indefinite useful life. Indefinite useful life meaning does not mean it is infinite. It just means that you don't know the exact time period for which the asset is there. For example, goodwill. So you can't say that it is there for a period of 10 years or 15 years. So in those cases, we don't apply amortization. So under India's goodwill is never amortized. It's only tested for impairment every year. Intangible assets where you are not able to say specific definite useful life, their amortization don't apply. Amortization method, a state line method or any other uh, method which reflects the benefit pattern, residual value is usually taken as zero. Useful life, for that you have to consider various factors such as the technology, the obsolescence, expected life cycle and things like that. And uh, Asset, useful life, scrap value, all those things should be reviewed and all those things will be considered as change in accounting estimates. A revaluation model will not go through it again. The same thing what is discussed in India's 16 is applicable even for revaluation model. So that would be it. So what are the major points which you have learned in India's 38 as compared to India's 16 is uh, Asset nature is not having physical substance and there is something called as research and development expenditure which is not there in, in day 16 and there is one concept of indefinite useful life where the useful life is not specifically determinable. So those are not amortized, those are only tested for impairment. So these are the major aspects of, uh, you, you need to keep it in mind in, in day 38 as compared to in day 16 and from exam point of view the repeated questions which I have observed is on one of course the research and development phase research is uh, expensed off development is capitalized and the other area they keep uh, focusing on whether it is an intangible asset or not so they primarily focus on the area of control so for example there might be things such as if company sponsors a training program for employees so can those costs be considered as intangible assets? The answer is no, because entity don't have a control over usage of those training activities. The knowledge is acquired, but the application of knowledge, the usage of knowledge is not under the control of entity and therefore it is not an intangible asset. So the word control is focused continuously on India's 38 problems. Okay, that would be the brief overview. Let's go further. India's 36 impairment of assets impairment of assets is a new standard for you but for your juniors they are also going to learn AS28 in intermediate so they are having all the standards now impairment basically means reduction in the value of the asset but there is a term called as depreciation which also means reduction in the value of the asset and we have revaluation loss which also means reduction in the value of the asset. Then how do you differentiate between these three? Depreciation is a gradual decrease. That's like a normal loss. Whereas revaluation loss only talks about market value fluctuations, not about overall value of the asset. Sometimes market value can fluctuate, but you don't care. You will be still using the asset for your operations. The market value changes is represented by revaluation loss. Impairment means it is an unexpected loss, sudden decrease because of physical accident or because of technological changes. So that's why we are calling it as abnormal loss. So in the 
PNL account. If any company reports depreciation, that is not considered anything abnormal. But if some entity reports impairment as a user of account, that gives some signals. That means something wrong has happened, something unexpected has taken place. If the amount is not significant, you may choose to ignore, but still if there is an impairment that is like a black mark, the user should always be more careful when analyzing such company. So because uh, it is decreasing the assets, in this statistics does not apply to certain standards because those standards themselves will take care of these situations because in the S2 is valued at cost or NRV whichever is less so there only the impairment is taken care so again you don't come to impairment and account for the reduction in the value of inventories like that those standards they are recovered they are covered in the respective standards now we don't do impairment on yearly basis or half yearly basis if the impairment should be tested there has to be some indicators so if we have any disease in our body every day we don't go and get the checks done only when you are not feeling well you are having some fever it is not going away you are feeling some strange pain so when you are having an indicator then you go and get the testing done and then the result comes then you will know what are the treatments to be taken so if there are indicators regarding impairment Finally, we go and calculate the impairment. So, what are the indicators? External source or internal source. External source means market value changed, technology has changed, uh, it, uh, or the interest rates have changed. When interest rates increases, we say that value of the asset is coming down. There is an inverse relationship between rate of interest and value of the asset. If interest rate increasing, that is also one of the factors. Again, remember, if these factors happen, does not mean there is impairment. These are the factors you have to consider to test whether there is impairment or not. And all these are judgmental. So, for example, uh, market value reduced, interest rates also reduced. Interest reduced is a good thing. Market value reduced is a bad thing. So, that some factors can be positive, some factors can be negative. You have to apply the judgment which is more relevant in the context of the companies or the sector. Internal source may be physical damage or the purpose of which certain asset has expected to be used. Now it is changed on those lines. Like even the classroom benches are supposed to be meant for students to come and sit. But post-COVID, many of the coaching centers, including ours to an extent, this become more of a go-down to keep the books, not to keep the students over there. The purpose for which certain asset used is changed. Just give an example, same thing can happen to various other manufacturing concerns as well. Okay, so impairment loss is carried as difference between carrying amount means book value and recoverable amount. And carrying amount should be always after the current year depreciation because if you don't do it, then that means even depreciation element will be included in the impairment loss. Overall, PNL might be correct, but the reporting of nature of elements not appropriate. So, impairment loss is calculated always at the end of the year after providing current year depreciation. And carrying amount minus recoverable amount. A recoverable amount means when you when you say an asset, an asset is capitalized only if it is having future economic benefits. And what economic benefits? Either by using the asset or by selling the asset. These are the only two ways in which you can get the benefit from the asset. So, recoverable amount is higher of fair value less cost to sell. That is, if you sell it today, what value you get? Less cost. And the value in use. Value in use is the present value of cash flows that can be generated from using that asset. Many times what happens is uh, from the individual asset, you may not be able to calculate the impairment. For example, in a classroom, from each bench, we can say, okay, on an average, the occupancy of the students is supposed to be so much, and from students, we can charge so much of fees. But how do we do for projector? How do we do for reception table? From that, you cannot establish how much is the specific cash flows. So, for them, we will not do impairment at the individual asset level. 
you will do impairment at a group of assets level. The group of assets is called as CGU, cash generating units, which we'll come to it in a moment from now. So as of now, the calculation what we're learning is with respect to individual asset. So what is the carrying value of the asset? Minus recoverable amount that is higher of if you sell it or if you use it, whichever is higher. Impairment loss is transferred to P&L accounts. But if you follow revaluation model and if there is any revaluation reserve, first you adjust against revaluation reserve, only excess impairment loss is transferred to P&L, just like the treatment of revaluation loss that you would have considered. Fair value less cost to sell is basically you take the sale agreement and other aspects. And what do you mean by cost to sell? The selling expenses, brokerage, commission expenses, those kind of things and does not include the value or space. So for the purpose of selling, you may have to get the valuation certificates and all. So those things are not called as cost to sell. So value in use, just like what we do in AFM or in your capital budgeting, what you used to do in intermediate. If you purchase a machinery, what are the benefits you are getting from that cash flows and present value of cash flows. And after useful life, you sell the machinery at a scrap value that also should be part of cash flows and discounting factor we apply the present value what you get is value in you can we reverse the good we reverse the impairment loss just like for the purpose of impairment there has to be indicators even for reversal there has to be a sufficient indicator the facts and circumstances must have changed for example because of government order you you could not produce certain goods for which machinery might have become impaired. Now, later point in time, government has withdrawn the order. Circumstances have changed. But impairment of goodwill is not allowed. It is considered as internally generated goodwill. Like once goodwill is impaired, and if it is coming back, it means that you have put the efforts to bring back the brand into original position which again you cannot establish reliable measurement of cost and therefore reversal of goodwill is not permitted, reversal of other elements are permitted but what is important is, is it shall not carry, exceed the carrying amount if there was no impairment. So if you are calculating the carrying amount is about let us say 100 rupees and recoverable amount is 120, so 20 rupee you can say it is a reversal. Reversal means you take it to PNL account. But what would be the carrying amount if there was no impairment? Notionally, you have to calculate. Previously, if there was no impairment, how much would have been the value of the asset? Let's say that only comes to 108. So only from 100 to 108, you can call it as reversal of impairment. Balance, if you want to recognize, you may call that as revaluation reserve not as reversal of impairment. Some people might use this as a back door to increase the value of the asset without creating revaluation reserve. That is why this point is applied. Impairment is reversible only up to the point of the asset if there was no impairment. Beyond that, you can't reverse. PGU, as I told you, cash generating unit, it is the smallest group of assets which can generate independent cash flows. And you should also keep a hierarchy of CGU in mind. If you do not use the word smallest group of assets, then we may end up considering the entire entity as one unit. That is not the purpose behind it. So, Every possible set of units, for example, if we take a classroom, we have two classrooms. So one classroom is one unit, other classroom is another unit. And we have a, let us say, branch in Bangalore and we have branch in Mumbai. So Bangalore becomes one and Mumbai becomes another. So you will have a small, you start from individual assets, then you go to smaller CGU, then you go to larger CGU and then again you go to further larger CGU. Ultimately, it ends up with entity being one CGU. So you have to consider at various levels, you can say, hierarchy of CGUs. The smallest group of assets that can generate independent cash flows, they are called as CGU and, and therefore impairment is also not done at individual asset level, impairment is done at a 
group level at CGO level. The individual furniture's cost, let's say, is 50,000. Now, cost of the projector is 10,000. So, total PGU is 60,000. And if the CGU 60,000 is impaired to 58,000, 2,000 is impairment loss, that will be allocated proportionately on pro rata basis among all the assets under the CGU. But sometimes uh, the CG also will include goodwill. A portion of brand is also getting allocated towards uh, CGU. If that happens, if the carrying amount of the unit contains an element of CGU, the impairment must be first reduced from goodwill. Then the excess amount will be allocated among all other units. And after impairment, the carrying amount should not go below fair value, should not go below VIU value news, and should not go below zero, which means the maximum amount of impairment can be the carrying amount. It cannot go beyond the carrying amount. When can it go beyond the carrying amount? In which situations? If there is a need for cost of disposal. You have a machinery, government said you cannot produce anything out of it. So, to get rid of it, to dispose, you have to put money out of pocket. So, in those cases, if the cost of this is 50,000, first of all, that 50,000 is no value now and you have to incur 2,000. But the impairment will only be restricted to maximum of 50,000. The 2,000 extra, the out of pocket cost, cost of disposal may be called under index 37 as obligation to make a payment to get rid of the asset, but that is not termed as impairment. The impairment of the asset is restricted to carrying amount. If any excess amount, the entity has an obligation to make payment, that will be treated under 37 and not under 36. Corporate assets. Uh, corporate assets means they are again common assets. Uh, common assets such as EDP equipment, research center, headquarters building is a popular example. So, for corporate assets, we follow two methods or two alternatives. If it can be allocated on consistent basis, if can't be allocated on consistent basis. So, what do you mean by if it can be allocated? You think an example of a building. You can clearly tell in the first floor, department A is there. In second floor, department B is there. The cost of the building can be clearly allocated to A so much, B so much. That is what it means by it can be allocated on reasonable basis. If it can't be allocated, meaning you take an example of research center, where an independent unit is being working for overall well-being of the company. So that research center you cannot allocate against any particular department. So those are called as if it cannot be allocated on reasonable basis. So if you can be allocated, then what you should do? The carrying amount should also include the corporate assets. So you will have an individual asset and also you will have an allocated corporate assets. So what you get is the carrying amount. So the carrying amount consists of individual asset carrying amount and the corporate assets carrying amount, you sum it up, that is your carrying amount for the purpose of impairment. Then you compare it with the recoverable amount of the CGU and impairment will be allocated to the corporate assets and other assets on pro rata basis. And here the goodwill and all will not come in the sense uh, uh, you don't allocate first to corporate assets. That will not happen. Corporate asset is just like any other assets. So allocation will be happening on pro rata basis. But if it goodwill can't be allocated, then we can think like two approaches will follow. We, we follow bottom-up approach. So first we take the individual asset, test if there is any impairment. If yes, you provide for impairment. Then you aggregate all the assets and then you take the overall corporate assets and then test it at a higher level. So you will do a kind of bottom-up test, impairment at individual asset level and later the impairment at aggregate level at CGU level where corporate assets can be allocated. Goodwill impairment, as I told you, it is uh, goodwill is given first priority when you are allocating, but reversal of goodwill is not. So, they are the summary points as far as in the S36 is concerned.
okay so in the s 40 investment property as the name suggests it should be only for property and not for use purpose held as investment which is not the right thing at all uh, because in my opinion real estate is not a good asset in my opinion uh, but some people do think that the investment in real estate is good investment but for them in days what is applicable if you purchase the building not for the purpose of business use but only for the purpose of capital appreciation or for the purpose of rental to others only for building not for any other asset this standard applies or even when you are not go you don't know which for which purpose you are going to use it the use is undetermined even then in days 40 is applicable it is not for sale because if it is sale in ordinary course in days 2 will apply not for administrative purposes not for production of goods because in that case in days 16 would have applied uh, what is the main point of Indias 40 is uh, again same point will be applicable whatever we applied in Indias 16 that is uh, recognized only when there is future economic benefits and there has to be reliable measurement of cost and how, many, how much amount of you can uh, capitalize only if the input duties and taxes are not recoverable recoverable duties and taxes are not part of the cost any expense incurred up to the point as it ready for uh, use all those things whatever we discussed under India 16 will be as it is here also but main difference is measurements you don't follow revaluation model only cost model to be followed investment property only cost model not revaluation model you will disclose the fair value but you don't recognize the fair value and when you say cost model remember it is not cost this cost model meaning you provide initial cost then subsequently you provide for depreciation that's what you mean by cost model so initial recognition will happen at cost and subsequently you provide for depreciation over a period of the useful life whereas IFRS will allow revaluation model also and transfers between the different categories it is possible you might transfer from in day 16 to in days 40 or in days 40 to in day 16 uh, whenever a transfer happens it is always happened that carrying amount you don't revalue the assets at the time of recognition and when you dispose, you recognize profit or loss. Yeah, that would be with respect to in days 40. Only point to be kept in mind. When you invest in a building or a land or a part of it for the purpose of capital appreciation or for the purpose of rental income or where the future use or the users is undetermined, in days 40 would apply. Valuation of in days 40 is only cost model. Cost model means initial cost minus subsequent depreciation and if there is a transfer for whatsoever reason then it will be continued to be at carrying amount it will not be revalued so that would be the summary points to be kept in with respect to India's okay let us take up the next standard India's 105 non-current asset held for sale and the discontinued operations so this non current assets held for sale i term it as you know old age home when you are done with your useful life where nobody considers it you as useful but you are not gone yet you are still there so you are held for sale purpose where everybody knows that the eventual next step is sale only. You might be under India 16, you have been using the asset for so much time. You might be under India 40, investment property, generated income, capital appreciation for longer period of time. You might be intangible asset under India 38. 
provided benefits to the form in form of without physical substance all those things when their end comes they will come to in the s105 so this is like you can say maybe uh, kashi all the gods where people decide that to come now there is no more things left i heard there are some gods in kashi where people go there just to die they go there sit and okay, the objective is that this place for that that is when in this 105 so when you are very clear only you should come to in this 105 so they use the word it is available for sale in immediate present condition you have to die immediately you cannot have any conditions i have some that desire left i will sell this building if i find a new building i will sell the machinery only if i get a good price so do no kind of conditions unconditional death that is it should be available for sale in the present condition as it is usual some customary terms like if you have to sell a machinery you have to package it you have to clean few things those are not called as conditions if they continue to be vital for example if it is entity's head office building it is vital or if machinery is important then it is not a in this 105 if the intention is to sell in distant future then also you cannot reclassify sale must be probable management should be committed to sell active program advertisement tender board resolution all those things should be there it should be marketed at reasonable price if the market price like it will be 1 lakh you show advertisement for 10 lakhs that means indirectly you don't have intention you have to close it to the market price sale must be completed within one year and significant change should not be the case abandoned assets are not assets held for sale so you are having machinery producing so many types of goods corona came now no demand for the products so you thought i am having enough inventory for next to two years because people are not buying my product so i am not using the machinery so machinery is kept abandoned idle that is not in the s105 even the abandoned assets depreciation will continue abandoned assets in the 16 only will be applicable so if you want to say in the s105 asset has to be clearly marked as asset for sale purposes measurement uh, the moment to classify it as in the s105 there is no question of depreciation why no question of depreciation because depreciation should reflect some benefit from using the asset now if the asset is held for sale so where is the question of any benefit the moment it is classified as in this 105 depreciation stop and from that date you value at just like impairment carrying amount and lower of carrying amount less fair value less cost to sell but impairment we had one term called as value in use it is not used so you cannot use the term value in use so it is the same logic of impairment except we don't use the value in use we only can sell because it is held for sale purposes so impairment loss will be equal to carrying amount minus fair value less cost to sell basically whichever is less so depreciation amortization everything is stopped impairment loss same logic what you all good uh, impairment loss is first allocated to goodwill then allocated to other assets on pro rata basis if the reversal of impairment then only to the extent had the impairment loss did not happen that's what they said uh, to the extent of impairment loss happened to that extent only you can reverse it goodwill in reversal is not allowed a reclassification also might happen if the intention changed you are no longer holding for sale then you value at lower of carrying amount or recoverable amount presentation in the balance sheets you separately disclose in p and l account also you show it separately at home also right if your useful life is over you are not fit for anything you are given always separate room you are always kept aside you are not taken for any functions you are not taken outside so you are always disclosed separately for you separate food for you separate lunch everything is separate separate uh, place to sleep so all you are kept separately so in balance sheet also here all assets and liabilities are reported separately we can say that building held for sale machinery held for sale so like that clear demarcation should be there 
Whereas in PNL accounts, you don't show them separately, you show it as one line. That is to say, in the sales you take it out, in the expenses you take it out, and whatever is the net cumulative effect, you show it as one line. Separately and cumulatively, you show it in other comprehensive income. That is regarding asset held for sale, discontinued operation, as the name suggests, it has to be discontinued. Whereas in AS25, by chance if you remember, I mean AS24, it was discontinuing operations. But it is discontinued, meaning the set of operations that you have stopped. It was there last year, this year it is not there. A significant amount of operations, maybe a component is disposed, it should represent a major line of business, part of a single coordinated plan or should be acquired with an exclusive objective to sell. Previous year these activities were there, this year the activity is not there. That is what is called as disposal of operation. You show it as single amount, that is cumulative amount, that is all the sales. Previous year those operations were there, this year that is operations is not there or partially it was there. So all those sales ex uh, items, sales value of those transactions, expenses belonging to those group, net amount you show it as profit or loss from discontinued operations. That's in line with your NDIS, I mean uh, schedule 3 also they show similar profit or loss from continued operations or profit or loss from discontinued operations and when we calculate the EPS, EPS also we should calculate accordingly. EPS based on the profit or loss from continued operations and EPS including the profit or loss from discontinued operations. Like that we should close it. Okay, so they are the major points as far as in this 105 disposal group or non-current assets sell for sale. Okay, so now that we have done with the assets related standards, liability related standards in day is 19 employee benefits. Four types of benefits are there, short term employee benefits which is basically payable within 12 months, long term payable below 12 months, post employment benefits are basically two types, defined benefit plan, defined contribution plan and termination benefits also payable after employee leaves. So how do you differentiate between post employment benefits and termination benefits? Both are payable at the time of employee leaving the organization, the difference is in post employment benefit it is planned, it was known that these benefits will be paid whereas termination benefits these are unexpected, not really planned, some compensation paid, BRS payable, those kind of things which were not expected, they are called as termination benefits. As far as short term employee benefit is concerned, there is something called as compensated absence, that is a nice name. If you are absent, you will be compensated. So, if, even if you are leave, you get paid. In article chip, if you say you leave, they will tell you you leave. You do not get any leaves. But in corporate world, you get some benefits. So, when you work for a company, you get something called as eligible leave and if you do not take in that year, maybe you can take it in the next year. You can carry forward. Uh, that is what they meant by accumulating and non-accumulating. If you cannot carry forward, it is called as non-accumulating. And non-accumulating, there is no question of any calculation as such. So, it is only regarding accumulated leaves. You, you can carry forward. Leave encashment is what we give another name. Uh, what is the logic behind this? Suppose in there are 250 days working days in a year and you are given 30 days of casual leave. And if you do not take it, you can take it in the next year. In other words, even though you are given 250 days, the employer is not expecting the benefit of 250 days. He is expecting the benefit only of 250 minus 30, 220 days. But if employee did not work for all the 30 days, that happened everything as per expectations. But if employee did not take 30 days leave, he took only 25 days, means he worked for 5 days extra for which employer did not make the payment this year, employee did not take the leave means employer got the benefit. Those days which was not expected till he worked. So when employer get the benefit, he should also recognize the corresponding expenses. 
and when will the settlement happens maybe in the next year in the form of leave encashment or maybe in the next year in the form of leave utilization so you should recognize the expense to the extent it is expected to be utilized if five leaves are carry forward don't recognize the expense for five leaves out of five leaves how much are expected to be utilized in the next year there might be some restriction on carry forward so out of five leaves or if only three leaves are expected to be utilized so only for those three leaves you should recognize the expense so in summary leave encashment or compensated absence means employer should recognize expense for carry forward leaves to the extent of it is expected to be utilized in the subsequent years so that is the expense the employer should recognize long term employer benefits basically you recognize on present value basis these two are important defined contribution plan and defined benefit plan a typical example of defined contribution plan is pf where employer provides or pays pf and that's it there is no other obligations of employer so in those cases whatever the contribution made may be in terms of pf or if you have taken an insurance policy or contribution to a fund kind of thing the amount payable will be recognized as expense by employer that's all the accounting part whereas defined the benefit plan typical example is gratuity employer takes the responsibility of two elements one on liability and the other on assets the liability responsibility is the employee may leave after 15 years but you cannot recognize the expense after 15 years because employer would have got the benefit of that work over a period of 15 years so over that 15 year period based on the estimation you have to provide the expenses provision for gratuity and that process is called as actuarial calculation and therefore we also get the actuarial certificate for such calculations so typically how the calculation would work you estimate what is likely to be the 15th year salary and we discount it by 14 years in the sense at the end of first year if i am providing and second year i'll discount it by 13 years third year i'll discount by 12 years so I, as the one year goes forward i do the present value of what is the amount expected to be paid and all that is called as current service cost how much amount expected to be paid relevant for current years of service paid later you discount it that is called as current service cost and the amount you jointly you pass is like current service cost account debit to defined benefit obligations and defined benefit obligations will go to liability side as a liability defined benefit obligation goes to pnl as expense but next year on the defined benefit obligations the interest accrues unwinding of discount happens you keep adding the interest element and that called as interest cost and subsequent period uh, there might be changes in actuarial assumptions because you are estimating the salary at the end of 15th year the growth rate might change the mortality assumptions can change so that assumptions change is it called as actuarial gain or loss or also called as remeasurement gain or loss that will be taken to oci other comprehensive income and that is also this is without recycling and sometimes the terms of the plan might change so they said initially you will get uh last year how much ever your salary 30% of that will be paid as gratuity just for example or some superannuation after some year they say it is not going to be 30% it is going to be 35% so every year you recognize proportionately on 30% basis suddenly 32% will be payable so the 2% extra payable for the work already done for the work already completed you recognize the incremental amount and that is called as the past service cost effect of curtailment or retailment uh, uh, settlement means uh, the employee might leave during certain period or there might be a merger demerger happening so even though liability expected to be paid after 17th year let's say but liability actually may be paid only in the 14th year 15th year 
So in those cases, the liability will come down. That is called the effect of curtailment. So this is the liability risk obtained by the employer. It's called as actuarial risk, the liability risk of employer. And not only that, he also takes care of the investment risk. Investment risk means when employee comes after 20 years of service, the employer cannot give a shocking look. You are leaving now, I don't have money. 20 years is a big number. It is the responsibility of the employer to save the money every year and when employer employee leaves, the money should be payable. So the planning should happen and that is why it is called as planned assets. Maybe in the form of shares, mutual funds or any insurance policies or any other investments or can be even a fixed deposit or cash balance. And initially you take one expected return with the rate of return and interest rate, we usually take it as same thing. But in the year end, the market value of the asset and book value of the asset may be different. And the difference is called as the actuarial gain or loss. So this actuarial gain or loss will go to OCI and that is without recycling. Whereas all other elements that are interest cost, current service cost are all called as, uh, are all going towards regular p and L. Yeah, that would be the brief summary of in the S19. Okay, so in days 37, con uh, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. The number is also easy to remember because in income tax it is section 37, which allows general expenses. So general liability in accounts is in the S37. It talks about broadly three or four elements, provisions, contingent liability and contingent assets. But first of all, look at the definition of liability. Liability is a present obligation as a result of past events resulting in outflow of resources. The present obligation may be legal or may be constructive. Provision for tax may be legal obligation and payment of bonus. You have a customary practice of payment of bonus, so that becomes constructive obligation. Or if there is a, a case against you, a strike against the company that you are contaminating the environment, and you accept telling that I will get the things right within the next three years. There was no legal commitment, there was no contractual commitment, but you have given the acceptance. That is a constructive obligation, basically arising out of customary uh, practices arising from past events and liability means it should be having outflow of sources. So how would you say it's a provision? Provision is a liability, but there is an uncertain element, uncertain timing or uncertain amount. Provision for guarantee or warranties, where amount is uncertain. Provision for tax, we have to pay, but we don't know how much it is. Leave for leave encashment. The provision for gratuity. We have to make a payment, but exactly how we don't know how much amount to be paid. So there is an uncertainty in timing or uncertainty in the amount. That is regarding provision. But provision also has to be a present obligation only. What is contingent liability? Contingent liability popularly understood or explained by students as which may or may not happen like our C exam may or November happen. The results comes continuously. We don't use the word may or may not happen. It is a possible obligation, meaning it is depending on an uncertain event, occurrence or non-occurrence. The case going on in the court, if you lose the case, you may have to make the payment, uncertainty. Or it's a present obligation, but you don't have a reliable measurement of cost. You know that you are going to make a payment, but you don't have a mechanism to estimate how much it is. In that case, at least you will disclose, telling that entity is likely to make a payment, but the exact amount could not be quantified. So you have to make a disclosure like that. So when there is a likely to make a payment, but the amount cannot be estimated, that is also will be a contingent liability. But the word to be remembered for liability, it is present obligation. For contingent liability, it's possible obligation. And if you compare the definition of asset and liabilities, they are opposite. Asset is also a res uh, result of past events, liability also result of past events, 
in asset there is probable economic benefits inflow and in liability probable economic benefits outflow outflow to embodying economic benefits and asset is a resource control whereas liability is an obligation and the same definition you will see in financial asset financial liability also financial asset is right to receive cash whereas financial liability is obligation to pay cash so you you see the similar characteristics terminology used in different cases okay uh, what is to be kept in mind is it does not apply to executory contracts executory contracts means neither party has not performed or both the parties have equally performed so you sign into an agreement to purchase the raw material on a monthly basis for next 5 years and when you purchase the raw material you will make the payment for the beginning inception should i recognize next 5 years liability a contract signed in the answer is no not required because you have not purchased raw materials you have not paid any amount neither of the party has performed so they are called as executory contract executory to be executed that is to be transacted so those contracts are not Uh, considered in this standard if it is having some financial liability impact you may take it in indias 32109 financial instruments that is like a forward contract entered and it is considered as derivative liability so fair value change you account you consider under indias financial instruments not under indias 37 but except onerous contracts So executory contracts are onerous contracts, even though they are executory. Still, you consider. So it's a double exception. Executory contracts are exception, and excepting onerous contracts. So for onerous contract, in this thirty-seven applies. So what is that onerous contracts? You can see it later. Onerous contract where there is unavoidable cost, which exceeds the benefits. so you have signed the contract to fulfill let's say to deliver goods at a certain price at let's say 10 rupees and if you don't deliver you have to pay a penalty of 50000 and if you want to fulfill the contract you may have to purchase on the market and sell at a loss and if you don't satisfy you have to pay penalty unavoidable cost exceeding the benefits that is onerous contracts you signed an agreement but you can't avoid so that is you are called as onerous contracts obligation i told you and when it is a possible obligation it becomes a contingent liability when it is a present obligation it becomes a liability if the amount is certain it is liability if amount is uncertain it is provision if the uh, possible obligation but outflow is remote it is a possible obligation so a possible obligation means it is a contingent liability but the chances the remote the probability is very very less in those cases you are not even required to be disclosed if the chances are very very less of making the payment measurement on best estimate basis you do the present value wherever applicable you can do a, a consider also risk and uncertainties that is basically using your expected value method probability method Uh, reimbursement can be considered only when it is virtually certain reimbursement means uh, you are a intermediary uh, you have to compensate the customer for any losses and you recover that money from the manufacturers so the obligation to make the payment to the customer becomes your contingent liability and if you have to make a payment then you may recover that from the manufacturer but that is still uncertain you may recover you may not recover so that becomes the contingent only when it becomes virtually certain you recognize until then you may call that as contingent assets uh, restructuring means uh, you are planning to reconstruct you are planning to make changes in your organization so those plans regarding restructuring modifications they are not to be considered you are like i will revamp my entire business i will do the product completely differently for that i'm going to incur some expenses the restructuring plans are not accounted the constructive obligation comes only when there is a detailed plan and you have signed commitments but otherwise restructuring are not accounted okay contingent assets means possible assets so if you file a case against somebody else 
and the possibility of recovering the money they are called as it's like possible obligation for liabilities possible assets are called as contingent assets more importantly they are also disclosed contingent liabilities disclosed contingent assets are also disclosed and when they become virtually certain meaning you know that you are going to recognize that money for sure then you can recognize in the books of accounts as receivables or money received from that point no longer you call it as contingent so those are the important points in india's Okay, so the theory part we can take it now in day S12. Uh, subsequent ones maybe we can take it after the break. In day S12, income tax, popularly called as deferred tax, for most people somehow this standard is not comfortable. Somehow again for me this is the most favorite standard because this is for me is not a standard. This is a philosophy of life. So if you are suffering, it means that deferred tax asset is getting created. Temporary difference, you will enjoy it later. If you are enjoying now, it means deferred tax liability is getting created. So be always aware of such facts when you are enjoying or when you are suffering. You always compare, no? At this stage of your life. We are. Uh, we don't know what is happening to our life seriously. That we are writing the exams. You go to the office. Are you an employee? Are you a student? Are you in a youth or not? Are you in middle youth? You have no idea about your position. You can't even explain what is your Facebook status. Everywhere, the only one common word is complicated. Where your friends, especially who are not from science ba um, commerce background, would be from science background, where they have done, do, were doing engineering. You are doing CA. They finished engineering. You are doing CA. They joined job. You are doing CA. They had marriage. You are doing CA. Their children. You are doing CA. The children going for school. You are doing still CA. So that our issue is like what is really happening to our life. If you compare yourself, I will say only one word. It's a temporary difference. It will be reversed at some time or the another, and your suffering means a deferred tax asset is getting created. So due to differences between the income tax provisions and accounting treatment the deferred tax will come into picture and to balance that to uh, adjust the differences we create either deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability the so two terms are there one is current tax other is deferred tax so this is the standard which converts income tax provision into an expense the income tax provision is on cash system of accounting how much income tax likely to be paid i would like to report that as my expense whereas we say that it is not about what you are paying as per income tax it's about what you are showing in your books of accounts you may pay tax later but in the books of accounts you are showing the income this year so its tax incidence also should be reflected in current year so we are moving from tax provision into a tax expense moving from cash system of accounting into accrual system of accounting the bridge between cash to accrual the bridge between provision to an expense is the deferred tax that's why uh, tax expense is what we use the term we don't call it as tax provision we use the word tax expense and tax expense comprising of two terms current tax primarily on tax provisions and deferred tax because of the incidents which will come in the future years uh, basically arising temporary difference between accounting income and taxable income the deferred tax arising because of the differences okay so as far as the standard is concerned they don't follow income approach unlike as21 they follow balance sheet approach so they calculate the difference between the assets and liabilities as per income tax and as per books of accounts as per income tax they use the word tax base and as per books of accounts they use the word 
carrying amount and therefore if i find out the tax base and carrying amount the difference it would be called as uh, it would be a uh, deferred tax closing balance asset or liability and not for the year so we always follow most of the places in uh, in the sifrs the cumulative catch up approach balance sheet approach we calculate the closing balance we subtract the opening balance the difference becomes current year expense so how do you calculate this tax base for example if you have purchased the machinery for 1 lakh for income tax purposes you provide 90000 as depreciation so only 10000 remaining that is called as tax base whereas in books of accounts you depreciate over 4 years so 1 lakh minus 25000 the 75000 becomes the carrying amount so 90000 income tax base and carrying amount 75000 and what if there are things such as section 43b interest to financial institutions be uh, allowed only on payment basis if you are not paid in books of accounts you have recognized as accrual so as per carrying amount you will reflect the interest amount outstanding interest whereas as far as taxation is concerned it is not allowed so the tax base corresponding to that becomes zero there might be other situations such as preliminary expenses is been written off to p and l account immediately but for income tax purposes it is recognized over a period of maybe five installment if the amount is 1 lakh entire amount has been taken to p and l so in the balance sheet that amount becomes zero preliminary expenses is zero as far as accounting is concerned whereas income tax purposes it is not allowed immediately so out of 1 lakh only 20000 is taken to pnl for income tax 80000 what is still to be amortized that is called as the tax base of assets from the indias calculation point of that is regarding the tax base uh, tax expense yeah current tax is based on the tax provision and deferred tax is on difference between the carrying amount and tax base so uh, this when to create deferred tax asset when to create deferred tax liability can be slightly confusing i'll try my level best to simplify that when the you you try to think from tax base point of view so if tax base of the asset is 1 lakh but carrying amount of the asset is 80000 so the asset tax base is higher so you create the for tax asset if the benefit is there you create asset if benefit is not there you create liability and think only from the tax base point of view so tax base of the asset is higher meaning benefit get to be received or asset is higher as simple as this tax base of the asset higher the tax asset you create a for tax asset whereas if tax base of liability is higher that means your benefit is not there the tax base liability is higher so you create deferred tax liability so think only from the tax base point of view if the asset is higher you create deferred tax asset the tax base asset is less you create deferred tax liability think from tax base would be the shortcut i can suggest and one more suggestion is uh, think about the nature of element is the income you are paying now or in the means am i getting the tax benefit now or am i getting the tax benefit later so revaluation loss or revaluation profit let's say so revaluation profit means i'm making a profit but i'm not paying tax so it is going to be a deferred tax liability so if the if there is likely to be payment of tax you create deferred tax liability if there is likely to be adjustment reduction of tax you create a deferred tax asset so either think from the tax base point of view is one method or you think as am i going to pay tax or am i going to pay less tax so they use the word uh, deductible difference and temporary dif uh, taxable difference taxable means i'm going to pay tax therefore i end up in creating deferred tax liability deductible means i will reduce my income and therefore i'm going to create a deferred tax asset and in in one year the difference is getting created and another year the difference is getting adjusted so if it is interest allowed on uh, payment basis 
in first year where interest is just a provision you create deferred tax asset and next year when you make a interest payment then the deferred tax asset will be reversed if it is not getting reversed it is not it is called as permanent difference and for that we don't create the deferred tax one small question i will ask if we make profits we pay tax to government if you make loss government should pay tax to us i don't know why you are laughing or why you are looking at me like something happened to this person the logical aspect has been completely taken away from our mind and our brain is washed to that extent i think how can government pay tax why not we are paying the tax to government as a share of profit treating the government like a partner 30% partner government even though government does nothing for its obligation okay we are paying as a partner if you make a loss as a responsible partner they have to take a share of loss you can't say share only profits that is not a minor partner sharing only profits and not losses it's completely logical and government also accepts but the government says if i pay tax it does not look nice next year when you pay the profit on that you pay tax adjust this and pay me only the balance which is called as carry forward and set off so if there is a loss on that loss also you have to create a deferred tax asset logical way of understanding i should get this tax back from government the real way of understanding this benefit will come not in the form of cash but in the form of reduction in my future tax liabilities and this is what is applicable for all deferred tax assets so the difference of deferred tax asset i am creating i will not get the cash from the government but i will get in the form of adjustment of liability in the future years and therefore you can create deferred tax asset only when there is sufficient expectation of taxable temporary difference because it is a deferred tax asset realized not in the form of cash inflow but only in the form of set off so for that purpose exception to deferred tax if it is uh, on goodwill the problem with goodwill if you create a deferred tax what would happen is good uh, goodwill is difference between net assets taken over and fair value or the purchase consideration so the difference between these two you goodwill on goodwill you create deferred tax when deferred tax comes net assets change again when net assets changes goodwill will change again goodwill changes deferred tax will change again net assets so it goes in a circular calculation that's why on goodwill we don't create a deferred tax asset or liability for that matter so also other cases are there let me not go into that issues you will review especially for deferred tax assets because when you create deferred tax asset you are reducing your loss so now if i ask you the question why you is in deep trouble they are suffering losses so can they create deferred tax asset logically they should create deferred tax asset but practically that asset can be realized only if there are future profits and future profits will happen only if they are alive first the company is into operations so uh, that is what we have to review every year if you have created a tax asset is the deductible temporary difference having any changes in circumstances if yes you may have to transfer the difference to the p and l account that is what is called as impairment of deferred tax asset discounting we don't do it we also if you have deferred tax asset as well as deferred tax liability then you may have to set off you most probably will set off and as per the standard when the entity has legal right to set off usually we will set off but if you create a deferred tax asset on indian income tax and liability on us tax you can't set it off you can't tell the government you go and collect from the other government so we have to show separate assets and liability uh, one small point i would like to revisit on the tax rate either for defer tax or even for current tax the tax rate is when it is enacted or 
substantively enacted in the sense if you are preparing for the financial year 31st march 2024 and in the month of february budget change the tax rates but this will be approved only in the month of maybe april so can i still take it it is not enacted because only in the month of april the budget will become final act but it is substantially enacted you have the information so as on 31st of march only you can take the revised rate but if the year ending is not march if the year ending is december in those cases as on december end it is neither enacted nor substantially enacted only in the month of february the change in rates came so those things are not considered in the year if it is march year end those rates will be considered and again how the approaches of the deferred tax liability will be there it is difference between the tax base the carrying amount and tax base and the difference amount you multiplied by the tax rate and the resultant what you got is the closing balance of deferred tax asset or liability and you compare with the opening balance and the difference only you take it to p and l account and also you should keep it in mind you should take it in the respective places so wherever the corresponding incomes are disclosed the tax impact also should go there for example if you are recognizing fair value through oci as gain fair value gain and you are taking it in other comprehensive income the tax impact also should be shown in other comprehensive income if you show revaluation reserve again taken in oci not taken in PNL account the corresponding tax impact also will come in OCI and some element you may directly consider only in retained earnings that is if you are having something like uh, uh, you are selling the asset so it is without reclassification you may directly take it from the OCI to the retained earnings so if you are taking any element directly in retained earnings its tax impact also should be shown directly over there and it should not be shown in the P and L account, or you will have something like buyback. So when company does buyback, you have to pay buyback tax in India, and that buyback is not an expenses should be shown in P and L account. Buyback any amount paid excess will be adjusted from reserves and shown only in the notes to accounts. But you have to pay buyback tax. You have to pay. You have to show those tax impact only in the balance sheet and not in the P and L account. So corresponding places income, the tax also should be shown. So basically, wherever income goes, the tax will follow it. If somebody asks you for a tax advice, how to reduce income tax? Simple advice, reduce your income. Tax will reduce automatically. That is not the advice given by me. I think our finance minister only gave this advice someplace. You can also give it. So from that onwards, nobody will ask you for a free advice at least. Typically, when you say you are a CA or even CA student, typical question asked is uh, how to reduce income tax. I also gave thousands of answer invest in life insurance take housing loan take insurance then invest in mutual funds nothing was popular then i started telling if you want to reduce income tax and reduce your income from that day onwards they don't speak to me very properly there so if you want to avoid people you can use this wherever income goes there the tax also goes okay so this is the brief summary of in this well, income tax or deferred tax. So next standard, in days 21, foreign currency transactions. So in AS 11, you had two types of currencies. One is home currency, foreign currency, or reporting currency, foreign currency. Whereas under India's 21, apart from reporting and foreign, we also have one more called as functional currency. So functional currency, reporting currency are normally same because the way we transact is in rupees, we prepare balance sheet also in rupees. But due to some nature, they call it as uh, the economic environment primary economic environment in which the entity operates even though the transaction may happen in rupees but they are primarily 
influenced only by another currency there will be some people also you would have come across who will be living in india or who will be living in respective state but they never watch regional movies they never go to the in, within india for you know even for travel they always go outside all the uh, clothes they buy is also outside all the english movies only they see series also only that only have netflix so they don't have any connection with respect to the local environment in which they are living is concerned so they are always influenced or they are under the influence of other countries so their functional currency is that respective currency companies also can happen like that they may come to india they may have established here but their primary decisions are taken by people sitting outside india or their loan is from outside india they manufacture here but they export it to let's say some other countries so in india they are there only for having the legal presence but in substance their transactions are influenced by other currency they are called as functional currency primary economic environment that is a keyword in which entity primarily operates uh, so two terms you have to keep it in mind monetary items and non monetary items monetary items means which are fixed or determinable amount like debtors bill receivables like that non monetary items means which are not fixed the amount is not a particular number for example inventory investments uh, reserves and surplus where you can't say this is the specific amount those are called as non monetary item uh, fixed assets becomes non monetary intangible assets becomes non monetary inventory is non monetary provisions liabilities there as creditors debtors bank balance bill receivables advances they become monetary items where amount is fixed or determinable amount okay as far as conversion rules are concerned monetary items are always translated at closing rate like for example if you have sold goods to a customer in us when you sold the goods exchange rate was 80 at the year end it became 82 so 2 rupee is the exchange rate fluctuation belonging to debtors that you have to do it and the difference has to be taken to pnl account monetary items non monetary items such as if you have a asset building in foreign current country it always be translated at historical rate you are not going to take the closing rate but if the asset is revaluation model then you have to take the closing rates only then you can't take the historical rate because if you follow revaluation model you the latest rates are relevant latest price you take so latest conversion rate also you have to take so if it is under cost model you should take the historical rate if it is under revaluation model the price also latest the exchange rate also will be the closing rate if the asset is maintained on revaluation model like fixed assets building difference taken to pnl revenue and uh, expenses are on average rates if the functional currency and uh, presentation currencies are different that means there has to be a two step approach from functional foreign to functional and then from functional to presentation so from functional to foreign that would remain same that is as it is like the previous one but you have for only for the purpose of presentation you convert from functional into presentation that is you are country com companies in india your primary economic currency is dollars so all the transactions reporting will happen in dollars but when you come to the balance sheet because you are in india you convert it to rupee purpose the conversion is only for preparation of balance sheet otherwise it is not relevant in any of your transaction or decision making only for preparing financial statements in those cases you convert monetary non monetary everything at closing rate and the difference you don't take it to pnl the difference you take it to oci other comprehensive income uh foreign currency transactions functional currency yeah it is uh, again same thing has been expanded here that summary i had given in earlier if it is investment in uh, foreign entities that is if you have a foreign subsidiary 
foreign joint venture for example if a foreign subsidiary initially you would have recognized goodwill or nci whichever method you follow all those things will be recognized on foreign currency only and at the year end for example goodwill and all will be converted on closing rates so translation of foreign operations will happen at closing rate and the difference will be transferred to an account called as fctr foreign currency translation reserve and that will be uh, de recognized in the year in which uh, the, the, the foreign operations are sold and it will be reclassified into pnl account so translation foreign operations in consolidated financial statements we will be showing it in oci foreign currency translation reserve but when you sell on disposal of subsidiary that fctr will be reclassified into pnl account it is with reclassification recycling with recycling okay those are the points which are relevant foreign operations i mean beyond that you don't have to very much uh, the conversion rates you remember when to apply which one and uh, monetary items non monetary items that you be aware of it the exchange rate for foreign uh, operations that is foreign subsidiary you close you transfer at closing rate and exchange different goes to fctr not to pnl immediately when the subsidiary is sold only then that fctr will hit the pnl account so this much you remember that is sufficient on in day s21 Okay, so let's start the next one. In the S24, related party transactions. Broadly, three terms to understand: control, joint control, significant influence, which you already seen during consolidation. Same thing applies. Control means ability to have the power to control. Joint means multiple parties in course of contract arrangement. Significant influence means you are having impact. power to participate in decision making or policy making if these three elements are there then only we call it as uh, related party what are different kinds of related parties it might be a person or it might be an entity so who is a related party as a person means who has these three what we discussed who has control joint control significant influence if you have more than 50% or you together another person from a joint venture then you are having joint control or you are having more than 20% we say significant influence key management personnel kmp key management personnel means who have the authority responsibilities of planning directing controlling the activities of the organization primarily you can call them as directors so directors are called as key management personnel so member of kmp so it need not be kmp need not be a person it can also be a status in the sense it can be group of two three people who decides the authority like when you say board of directors we call them as key management personnel so kmp need not be individual one person it can be set of people and that is why it is called as member of kmp of reporting entity or even parent entity so if you're talking about ex holding company and subsidiary company from subsidiary company point of view subsidiary companies kmps are related even the holding companies kmps are also related because they also can take the decisions for that purpose close family member so they don't use the word relative they use the word close family member who are expected to influence such as children spouse domestic partner then brother sister father mother okay then children of the person spouse or domestic partner maybe you can uh, quickly remember on these lines if you talk about the person then 
the person's children or the spouse or domestic partner on the left side you can say brother sister on top father mother and children from the spouse or children from the domestic partner and or anybody else dependents so these are called as related party now uh, close members uh, yeah so this is the family tree or if you want to call it for a person so you try to imagine this so top father mother below children's left brother sister then spouse then spouse children domestic partners children so these are common in western countries so that's how they have included these kind of things because there it is very common to say my child and your child is playing with our child so children's and spouse children and domestic partner children's children's play area there those things are common so those terminologies are used okay so back to this so that is regarding a person individual person then regarding entities meaning companies so which are members of the same group uh, members of the same group means uh, it has to be holding subsidiary when i say group i only include holding subsidiary here so holding company subsidiary company fellow subsidiary ultimate holding company the lowest subsidiary company any of those any combination of the holding subsidiary are called as members of the same group then uh, associate and joint venture so they are related so associate investor joint venture investor but those associate and joint venture need not be related that depends maybe we'll see that later joint venture of the same third party so a person has invested in uh, one joint venture and invested in another joint venture so those cases then these joint venture also are related joint venture of the same third party or joint venture and associate of third party so you are having joint venture joint control in one and associate in another and that means they are also being related because it is being influenced by same common person for that purpose joint venture and associate of third party controlled or jointly controlled by same person significant influence by KMP in another or entity providing KMP service either to a reporting entity or to the parent of a reporting entity. To summarize this, so many combinations, what you can remember is this maybe. So, reporting entity, associate, joint venture, subsidiary they are related and the holding company so if you take uh, one company in between its holding company its subsidiary is associated joint venture they are normally related and their kmp is also related but you can also be related through a common person or a common entity so you remember like this these two reporting entity x limited y limited are related through a common person if there is control at least in one place so what are the different permutation combinations can happen the same person is having control in one and control in another or joint control in one and control in another so various permutation combination can happen in all these combinations entities are related exception being they are not related if in both the cases there are significant influence in the sense if the person has control in both the entities those entity become related you are having control in one joint control in another again entities are related control in one and another way we have only significant influence another one is associate they are, they are again related joint control in one and another one also joint control that is what we meant here the joint venture of the same part third party like that then they are also related joint venture associate are also related so what is not related is 
you are having significant influence in one entity and in another entity also you are having significant influence through so significant influence you cannot control both the entities so those two entities are not forcefully connected so that's the only one you can remember and you can also say what if if you are kmp in one and significant influence in another kmp also you can remember it as it is equivalent to having significant influence if you are kmp in both the companies you are not, those entities are not related kmp means directors so if a director is there in company a and if he is a director in company b then those two are not called as related entities both kmp also not related so in both cases you are having that common directorship you are not called the companies are not related or you are having kmp in one and you are having just 15% or 23 percent significantly influence in another again those entities are not related entities so any other set of permutation combination you can say that they are related entities so in those cases the one which i showed it to you this one Only point you have to keep in mind is this one line. That's all. They are not related in both the entities if he is having significant influence. In all other situations, they are said to companies are said to be related. Okay, so let's go back to that chart quickly. Let's look at the important points from exam point of view. Disclosures, category 1, category 2. Category 1, when it is holding subsidiary, even if there are no transactions, you still have to disclose the relationship. Whereas in other cases, you disclose only when there are related party transactions. If it is compensation to KMP, one set of disclosures are there because they are individuals. You can give them share based payments and all for that purpose, and remaining will come under another category. Uh, okay, you have to report the name of the parent, ultimate controlling authority. Uh, if it is KMP, you should disclose all four types of employee benefits, what we discussed in index 19, plus the share based payments also should be disclosed. This is the disclosure applicable for KMP as a related party. In all other cases, you have to disclose the nature of the relationship, amount of transactions, any outstanding balances, even commitments like guarantee given, provision for doubtful debts, especially provision for doubtful debts because you keep selling with related parties but you don't collect the money. So the provisions becomes more important. And also how much amount for long it's outstanding and all and this should be divided this into parent subsidiary associate kind of uh, segregation and if it is items of similar nature may be disclosed so if there are hundreds of purchases of same units you need not write hundred transaction you can club them and say that this raw material purchased amounting to so much during the year similar transactions may be combined yeah, they are the major aspects of India's 24. Okay, great. Okay, next standard, India's 33, earnings per share. Uh, broadly, there are three types of EPS, I would say, basic EPS, adjusted EPS, and dilutive EPS. It is like three tenses. Present tense, past tense, and future tense. Basic is for the current financial year. 
adjusted eps is it is for the previous year but restated in the current year so it is a past historical and potential is what is likely to happen in the future because of elements such as convertible bond and how do we calculate the eps basic eps is ea tsh earnings available to equity shareholders so you have to subtract even preferential dividend divided by number of shares and number of shares has to be weighted average number of shares if there are things such as uh, partly paid up shares you should take the equivalent number of shares if the shares are issued during the year you should take proportionately equivalent number of shares from the date of issue uh, if without change in capital such as bonus shares stock split for them we are going to consider from the beginning of the period and not from the date of issue because bonus shares and all will not give any additional capital to the company it is just a nominal value change in those cases it is considered as if it is issued on the first day uh, adjusted eps will be applicable in situation of bonus right share stock split so when the bonus shares are issued higher number of shares will come into picture and if you do that the picture of comparison of current year and previous year will not be appropriate so for the purpose of comparison to facilitate better comparison the bonus shares issued during the year is considered as if it is considered issued on the first day of the previous years so while calculating the comparative eps we will calculate the net profit of previous year and divide it by number of shares even after issuing the bonus shares and only the comparison is more proper that is the reason so basic eps is being adjusted dilute eps is also being adjusted contingent issuable shares meaning upon satisfying certain conditions the shares will be issued like in case of business combination it may be like if you uh, uh, reach profit of or sales turnover of certain number within 3 months uh, 500 shares will be issued and another 3 months if you achieve some profit another 100 shares will be issued so contingent depending on uncertain event if the conditions are satisfied it is included in basic eps if the conditions are not satisfied then it is included in potential eps therefore it is included in dilutive eps uh, dilutive eps is calculated by computing dilutive effect and what is the meaning of dilutive effect only if there is a possibility the eps could go down if it is possibility of eps increasing that is not being reported that is called as anti dilutive eps now how do we know whether it is uh, dilutive in nature or not we calculate something called as incremental eps in which situation this dilutive eps would apply for example convertible debentures if they are converted then debenture interest no longer will be paid so to, to that extent your profit will increase but when debenture becomes shares the number of shares also will increase so if you look at the formula net profit divided by number of shares net profit will increase denominator number of shares also will increase so as a result we don't know whether overall eps will decrease or not for that purpose we calculate something called as incremental eps so incremental profits in case of debentures it is interest saved and multiplied by 1 minus tax rate after tax and incremental shares that is number of shares to be issued to those debenture holder if debentures are converted <clears throat> and only if incremental eps is less than basic eps then only it is called as dilutive eps and please keep it in mind while calculating this if the interest saved for example is proportionate amount for example it is during the year on 1st of january convertible debentures are issued so interest expense would have taken only for 3 months in that case the number of shares also you should take the same weight proportionate 3 by 12 whatever the incremental profits you allocate the same thing you would apply here also uh sometimes you might have uh, multiple convertible debentures convertible preference shares and right shares so you are having uh, 
so many potential shares so then there is you have to decide what is the order in which you have to consider the dilutive eps so you have to consider them only if they are dilutive in nature so how do you decide whether they are dilutive or not by calculating the incremental eps for each one of them you calculate separately for convertible preference shares what is incremental eps for convertible debenture what is incremental eps for maybe options what is incremental eps then you rank order them the rank order from uh, least to highest meaning the lowest uh, incremental eps means it will reduce the eps so lowest will get the first rank next lowest will get the second rank and next is the third rank and so on and you start adding one by one you take the fun unit you calculate the eps then you calculate the next uh, element you calculate the eps the moment that eps starts increasing we stop at the previous step because the moment eps starts increasing that is anti dilutive in nature that would be the overall summary of that eps to be kept in mind there is uh, right shares also there but i don't know whether they will ask the right shares element in examination maybe quickly i will give you the steps i don't have numericals but i'll just discuss the steps at least so if there are right shares So bonus shares i told you already it is considered from the first day of the issue for current year as well as for previous year that is for adjusted eps for right shares we have to compute first theoretical x right price x right is excluding the right price basically means after the issue of rights this is calculated by existing number of shares multiplied by existing fair value plus right shares multiplied by issue price right price existing number of shares into existing fair value plus right shares into issue price basically numerator will tell you what is the overall market value of the company divided by total number of shares that is existing shares plus right shares existing shares plus right shares so this will give you theoretical x right price theoretical x right price means what is supposed to be the value of the share after issue of rights then we calculate an adjusting factor or some people call it as correction factor adjusting factor is the existing fair value basically before issue of rights existing fair value meaning this number whatever we have taken in the numerator divided by theoretical x right price so basically if the answer is like 1.02 it represent that 0.02 is the bonus element so how are we going to make use of it for calculating uh, basic eps meaning for current financial year and how do we calculate for uh, adjusted eps I mean, i'll say for basic eps and for adjusted eps i'll do the first thing for adjusted eps is very simple 
for adjust dps you take existing shares multiplied by adjusting factor if existing shares of 5 lakh if adjusting factor is 1.02 you do 5 lakh into 1.02 For basic EPS, you have to be a little trickier. You have to calculate in two parts up to right issue and after right issue. Up to right issue, you calculate by existing shares multiplied by adjusting factor multiplied by number of months up to the right issue existing shares into adjusting factor into number of months like if the right shares issued on 1st of July then this number of months will be 3 by 12 of April, May, June plus after right issue that is total number of shares so existing plus right shares existing plus right shares into adjusting factor will not come into n by 12 existing shares plus right shares existing shares plus right shares into number of months by 12 adjusting factor will not come or if I tell in one simple words adjusting factor is applicable up to the date of right issue in the current year also in previous year also up to the date of right issue the adjusting factor is there and adjusting factor basically representing the bonus element being involved. Yeah, and the numerator existing uh, FE is fair value. Fair value is the market price before issue of uh, rights. You can also be more specific. You can say existing fair value is price of share before rights. Price of shares before rights. That's, that they can they can also call it as fair value before issue of rights. Basically, this is come rights. If you purchase the share at this price, this includes the value of rights. And here, what you're calculating is excluding the value of rights. So basically, difference between these two is also called as the value of rights, which may be asked in AFM also. Okay, so that is a summary of in days 33 earnings per share. Okay, in days 108 operating segments. This is the last standard, of course, before that in days 101, otherwise, it is the last standard. So by this time you are ready to be admitted to the hospital. So we have to call 108. So in days 108 is the operating segments. So operating segment means a component of an entity which can earn revenues and expenses regularly reviewed by CODM, that is chief operating decision maker, and discrete financial information is available. All the three conditions should be satisfied. It can earn revenue independently and internally reviewed by the entity as separate segment and you should have discrete financial information means revenue how much pnl balance sheet asset liabilities attributable you should be able to segregate and prepare a independent balance sheet that is when you are going to classify it as operating segments for you to call it as reportable segments you should remember these categories if you satisfy even one of these points, it becomes a reportable segments. If it is 10% or more of the total revenue, 
revenue of the entity is 1000 crores and the uh, segment is 150 crores. So 150 by 1000 is 15 percent, more than 10 percent. The segment becomes reportable. Or similarly, 10 percent of assets, then also you are reportable. Or 10 percent of profit or loss. So there are situations where some segments make profits and some segments make losses. So in those cases, you do profit segment separately and loss segment separately and ignore the minus signs, which we call it as absolute. Then you take whichever is higher and of that you should take 10%. So for example purpose, if you have like segment A has like 300, segment B has like minus 700, segment C has 500, segment D has something like 200. The loss segment you take separately, so that is 700 and profit segment that is A, C and D. So loss segment is 700, profit segment is 1000, that is 500, 300 and 200. So whichever is higher, that is 700 and that person becomes, uh, so 1000 is higher, so 1010% is so anything is more than 100 becomes reportable. So 300 is more, 400 is also more, 200 is also more. As far as loss segment is concerned, I should not take minus 700, I should take the absolute number, 100. So that is also becoming reportable segment. Uh, next point is, after doing these three steps, the reportable segments must have contributed at least 75% of segment uh, revenue contributing to the external customers without considering the internal sales. So meaning if uh, segment A is having let's say 65% and B is having 8%, C is having 8%, D is having uh, let's say this is 7 so 15, 55, so another 8, let's say this is 60, another 7. So this is the percentage of contribution of revenue. Segment A is definitely reportable segment. It is having more than 10%. B, C, D, they are all below 10%. They are not reportable segments. However, if you come to this, somehow you have to reach 75%. Which segments to include that is left to the choice of the management. You may say it is uh, B and C, so 8 and 7 becomes 15. You may say D and E, B and D, C and E, any combination or you can say B, C, D. You have to include the segments such a way that at least 75% of the revenue must be part of revenue segment revenue reporting. Which segments to include to make that happen? That is a management discretion. And if it is reportable in the previous year, due to these conditions, it becomes reportable in the current year. And if the management decides that this segment is relevant, important, then it is going to be reported. These are all minimum consideration. Beyond that, entity can always disclose more segments. These are just the minimum criteria thresholds to be classified as reportable segments. Okay, what are the information to be provided? You should provide general information like what are the type of product, where is physically situated, have you aggregated, combined any uh, segments. Segment information that is revenue, expenses, reconciliation that is what is the segment revenue and what is the enterprise revenue, the difference if any. You have to provide the reconciliation, same thing for segment assets, segment liabilities and also provide entity wise assets liabilities and then you provide any reconciliation. So this is the brief summary of NDS 108. Again, easy to explain theoretically. Practically an exam to prepare this, it has its own lot of judgmental uh, issues. Okay, that is the brief summary of NDS 108. Okay, so NDS 101. First time adoption of NDS. So, if you are adopting the NDS for the first time, 
you should come to index 101 but practically you should come to index 101 the last because no point in starting with this only if you know what does index will tell and this if we tell you can do differently it makes sense so just because the word is first time does not mean you have to go and do it on the first time so primarily index says any changes you make in financial statements should be retrospective in nature that is a general principle adopted in index but whereas in index 101 they provide some relaxations some are mandatory some are optional first time index is applicable for the first index financial statements from the date of transition and the transition we always take it as two years back so if the first statement is 31st March 23, then 1st of April 2021 is the date of transition. The reason being, what is the format, especially in your uh, balance sheet, retained earnings, we would always give you opening balance, then the changes, closing balance. So 31st March 23 means the opening balance would be 1st of April. 22 but the comparative also i provide for the year 31st march 22 the opening balance would have been 1st of april 2021 so any balance sheet pnl financial statement effectively contains the data of two financial years and therefore if you're preparing 31st march 23 as the first in the years two years back becomes date of transition the general rule is retrospective now we are having some exceptions, mandatory exceptions and optional exemptions. Let's focus only on the main elements. Let's not go too much in depth into it. Estimation by previous gap. In the sense, when we made the estimation at that point in time, that is basically two years gap, now we are re-estimating, now we know the actual amount. But you should not do the actual amount, you should continue to show the estimates as it is. The recognition of financial asset and financial liability of past transactions. Like for example, uh, as far as uh, in this concern, financial liability derivative and all to be accounted. So two years back, some derivative was there, go back and account. Five years back, we purchased some derivative for futures not required to be accounted. It is not required, it should not be accounted. Hedge accounting, you measured fair value. NCI recognition, that is, uh, you know, NCI as per index AS will be varying. Like NCI may be valued on fair value method. And uh, you also account for a lot of fair value adjustments. Like even contingent liabilities are recognized, things like that. So NCI, we are not going to account for the previous amounts. From the date of acquisition, that is date of transition, we account prospectively. Financial assets on the transition date prospectively. Impairment you can do provided if the data is available. Embedded derivative provided data is available. Government loan we account prospectively. Optional exemptions. Business combination may be taken from the transition date. That is uh once you start applying indias you have to do indias but let's say 31st march 23 you are preparing current financial year but before transition or just after transition there is a business combination accounted as per as 14 you can continue that but if you elect to go for indias then from that point onwards you have to continue to go for indias 103 you can't go to as 14 insurance contract don't worry share based payment if you are recognizing as per previous gap to the extent vested meaning to the extent conditions satisfied to the extent expenses are already recognized you continue the previous amount you don't have to change to the new one but unvested means you start applying in the yes this is important deemed cost for ppe and intangible assets. So there are three ways in which you can calculate the cost of PP on the date of transition. Three options are given. One option simplest. 
whatever the book value i will continue that will be my value uh, from the date of transition second on the date of transition i take the market value and to say that my market value is the carrying amount and that number i'll account going forward third one retrospective this asset was purchased 15 years back i'll go back 15 years back i'll calculate everything as per in years i'll come to the current amount and i'll take that number so existing carrying amount or fair value on transition date or revised restated book value three options are given for pp as well as intangible assets cumulative translation difference prospectively uh, this is with it, with uh, with respect to the foreign exchange difference in the s21 uh, this one i should talk little bit about as11 also again to what extent you remember as11 i don't know as11 again there also monetary asset non monetary asset was there exchange difference was transferred to pnl but there was something called as para 46a revision which said the exchange difference instead of transferring it to pnl it can be added to the cost of the asset it could have been capitalized so had you followed that policy here you have a choice of continuing that policy it's not a compulsion but had you followed that in the past of capitalizing the foreign exchange difference you can continue it will not be violation of indias uh, first time adoption of indias that exemption is given investment in subsidiaries will be continued at cost compound fund instruments on the rate of transition prospective accounting decommissioning liabilities again you don't have to go back to the previous original date of purchase and from that date you don't have to account from the date of transition whatever the fair value you can account for it in this 101 uh, except this deemed cost and cumulative transactions uh, other points are not so much important i just give a overview from exam point of view you can keep this part in mind okay so that is about in this 101 analysis of financial statements this theory is different the questions are different there is no connection between the two at all as a form as a you know still we have to discuss something formality we can just discuss analysis of financial statements means it should reflect true and fair view qualitative aspects understandability relevance completeness neutral whatever we discussed earlier and best practices it should be compliant it should be complete simple specific transparent materiality and concept should be followed all notes should be integrated proper cross reference should be given uh, corresponding amount should match so sometimes what happens especially when we do copy paste uh, when we get the client for the first time existing clients will do copy paste but we forgot to change the previous year numbers or sometimes we forgot to change the client name itself the so one client name will be in another company name so those kind of things is what Should not happen, but uh, this is what theory says. There's nothing much in theory. Common defects, rounding off issues, uh, references are not there. But in examination, they don't ask these points. They will give you question like this, uh, where uh, they'll give you a balance sheet and ask you to identify what are the mistakes. So the first mistake will be that we joint CA course will be the first mistake. Then you start identifying what are other things are there. Anyway, so things such as uh, they will not use the word shareholders funds. They'll use the word equity and uh, defer tax liability and defer tax asset should be reported on net basis. Then uh, under shareholders funds, you'll have share capital and other equity. They don't use the word reserves and surplus. and long defer tax liability should be shown under long term borrowings things such as this uh, anyway for this question solution is there and also uh, the same problem uh, solution is there on youtube also i'll share the youtube link that solution you can watch that video and you can break it down there so basically we are telling if you want to do indes 101 or analysis of financial statements you need to know other standards other format 
they are being tested in different ways in days 101 and in uh, financials and uh, analysis of financial statement okay they have added these two new chapters in uh, new syllabus i'll quickly run through it i'll not go in depth again uh, detail three two three hour videos available on the youtube if you have time energy patience interest then you can go through that primarily what is the purpose of introducing this uh, chapter both of the chapters i will cover it uh, with that we'll conclude professional and ethical duty of a chartered accountant you have professional ethics i mean you have means you have as part of your syllabus in uh, auditing whether people have practically or not is different issue but somehow people are trying to integrate ethics but in my opinion this is everything whether you know subjects or not whether you are successful or not for me personally ethics is everything at least to the extent uh, known thing unknown things we can't do anything it's like telling this do you have any bad habits drinking no smoking no you go for partying no then what bad habits you have i only lie that's all which basically means that your brand your status is everything and any other thing you do beyond that is not respectable ultimately you have to stand for your ethics or your integrity so this uh, in, in this chapter is introduced to reinforce that point ethics is set of moral principles conduct a governing individuals disciplining what is good and what is bad uh so you need to be aware of whatever that you I have given the table also here ICI act uh, you will have this in uh, auditing i also have given it here summarized it here the schedule 1 schedule 2 part 4 3 parts applicable to cas in practice is in service i have just given it one place so that i don't know if you have this chart in auditing if not you can make use of this uh most important one of them i could say like you should uh, engage another business allow others to sign share amount accept commissions okay the most important one i would say is this you have to do due diligence you should not be negligent and uh, not disclosing material fact or not reporting in material misstatement i would say these are primarily relevant for uh, the reporting aspects because all others are also important as far as uh, reporting is concerned i would say that reporting this one disclosing fact and due diligence would be the common points okay a uh, code of ethics primarily they talk about okay you have to comply with the code and if, if there is a conflict this one common thing i have observed if there is a conflict conflict in the sense you are working for a company so you should do everything in your capacity what is good for the company but if the company is trying to fudge the accounts or they say we want to show more sales or if there is a difference of opinion what you can do you have to take care of the interest of the company also you have to take care of the interest of the profession also more importantly you have to take care of money and yourself also self position everything is important so there they have certain standard set of uh, suggestions given first step you go to your senior ca in the organization then you go to the senior in the organization then you go to the institute If that is also not a possible take a legal opinion if nothing is working out then you come out of the engagement that's a standard point given in the exam also you write down those steps uh, first you approach internally then you approach externally then you approach the uh, legal uh, opinions or statutory officers if nothing works out then you can leave the organization so first uh, these are the important points if you want to remember in this chapter these words and life also i would say fundamental principles are integrity means even when somebody is not watching how would you behave 
objectivity meaning not having any personal bias professional competence due care that's where i connected this point no due diligence you should not be negligent when you are making a decision when you are giving an opinion giving a certificate or you should do that necessary activities confidentiality don't disclose the information otherwise required professional behavior that is don't talk about one client with another client behave more professionally uh, and we should not act childishly there or we should not give some other information when you are part of the discussions those kind of things so uh, these points are important uh, in in this chapter then this is what is applicable to cas in practice mostly cas in service is conflict of interest or preparing financial statements act with expertise incentives linked to financial reporting if at all one question comes it might be on this the, there will be a uh, articles or memorandum telling that directors are uh, are uh, eligible for 10% of the bonus so they want to show more profits so you should not keep that as the basis incentives linked to financial statements uh, you should not accept those things and inducements you should not give nor take responding to non compliance with laws if board of directors or especially in the startups this have seen where uh, husband and wife will be directors and they, they will transfer the money from personal account to the company account and take the money out of personal account they, they transfer back and forth so frequently it's your responsibility to educate them that for you it may be the same controller for entity company is different shareholders are different and there are certain restrictions where if money has to be given to directors or money to be taken from directors so you have to educate them so responding with non compliance if they are not listening to you that is where you have to take the necessary course of action there is maybe a pressure to be fundamental principle pressure means this integrity objectivity those elements of fundamental principles discussed more in detail in this chart conceptual framework means uh, how do you exercise your professional judgment and how do you interact with the third party and each of those elements conflict of interest preparation presentation acting with expertise that part two what are given uh, further divided here but overall point is what are the questions you can expect in exam is with respect to conflict of interest primarily that is my opinion primary question would be that board of directors want to show profits you are not in agreement or uh, they say that if you don't listen to us we will remove you from the company conflict of interest is the primary area of focus from this these are things you would know but again they are trying to present it in a uh, concise manner i have just covered the brief points in detail if you want uh, it is available in my youtube channel each points i have discussed there at least go through this starts day before examination okay the last chapter accounting and technology uh, i think without technology we cannot survive i would say in the future there are only two kinds of business one is it business the other is it enabled business and there is nothing called as non it business they will eventually adopt or perish and people also ask does the uh, technology substitute uh, human beings i see two extreme answer one people saying no humans cannot be replaced by technology and other extreme answer is all will be replaced by technology and technology will take over uh, again i am not of any opinion of extreme views in my opinion technology will replace the humans who don't use the technology in my opinion it is as simple as that so if you want to be relevant you start adapting your the technology so what are the areas primarily that is on uh, automation process we have something called as uh, rpa robotic process automation where i am more interested and involved in those kind of automations primarily because i am a lazy person so i don't want to do the things again and again so there are tools available for example one tool i use frequently is uh, ui path where you can just like the way in excel you can record macros and perform the operations 
even those things you can do in certain applications for example you have a data coming from client in excel you want to post that into tally so we can write an automation process without coding knowledge of course which i also have done i don't have time to show it maybe sometime later i'll upload in a uh, you know youtube video maybe so take the data from excel put it into tally take the next excel data put it into tally it can perform on its own you just have to make a sequence of events uh, one by one i'll just show it just for you know uh, interest purpose how does it look like i will not write any code i'll just to show you the how it uh, appears to be without coding i don't know if it opens it will take a minute okay so one is a robotic process automation i'll just show that uh, how does that look like in the sense uh, how the framework will look like or the platform will look like user interface will look like Okay, so this is called as UI Path Studio. Where which is what I have built for ample purpose, not for any client. Yeah. So you may not be able to understand, that's fine, but so what I've done, so you can see do. What should I do? Type tally. So it will open tally there. then what next step should be open excel file which has the data then for each row you take the data and then you type it into the tally where you should type it as cash this was for our cash uh, transactions so just want to give an idea and just i'll go and click run and it will open the tally it will post the entries and it will close out on its own you don't have to manually be involved or you don't have to be manually be part of any process uh, unattended robots anyway so let's not spend more time there let's not give an idea of how the things would look like so robotic process automation rpa cloud computing where everything is data stored in uh, cloud so also one person asked what if it rains cloud is a notional uh, idea of storing not in any physical place but how the cloud computing started is a interesting uh, point interesting story the first person who introduced this concept is uh, <coughs> i don't know you, 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 any idea which is the person who introduced first this drive concept and all google drive we have microsoft one drive we have uh, first person who introduced was dropbox the person uh, now dropbox is not much popular but dropbox was the first one uh, introduced and how he came up with this idea is he uh, kept on forgetting pen drive for his uh, practical sessions he every day for something other he used to forget it so he said why should i depend on pen drive i'll find out a product which don't people don't have to depend on carrying the pen drive or usbs for themselves that's why dropbox that so everywhere now data is not in anybody physical stores everything is on servers cloud servers so earlier uh, that's where we also could do all these uh, work from home more comfortably because things are available in servers on cloud and erp system where everything is integrated back end to the front end uh, oracle is there uh, those kind of uh, erp systems uh, zoho is also now is in between tally and uh, erp erp is where everything is data is interconnected but you need to understand more to do the configurations uh, cyber security of course when it comes the issue risk also would come future technology in accounting blockchain the cryptocurrency is on blockchain artificial intelligence the chat gpt 
is there everywhere the extent in which the artificial intelligence is being used uh, you have no idea is what i can say but don't have any idea also until you pass the examination because uh, that will not help you pass the exam only your intelligent can helpful but once you pass out please try to look for the career maybe in these areas data analysis visualization excel power query is there uh, tableau is there python you can learn so many things are there and how indias indias is a principle based standard not a rule based so using principles you can also construct all these automation tools what i have explained so automation process things we can happen automatically and again some common points across the different areas where technology comes things will happen automatically time will be saved money will be saved efficiency is there because there is no error human when machines cannot do errors it just keep on doing the same stuff so there are advantages the challenges also will be there cyber security uh, exposed to risk and uh, data breaches will happen and some loss of jobs also will happen what oh, depend on manuals and for you to use technology you have to learn so learning or training cost that might be challenges and with respect to uh, cloud computing and all the challenges might be uh, net connectivity so it may not uh, all cities may not be having that super speed for you to work only using the cloud so those kind of stuff is there so common points you keep repeating it you can go through that table cyber security you have to give enough password where we have seen in all ca offices will have all the clients digital signatures that too some people will do so structurally this client name and on that password also will be written and everything will be saved that that is all is not proper because giving a digital signature is giving your signature to somebody else it is having so exposure to misuse you may not misuse but if you don't keep it properly others may misuse it but you are under lock and key so you will be responsible and everywhere now gst filing and all is happening through otp so data security uh, bills are being uh, passed uh, one of my friend was getting the business from my us and what they were testing is uh, whether your laptop can they use pen drive on your laptop if yes we will not give you business should all be protected restricted with authorized use all user management password everything to be defined so cyber security encryption access control so basically whatever you do you can write it there but convert it into a sentence and you do it and important is this data backup everything is on cloud and if you don't do enough backup then gone case one of the portfolio management where i was part of Uh, because of some cyber attack they lost the data so many clients they they manage about 5000 crores worth of money of the clients data but they had a system of backing up every day automatically there is a system so they could retrieve the data and all the clients transactions were safe pms is such a sensitive one because pms is not like mutual funds uh, pms get the power of attorney from the clients so they transact on behalf of clients So they have to maintain each and every transactions and uh, uh, agreements and all more carefully. Anyway, those are the points. Uh, technology they have introduced. Future technology, blockchain, transparent ledger. Basically, in my opinion, blockchain is a legalization of uh, what do you call havalas, havala transaction where you use transfer the money illegally. now that legalization is called as blockchain basically without involving intermediaries or panch institutions or government authorities you will be able to transfer money and that is what is the blockchain and one of them is cryptocurrency but blockchain can be used for lot more other purposes the reason why it's called as blockchain because every time some person interferes or transact a block gets added so if you do one more transaction block gets added so it's easy to track which person did what uh, that is the blockchain but anyway that can be having other issues also the common advantages disadvantages you will find so here also data privacy security control 
technical complexity, training employees, they are the challenges, common points you will come across there. Okay, so those are the new chapters being added. If any, I if I happen to get any material on MCQs, I will share it. Uh, that's depending on if the institute comes up with any and mock test or something, any format comes, I'll maybe I can create some more MCQ and share it. Okay, so that would be from my side. That was the long sessions. More than anything else, I hope your time is judiciously spent because that is one thing which cannot come back. Some people ask me, can you give this sessions free, those sessions free? I can give everything free, but still it costs your time. For me, that is more valuable than any other element. So make use of that clearly. So that is from my side. What are additional points I told you? I'll share the link. I will share through the YouTube link. You can follow the YouTube for any updates that I keep adding it. Okay, so that's from my side. I'll just conclude with my last few sentence, which I always tell on my last session. Simple sentence. Most people live as if they don't die, and most people die as if they've not lived. But only a few people will be alive even after their death. Because when they were alive, they made the difference to others' life. So I wish you to be one of them. All the best for examination and thank you for your time, patience, and everything. All the best for examinations. See you soon once you pass the examinations. <coughs> All the best.